chapters 78 to 86 from the al quran of muhammad translated out of arabic into french and newly englished by alexander ross this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicholas james bridgewater chapter 78 the chapter of news containing 40 verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful what do the wicked inquire of each other touching the great news of which they are indifferent opinion they shall learn it they shall learn it have i not created and extended the earth have i not raised the mountains to establish it have not we created you male and female have not we created sleep and the night for repose and the day of labor have we not built over you seven heavens and the sun full of light have we not caused rain to descend from the clouds to cause the earth to produce its plants and gardens of diverse fashions the day of judgment shall be a day of joy and sorrow when the angel shall sound the trumpet all the world shall come in troops to universal judgment heaven shall open its gates the mountains shall walk and hell is the place prepared for the seduced there shall they remain eternally they shall find there no rest neither drink but of boiling and most stinking water a reward conformed to their works the infidels believe not that they must render an account of their actions and blaspheme but we keep a account and write exactly what they do it will be said to them at the day of judgment taste this day the punishment that ye have merited your pains shall be augmented and pains upon pains they who shall have had the fear of god before their eyes shall be in a place of felicity in the gardens of a most fertile land enriched with grapes and pomegranates they shall drink in cups full of a delicious liquor and shall hear no vain speeches nor lying such is the recompense of them that obey the commandments of god he is lord of the heavens and earth none shall dare to speak when the spirits and angels shall be assembled before him none shall be able to speak or pray for another without his permission this day shall be the day of truth they that shall be acceptable to him shall retire towards his divine majesty we have preached unto you that the punishment of god shall speedily come upon you every one shall see all that he shall have done and the wicked shall say at the day of judgment would to god that i had been earth and dust chapter seventy nine the chapter of them that take away containing forty six verses revealed at mecca jalal din entitleth this the chapter of them that draw forth the soul in the name of god gracious and merciful i swear by the angels that take away the souls from the bodies of infidels and the wicked by the angels that accompany the souls of believers 
by the angels that exalt the glory of God, by the angels that guide the souls of the righteous, when they go into paradise, and by the angels that are appointed for the affairs of the world, that all people shall rise again at the day of judgment. That day the earth shall tremble, and the hearts of men shall tremble at the first time that the trumpet shall sound. At the second their sight shall be troubled with fear, and they shall say, Behold, we, we are returned upon earth, to the place whence we departed, our bones were rotten, and our return to the world shall bring upon us only misery. This second sound of the trumpet is a sign of the wrath of God. Then shall they be put out of their sepulchres, revived upon the earth. Hast thou learned the history of Moses, and how God his Lord called him in the holy valley, called Tua, and how he said, Go towards Pharaoh, he is seduced from the right way, and is in a great error. Say unto him, I called thee to the way of salvation, I will purify and guide thee, into the way of the law of God, to the end thou mayest have his fear before thine eyes. Moses made Pharaoh to see one of his great miracles. Nevertheless, he contemned Moses, disobeyed him, and departed from the right way. He caused his people to assemble, and made proclamation that he was their God. But God rigorously chastised him because of his blasphemies. This is an example of his omnipotency to them that are righteous. O oh, ye wicked, were ye more difficult to create than heaven? God hath raised the roof thereof and proportioned it. He hath made the night obscure and the day full of splendor. He hath stretched forth the earth, hath made fountains to spring forth, to water the plants, and to give drink to beasts. He hath elevated and established the mountains for you. Men shall call to mind the good and the evil that they have done. At the second sound of the trumpet, and hell shall appear open, before their eyes the wicked that have followed their own appetites on earth shall be precipitated into hell and such as have had the fear of god before their eyes and have subdued their passions in this world shall go into paradise the wicked will ask of thee when the day of judgment shall be none knoweth it but thy lord thou art not sent but to preach the pains of hell to them that fear that day as if they saw it present before their eyes they shall imagine that they have not remained in the tomb but from evening until morning when they rise again chapter eighty the chapter of the blind containing forty two verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful the prophet frowned had a surly countenance and withdrew himself when the blind came towards him he will not tell thee if he will believe in god and if he will profess thy teaching depart thou from him that shall depart from the law of god Thou art obliged only to preach to him, and not to make him to believe. But forsake not them that shall come to see thee, to be instructed, and shall fear God. The Al-Quran is sent for the instruction of men. It was copied upon the book that is kept in heaven, to which honor and praise is due eternally. Wherefore is man impious? 
Is it because he is created of a little water, retained in the womb of his mother, until the time appointed, and because he found the way to come forth? Is it for that God caused him to die, and to revive when it seems good to him? He performeth not what God commandeth, neither considereth the good things that nourish him. We have sent rain. We opened the treasures of the earth. We made all sorts of grain to spring forth. Blights, olives, dates, gardens, and fields full of fruits, and herbs to nourish you and your flocks. When the angel shall sound the trumpet the second time, man shall flee his brother, his mother, wife, and children. Every one shall take thought for himself. That day shall the wicked have countenances covered with affliction. The countenance of the good shall be joyful, and such as have sought the way between faith and impiety shall have the countenance covered with earth and dust. Chapter 81 The Chapter of Roundness Containing 29 Verses Written at Mecca Note, the Arabians buried their daughters alive when they had done a fault. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, when the roundness of the sun shall appear, the stars fall, the mountains walk, the camel be without burden and without keeper, when the beast shall be gathered together, the earth covered with fire, souls return into bodies, the daughter demand why they put her to death, when the book of good and evil shall open, when heaven shall cast off its ornaments, the fire of hell appear, and paradise be opened, then shall souls know the good and the evil that they have committed. I swear by the planets, by the obscurity of night, and by the brightness of the day, that the words of the Al-Quran are the words of the Prophet, beloved of God, powerful with his divine majesty. Ye ought to obey him. He is a faithful observer of what is commanded him. He is not possessed of the devil, as ye have imagined. He hath seen the angel clearly and without riddle, and is not perplexed for what is to come. The words of the Al-Quran are not the words of the devil. On whatsoever side ye turn you, it is only for the instruction of men and such among you as will follow the right way. But ye shall have no inclination to follow it, if it please God, the Lord of the universe. Chapter 82 The Chapter of the Opening of Heaven Containing Seventeen Verses Written at Mecca In the name of God, gracious and merciful, the soul shall know the good and the evil that they have done, when the heavens shall open, the stars fall, the seas be gathered together, and the sepulchres be opened. O man, what maketh thee so proud as to rise against God, who hath created thee, who hath formed and proportioned thee after what manner he pleased? O oh, ye wicked one, ye will not believe the day of judgment. There are angels that observe your actions and are obedient to God. The just shall go into paradise, and the unjust be precipitated into the fire of hell, whence they shall never return. I will not tell when the day of judgment shall be, that day none shall be able to succor his neighbor, and God alone shall command. Chapter 83 The Chapter of Them That Weigh With False Weights Containing 36 Verses Written at Mecca In the name of God, 
gracious and merciful. They that weigh with false weights and measure with false measures believe not to rise again at the day when all the world shall appear before God to be judged. Certainly the book wherein the sins of the wicked are written is kept in hell. Misery shall be upon the infidels at the day of judgment. None doubteth the coming of this day but the wicked when they hear the commandments of God preached. They say, that is but an old fable. Impiety retaineth them in this error, and induceth them to abandon the law of his divine majesty. But they shall be cast headlong into the flames of hell. It shall be said unto them, Behold the punishment which ye would not believe. The book wherein the good works of the righteous are written is reserved in heaven. The angels are witnesses how the just shall enjoy the delights of paradise. They shall see the immense graces of God reposed on delicious beds. Their countenance shall be covered with joy and content. They shall drink of purified wine most savoury that shall have the odour of musk preserved in bottles that none but themselves shall open and it shall be mixed with the water of the fountain of paradise where the cherubims do drink the infidels deride the true believers that would instruct them nevertheless when they return to their companions they admire their doctrine and say, When they see them, behold the seduced, but they are not sent to be their tutors. The infidels that shall be converted and believe in the day of judgment shall go into paradise. They shall enjoy the grace of God. They shall behold the grievous torments of the damned that shall be punished after their demerits and shall find in the other world what they have done on earth. Chapter 84 The Chapter of the Cleft Containing 25 verses written at Mecca In the name of God, gracious and merciful, the day of judgment shall appear, when the heaven shall cleave asunder, and the earth cast men out of their sepulchres, by the commandment of God. O man, thou goest daily towards death, and shalt find in the end the good and evil that thou shalt have done. He to whom shall be given the book of a compt of his actions in the right hand shall be blessed. He shall go with his companions into paradise, where he shall enjoy eternal felicity. He to whom shall be given the account of his actions in the left hand shall be damned. He shall be cast headlong into the fire of hell because of the unlawful pleasures that he hath taken in the world, and for that he believed not in the resurrection. God beholdeth all that he doth, and keepeth a compt. I swear by the redness that appeareth in the air when the sun setteth, by the obscurity of the night and the brightness of the moon, that you all shall change being and posture and shall revive after your death. Wherefore is it that the wicked believe not in God? Why do they not humble themselves when they hear the Al-Quran read? They blaspheme against God, but he knows all their actions. Declare to them that they shall be chastised, and that such as believe in his unity and do good works shall receive an infinite reward. Chapter 85 The Chapter of Signs Celestial Containing Twenty Verses Written at Mecca Many Mohammedan doctors entitle this the chapter of castles. 
in the name of God, gracious and merciful. I swear by heaven, adorned with signs, and by the day of judgment, by the angels and men, that they who have made pits filled with fire to burn the true believers shall be witness to their own malice, and shall avouch that the fire burned themselves to make them know the unity of God and the truth of his law. God is omnipotent and always victorious. He is the king of the heavens and earth. He beholdeth all. They that torment true believers and shall not repent shall be damned. They shall burn eternally in the fire of hell and such as shall believe in God and do good works, shall dwell in pleasant gardens, wherein flow many rivers, where they shall forever enjoy supreme felicity. The wrath of God is strong, he maketh his creatures to die, and rise again when he pleaseth. He is merciful towards them that repent of their sins, and loveth them that serve him. He hath created his throne, to which praise is due eternally. He raiseth up whom he listeth, and nothing is to him impossible. Hast thou heard the history of the people of Pharaoh and Thamud? God shall chastise in like manner them that shall not believe in his law. He knoweth them all. Certainly, the precious Al-Quran is written in the book that is reserved in heaven. Chapter 86 The chapter of the star, or the north star, containing seventeen verses written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by heaven and the star that teacheth men the way, I will not tell thee by what star, by the star full of brightness, that every person hath a guardian, which observeth the good and the evil that it acteth. Doth not man consider of what he is created? He is made of a little sprinkled water that issueth out of the body of man and woman. God shall make him to rise again at the day of judgment, and none shall be able to protect or defend him from the wrath of his divine majesty. I swear by heaven that returneth the rain, by the earth that openeth itself and receiveth it, to produce its fruits, that the Al-Quran distinguisheth good from evil, and that it was not sent in vain. The unbelievers conspire against the prophet, but God shall turn their conspiracy against them, and they shall know it. Be thou patient, and a while endure the infidels. End of chapters 78 to 86 from the Al-Quran of Muhammad. Newly Englished by Alexander Ross. Recording by Nicholas Bridgewater. Recorded in Oxford, England. Chapters 87 to 114 from the Al-Quran of Muhammad. Translated out of Arabic into French and newly Englished by Alexander Ross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Chapter 87. The Chapter of the High and Mighty, containing 17 verses written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, exalt the name of thy Lord, high and mighty, 
who hath proportioned all that he hath created. He ordaineth what he listeth, and guideth into the right way them that are pleasing to him. He causeth herbs to spring out of the earth, createth them green, rendereth them dry, and altereth them as to him seems good. I will read to thee the Al-Quran. Forget nothing of what thou shalt read, but that which God shall will thee to forget. He knoweth whatsoever is kept secret in the world, and whatsoever is made manifest. I will instruct thee in his law. Preach the Al-Quran. It shall be profitable to him that shall have the fear of God before his eyes. Such as shall despise it shall be miserable. They shall be precipitated into the fire of hell, where they shall not be able either to live or die. And he that shall embrace the law of God, and shall be mindful of his name, shall be blessed. Pray to God at the time appointed. Certainly the righteous shall be heirs of the good things of the earth, and those of heaven that are exceeding great and eternal. This is written in the ancient books of Abraham and Moses. Chapter 88 The Chapter of the Covering Containing 26 Verses Written at Mecca Jalal Din entitleth this The Chapter of Judgment Because that day the damned shall be covered with fire and fear. See Exteri in the name of God, gracious and merciful. Hast thou heard mention of the covering? That day shall the countenance of the wicked be covered with affliction. They shall enter into fire that is extremely hot. They shall drink of boiling water. They shall eat nothing but briars and thorns. They shall be extremely lean and famine shall not deliver them from an infinite number of other miseries. That day shall the good be filled with content. They shall be recompensed for their labors. In paradise they shall hear nothing spoken that may displease them. They shall see fountains flow, lying upon high beds. They shall drink in fair glasses, fixed on diamonds, upon pillows well disposed and upon pallets well adorned will not the wicked consider the miracle of the she-camel how it was created how heaven was elevated how the mountains were disposed how the earth was extended preach to the wicked the pains of hell thou art sent to preach to them and not to constrain them God will chastise with his great chastisement him that shall abandon his law and traduce the Al-Quran. All men shall be one day assembled before his divine majesty to give a compt of their actions. Chapter 89 The Chapter of the Morning Containing 30 Verses Written at Mecca See Kitab El Tenwar, ye shall there see the exposition of this passage. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by the morning, by the tenth night of the month, by even and odd, and by the coming of night, that the wicked shall be chastised. Is there anything in consideration of this oath? that can move men to fly uncleanness? Considereth thou not how God created Ad, the son of Aram, that dwell in pavilions supported by columns, so big that there were none like to them in his country? Knoweth thou not how he used Thamud, who hewed stones and rocks to inhabit the valley? Knowest thou not how he entreated Pharaoh 
who pierced with pins the feet and hands of such as he gave up to punishment? Knowest thou not how he entreated them that heretofore erred from the right way in their own countries that increased their pollution? He poured upon them diverse torments. He observeth all that men do. He giveth store of goods to them that he doth not try and taketh them away from such as he proveth. The wicked will not give honor to orphans. They will not abstain from eating the bread of the poor. They shall give an account. They too shall affect riches when the earth shall tremble and shall overthrow all the buildings. When the angels shall descend in order by the command of thy Lord, then shall hell be open to the wicked they shall call to mind what was preached to them in the world and say why did not i observe the commandments of god during my life they shall be punished more than ever any hath been and shall be more straitly bound than ever any hath been bound it shall be said to the blessed o thou soul thou hast observed with courage and without fear the commandments of god return to thy lord with content enter into the society of the blessed enter into paradise chapter ninety the chapter of the city containing twenty verses written at mecca many have entitled this the chapter of night in the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by that city which is permitted to thee to conquer, Mecca, I swear by the father and the child that we created man in misery. Thinketh he that there is none stronger than he? He saith that he hath expended great wealth. Doth he think none hath seen what he hath done? Note, he declaims against Koresh. See Jalaldin. End note. Have we not given him two eyes, a tongue, two lips? Have we not given him to see the way of good and of evil? He shall be severely chastised. But I will not tell thee with what kind of chastisement. Wherefore doth he not deliver slaves? Wherefore doth he not give to eat? to them that are hungry, to orphans, and his kindred that are in necessity, and to the poor. Patience and charity are recommended among true believers. They shall be seated at the right hand, and such as impugn the mysteries of our law shall be at the left hand. They shall be shut up in the fire of hell. Chapter 91 The Chapter of the Sun containing fifteen verses written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by the sun and his light, by the moon and her splendor, by the fire and its elevation, by the night and its obscurity, by heaven and the stars thereof, by the earth and its plains, by the creation of the soul by the knowledge of virtue and vice, that he that shall be purified from his sins shall be most happy, and that he who defileth himself with vice shall be most miserable. The people of Thamud traduced their prophet because of their obstinacy, but certainly they were chastised. The apostle and prophet of God said unto them, Behold the camel of God, suffer it to drink. They derided him and slew that camel. God severely punished them. He spared not his chastisement against them. Chapter 92 The Chapter of Night, containing twenty verses, written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by the obscurity of night, by the brightness of day, by the creation of man and woman, that your actions are very different. He that shall yield to God, 
the obedience that is due to him and believeth in his unity shall go into paradise and whosoever shall not praise his divine majesty and will not be converted shall go into hell his riches shall not save him and he shall be cast headlong into eternal flames it is we that guide the people we dispose the beginning and end of everything i preach to you the torments of hell none shall enter there but the wretches that have blasphemed and departed far from the way of salvation he that hath the fear of god before his eyes and giveth alms shall be delivered from the fire of hell every one shall be recompensed for what he hath done for the love of god he shall be satisfied and contented chapter ninety three the chapter of the sun rising containing ten verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful i swear by the brightness of the rising of the sun and by the darkness of the night that thy lord hath not forsaken thee he doth not hate thee his delay shall be to thee advantage and in the end thou shalt be content did he not well lodge thee when thou wert an orphan did he not well guide thee when thou wert seduced did he not enrich thee when thou wert poor do no injury to orphans devour not the poor and recount the graces that god hath conferred on thee note muhammad complains to the angel gabriel because he so long had refrained to visit him End note. chapter ninety four the chapter of joy containing eight verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful have not i rejoiced thine heart have not we delivered thee from the burden that was heavy on thy shoulders have we not raised thy name and reputation affliction is followed of content when thou shalt have finished thy prayers labor and love thy lord chapter ninety five the chapter of the fig containing eight verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful i swear by the figs and olives by mount sinai and by the safety and freedom that is in this city of mecca that we created man with proportion afterwards we rendered him contemptible except the true believers that do good works they shall receive an infinite reward after this o wicked man what maketh thee to blaspheme against the faith is not god the judge of judges chapter ninety six the chapter of blood congealed containing seventeen verses written at mecca badawi and jalaluddin call this the chapter of reading in the name of god gracious and merciful read the alcoran and begin through the name of god who created all who made man of a little congealed blood read the alcoran and exalt the glory of thy lord who hath instructed man in the scriptures who taught him what he knew not nevertheless he is in great error he will not consider that he shall return before god hast thou considered him that would have hindered one of the servants of god to make his prayers hast thou understood if he were in the way of salvation hast thou seen if he blasphemed if he hath abandoned the faith knoweth he not that god forsaketh him if he desist not he shall be dragged by the hair into the fire of hell with the wicked he shall quit the place where they assemble to dispute against the faith and the devils shall cast them headlong into flames eternal disobey not the commandments of god persevere in thy prayers worship god always obedience to his commandments shall draw thee near to his divine majesty 
Chapter 97 The Chapter of Glory or Power Containing Five Verses Written at Mecca In the name of God, gracious and merciful, we sent the Al-Quran in the night of glory and power. I have not taught thee the graces of this night of glory and virtue. The prayers and good works that are done that night have more of merit and efficacy than those that have been performed in a thousand months. The angels descended that night to the earth through the permission of their Lord and salute the true believers until the dawning of the day. Chapter 98 The chapter of instruction containing eight verses written at Medina. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, they that understand the scripture and believe in many gods will not relinquish their idolatry until they have heard the instruction of the prophet of God. He shall read unto them a book clean and pure, wherein are written the precepts of the right way. They that know the scripture and are not divided until they have learned this instruction. It commandeth to worship one only God to make their prayers at the time appointed, and to pay tithes. This is the right way. The unbelievers that know the scriptures and adore many gods, they shall remain eternally in the fire of hell and shall be most miserable. They that believe in one God and perform good works shall be most happy. They shall be recompensed of their Lord in the garden of Eden, wherein flow many rivers, where they shall dwell eternally. God shall be satisfied with their obedience, and shall give them his blessing, prepared for them that fear him. Chapter 99 The Chapter of the Earthquake Containing Eight Verses Written at Medina In the name of God, gracious and merciful, when the earth shall tremble and shall cast bodies out of their sepulchres, man shall demand what it will do. They shall tell him news to wit that God hath commanded it to do so. That day shall men come out of sepulchres from diverse places and shall see the good and the evil that they have done. He that hath committed evil of the weight of an atom shall be chastised and he that shall have done good of the weight of an atom shall be rewarded. That day shall men come out of sepulchres from diverse places. Chapter 100 The Chapter of Horses Containing Eleven Verses Written at Mecca and Medina Some Arabians have called this the chapter of return, or of them that return. See Jalaldeen. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, I swear by the horses and the noise that they make with their feet when they return to war and by the fire which they make to arise when they strike their feet against stones that run lightly through jealousy and raise the dust in the midst of enemies that man is ingrateful for the graces of his Lord he himself is witness of his ingratitude, and too much affecteth the riches of the earth. Knoweth he not that God will make all the world to revive, that he will bring to light whatsoever is most secret in the hearts of men, and that he knoweth all that they have done? Chapter 101 The Chapter of Affliction Containing Eleven Verses Written at Mecca in the name of God, gracious and merciful, when the extreme affliction shall appear, I will not tell thee in what time this shall be. Then shall all men be assembled, stretched out like quilts, and the mountains shall be like carded wool. Such whose balance shall be weighty with good works shall go into paradise, and they whose balance shall be light of good works shall go into hell they shall go into a fire so hot that i am not able to express the heat chapter one hundred two 
the chapter of abundance containing eight verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful certainly all your care even to the grave is in the abundance of your wealth but ye shall hereafter learn ye shall hereafter learn the truth if ye had knowledge ye would meditate on the torments of hell you shall see one day that they are indubitable then shall ye ask where is paradise chapter 103 the chapter of the evening note it is an hour appointed by the mohammedans to pray End note. in the name of god gracious and merciful i swear by the hour of the evening that men are inclined to their destruction except such as believe in god that do good works and have in esteem truth and perseverance chapter 104 the chapter of persecution containing seven verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful misery is upon him that persecuteth his neighbor persecution hath its counter persecution he that heapeth up treasures and is busy to count them thinketh they will make him immortal but they shall precipitate him into his misery i will not tell thee into what misery but the fire of hell is always kindled to burn the heart of the wicked they shall be overwhelmed in flames and bound to great pillars chapter 105 the chapter of elephants containing five verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful considerest thou not how thy lord entreated them that came mounted upon elephants to ruin the temple of mecca was not their conspiracy their own destruction god sent against them flying troops that threw upon them stones whereon were imprinted their names he made them like to corn sown in fields devoured by beasts chapter 106 the chapter of karais containing four verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful karais had no humanity for them the people come every winter and every summer to worship the god of the temple of mecca which nourisheth and delivereth them from famine and fear chapter 107 the chapter of the law containing seven verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful sawest thou him that blasphemed against the law he it is that devoureth the substance of orphans and the bread of the poor misery is upon them that are not attentive to their prayers that are hypocrites and hinder men to do well chapter 108 the chapter of affluence containing three verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful we have given thee a great affluence of our graces pray to thy lord lift up thine hands he that hateth thee shall be accursed chapter 109 the chapter of infidels containing six verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful o infidels idolaters i worship not what ye worship and ye worship not what i worship i will not worship that which ye worship and ye will not worship that which i worship you observe your law i mine chapter 110 the chapter of protection containing four verses written at mecca in the name of god gracious and merciful a great number of people embrace the law of god when he protecteth the true believers and giveth them victory exalt his glory and implore pardon of him he is most merciful chapter 111 the chapter of the cord of palm containing 11 verses written at mecca jalal din entitleth this the chapter of loss 
in the name of God, gracious and merciful. Abu Lahab lost his hand. God chastiseth him. His riches shall not save him. He shall burn in eternal flames with his wife that carrieth wood upon her neck, bound with a cord of palm. Note, the wife of Abu Lahab did cast stones in Muhammad's way in contempt. See Badui. End note. Chapter 112, the chapter of salvation, containing four verses written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, say unto unbelievers, God is eternal. He neither begetteth nor is begotten, and hath no companion. Chapter 113, the chapter of separation, containing five verses written at Mecca. In the name of God, gracious and merciful, say unto them, God who hath separated light from darkness shall defend me from all the evils that he hath created, from danger, darkness, from them that blow against the knot of the string, from sorcerers and the envious. Chapter 114 The Chapter of the People Containing Six Verses Written at Mecca In the name of God, gracious and merciful, Say unto them, I will beware of the temptations of the devil and the malice of the people through the assistance of the Lord and King of the people. Fini. End of chapters 87 to 114 of the Al Quran of Muhammad, translated out of Arabic into French and newly Englished by Alexander Ross. End of the Al Quran of Muhammad. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in Oxford, England. The Arabic Language. A lecture given on December 3rd, 1868, by Thomas Cheenery, M.A., of Christchurch. Lord Almoner's Professor of Arabic in the University of Oxford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abu Jalal, Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Arabic Language given on December 3rd, 1868, by Thomas Cheenery. It would ill become me, in addressing members of the University of Oxford, to begin by urging the importance of a study of the Arabic language. Such a preface might be in place before a popular assembly with narrow notions not only of language, but even of what constitutes utility. A learned body which cultivates with activity and success every branch of knowledge does not need to be persuaded that one of the most perfect and beautiful forms of human speech, one of the most widely extended, most enduring, and most influential languages of the world is worthy of the attention of its students. And if there were any tendency to overlook its importance, for there is a fashion in studies as in other things, and the curiosity which attracts to new subjects sometimes causes whole departments of learning to be neglected for a time. I should be forbidden to recognize it by the very conditions under which I address you. The merit of the Arabic language, literature and history as a study for Europeans is the very reason of my own professional existence. I am bound to assume that when the successive sovereigns of this kingdom 
have for more than a century and a half maintained a professorship of arabic in either university there is a sufficient reason for their bounty and since the lord almoner has done me the honor to appoint me to the office and the university to admit me to it i will not enter on an argument which would seem to assume that the acts of such high authorities need a justification i am also bound to recollect that the university maintains the laudian professorship which has been distinguished by the names of several eminent scholars the first of whom the illustrious pocock will always be had in remembrance wherever eastern learning is cultivated indeed the study of arabic in this university may be traced back to a still more distant age at the council of vienna in the early part of the fourteenth century pope clement v addressed a command to the universities of rome paris oxford bologna and salerno that they should appoint teachers of the hebrew chaldee and arabic tongues for the purpose of raising up scholars who should be competent to defend the christian theology against its most learned adversaries the doctors of judaism and islam authority so high in times remote and recent enables me to yield to my own inclination and to omit an apology for arabic which will not be demanded by men of literary tastes and which even if far more cogent than i could make it would probably have little effect on those who are without them it will be best to devote the brief space of this lecture to a definition of the arabic language absolutely and in its relations with its cognate tongues or with the chief of those which it has influenced by means of religion or conquest and then to such a slight sketch of its literary features as will indicate how in my judgment it may best be studied you are aware that the arabic is a member of the remarkable and well-defined family of languages to which the convenient though not strictly accurate name of semitic has been given this family comprises the well-known tongues which have long been the subject of investigation to european scholars the hebrew the eastern and western aramaic commonly distinguished as chaldee and syriac the arabic and the ethiopian it comprises also it would seem one or more of the idioms spoken in the valleys of the euphrates and tigris preserved in the cuneiform inscriptions and now gradually emerging into light through the marvelous researches of our own time confining ourselves to the former group where we are on sure ground we find a literary character and a philological system which may well excite our curiosity the most prominent quality of these languages is a similarity which can hardly be distinguished from identity when it is said of european languages that they resemble each other the phrase is used with great latitude it merely means that there is such a likeness between the words and the grammatical forms of each as may be perceived by an educated man whose intelligence will enable him to trace the divergences wrought by time and separation between dialects which have had a common origin or were at least in some former age much more closely related the tendency of our languages to phonetic variation or decay and the impulse of our more mobile races 
to new turns of thought and expression have produced a changeableness in speech which is only checked not wholly removed by a literary culture but unchangeableness is the law or the fate of the semitic tongues according to the mould in which they were first cast they exist from age to age unvaried in their substantial structure their development being superficial or at least unessential and resembling rather the slight efflorescence of the mineral than the exuberant vegetative growth of Aryan speech. It is not too bold a generalization to say that the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Arabic are to the philologer but a single language. The student who passes from the Hebrew text of the Bible to the Targum which accompanies it, who then turns to the Syriac version, is soon conscious that he sees little more than dialectical varieties. Should he extend his researches to the Quran, he does indeed find himself in a new world. He escapes from the minutiae of the Masora, since the Arabic being a living language, the Muslims have not thought it necessary to mark each subtlety of pronunciation and each delicacy of tone. But he comes upon an elaborate system of inflection and syntax for which his previous studies have given him no preparation. This, the I'rab, or Arabization, is the distinguishing feature and the highest beauty of that classical tongue which is known among Arabs as the language of Mubar. To guide the learner through the intricacies of its system, to demonstrate or imagine the laws which govern it, to reconcile anomalies in what has been written, and to lay down rules for future composition, have occupied the labours of a multitude of grammarians for nearly twelve hundred years. European teachers have shown equal devotion to the form of the classical speech. Their pupils have been taught to make the study of its delicate mechanism precede even an acquaintance with the vocabulary, and many have been thus discouraged by the semblance of insurmountable difficulty. Yet a little inquiry into the subject reveals this singular phenomenon that these desonances of the verb and noun, which are the principal study of the grammarians, are unused in ordinary speech throughout nearly all the Arabic-speaking world. This would not surprise us if the language had suffered any corresponding change in its internal structure, if there were in fact a modern and an ancient Arabic, and the desonances had been abandoned with other properties of the old tongue. But this view would be fallacious. There is really no such thing as a modern Arabic language. Certain words may have dropped out of use, or have slightly changed their signification, and the excessive redundancy of the vocabulary may have been limited by modern custom. But between the earliest Arabic versicles which have come down to us and the cultivated language of the present day, there is absolutely no grammatical difference. Everything that is written or that is uttered with any rhetorical intention by an educated man in Damascus or Cairo in our time is identical to the most minute point with the language of the Quran and the learned man is able to speak on occasion with every delicacy of the classical tongue. Yet not only now, but from the age immediately succeeding the first conquests of the Saracens, the desonances have been omitted by the multitude, even of those of pure Arabic extraction. In Syria, in Iraq, in Al-Jazeera, or Mesopotamia, 
and still more in Africa and Spain. The people, as soon as they were removed from the classic influence of the desert, dropped the elaborate inflections of the language of Modar. The corruption extended even beyond this, and it is said that as early as the close of the first century of the Hijra, the powerful Khalif, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, spoke so incorrectly that he could not make himself understood by the Arabs of the desert. But in the general disuse of the desonances, even by those who otherwise spoke grammatically, I cannot but see a sign that they represent something adventitious and almost artificial in the language, while in its substance it is identical with the great body of Semitic speech. In their close relation with each other, these languages are kept by the strength of their most remarkable characteristic, the triliteral root. Respecting the mental or phonetic impulse which caused a race to embody its conceptions in words made up of three consonantal sounds to which other sounds prefixed, affixed, or inserted within, gave the necessary modifications. It is useless to speculate. This much, however, is clear, that it was a general and irresistible tendency, and that words which in the most archaic form of the language were monosyllabic and consisted of two consonants, were gradually triliterized either by the affixion of a third consonant, which is often variable, or by the doubling of the second consonant, or by the insertion of a vowel sound between them, making the so-called concave or hollow verb. Sooner or later, the whole body of the roots was affected with this triliterity, and even foreign words were broken and recast in this normal form, or in quadriliterals of analogous structure. When the triliteral system was complete, the unity of the Semitic languages was forever decided. The limits within which they could vary were fixed, and these were necessarily narrow. Where the three main consonants of each word must be retained under all circumstances of modification and constitute its indestructible substance, there is no longer the possibility of essential variation. It is, moreover, remarkable that the Arabic, which has been destined to survive all the other Semitic languages, and in a manner to include them all, is the most exact in its maintenance of the sanctity of the root. There are in Hebrew many signs of phonetic negligence, and the root appears worn and triturated in the mouths of the people, even in the earliest records that have come down to us. But in Arabic, probably from the more energetic pronunciation of the race, it remains clear and sharp, as if moulded in adamant. For these reasons, we hear from the mouths of millions at the present day, a language which does not fundamentally differ from the oldest Semitic speech of which we have knowledge. The common household words of the modern Arab are not only similar to, but are identical with those of the ancient Hebrew. And it is not too much to say that an Israelite of old and an Arab sheikh of our own time would be mutually intelligible in the expression of simple wants. I have been led to dwell, I hope not with exaggeration, on this fundamental unity of the Semitic languages in order to suggest that Arabic is not to be looked upon as a mere outlandish tongue to be studied only by professed orientalists or by persons who have a levantine or indian career before them but as the most perfect and elaborate form of a speech which in its other varieties has always been considered necessary 
to the complete education of scholars and churchmen, and, which is important, I may say necessary, for the full comprehension even of the Hebrew scriptures. It would, however, be unwise to conceal from the student that in approaching the Arabic language he must prepare to surmount many difficulties. The greatest and most abiding of these, for it is never wholly overcome, arises from the immense number of words which claim a place in it. Years of labour may not secure him from meeting with one or sometimes two or three words in a single line of poetry which he cannot recollect to have seen before, or from which he must seek a different meaning from that which they ordinarily bear. This excessive redundancy arises in part from a minuteness of discrimination which was instinctive among the ancient Arabs, and which led them to describe a single object by distinctive names or epithets, according to the most trifling variations of its qualities. Thus a camel had appellations according to every accident of age, stature, colour, breed or use. And these, though originally of the nature of epithets, are used alone, and their peculiar signification being often lost, they become simply synonyms of the name camel. A horse was similarly distinguished. A lion, a sword, a beautiful woman had innumerable synonyms. This, however, is intelligible, and there is something like it in every language. Less so is the variety of expressions allotted to one kind of action. I will only cite a single instance. The notion of the miraculous transformation of a human being into another creature is expressed by four nearly related roots. A transformation into another man is neskh, into a beast, meskh, into a plant, feskh, into an inanimate, unincreasing object as a stone or a log of wood, reskh. But a more prolific source of this multiplicity is perhaps to be found in the variety of the tribes which contributed to the formation of the literary language. It is well known that each of these had peculiar words and phrases which were unknown to its neighbours, so that even a poet who declaimed before a company of strangers might be interrupted with a demand that he would explain or defend some word that he had used. After the victories of Islam, there was a fusion of the vocabularies of the tribes, as well as of the tribes themselves in the conquered countries, and the words which were thrown into this common stock served as the material for future compositions. The literary pedantry that soon sprang up among the Muslims, and for generations infected the polite societies of Damascus and Baghdad, Basra and Kufa, tended to increase the evil of an excessive idiom. Language was studied for its own sake, rather than for the thoughts of which it was the vehicle. The men of letters delighted in the wilderness of speech amid which they lived, and were careful to encourage its rankest vegetation. They did indeed confer an inestimable benefit on literature by preserving the noble poems of the pre-Islamic period, and by commenting them according to the explanations which they received from Arabs of chaste speech. But in their own compositions, they sought to show their knowledge by the use of rare and obsolescent words they had discovered. A name or phrase which was perhaps to be found only in a single poem, the unique utterance of some son of the desert, was adopted and multiplied by the artificial imitators of the ancient style. 
Yet the learner ought not to be unduly discouraged, even though he seems to be launched forth on a vast and chartless sea of diction. The Arabs have rightly called their lexicon the Qamus, or ocean, and he will in time discover that to have thoroughly explored it is the fortune of a very few, even of the most learned sheikhs. There are writers, even in the present decline of Eastern letters, who still pride themselves on their knowledge of the Arabic vocabulary, who with laborious ingenuity compose with the sole intention of grouping the rarest words they can find in the voluminous dictionaries of the East, or in pagan verses more or less authentic. Such a man is Feris Eshidiak, who some years since published a book of which the French title is La Vie et les Aventures de Ferriac, containing much curious learning, but bristling with words which would be unintelligible but for the context. He has his reward in the admiration of those who are faithful to the ancient studies, and I have heard it said by a learned Syrian that Nasif el Yezaji of Beirut is a greater grammarian than Faris Eshidiak, but that Faris knows more words than Nasif. The second great difficulty of the Arabic language is the Arab or Arabization, of which mention has been already made, and which is superadded in the classic tongue to the sufficiently complicated internal changes which affect the structure of the words. The delicacy and precision of this desinential syntax is one of the chief beauties of the language and gives it a marked preeminence over its sisters. It would be useless here to enter into any disquisition concerning the origin of the desinences or the comparative antiquity of the various forms of Semitic speech. I may, however, state my belief that the Aramaic, which retains much of the monosyllabic character, represents a more primitive type, from which the plentifully voweled and euphonious Arabic is a graceful development. And this may be the case, even though it be proved that in many of its grammatical forms the Arabic preserves for us an older tradition. We find it a settled law in Arabic that a syllable cannot begin with two consonants. In other words, there can be no shivana, a short vowel being always interposed between the two consonants. The abhorrence of rugged sounds has, I think, much to do with the birth of the desonances which not only introduce precision into the syntax, but lighten the pronunciation and make the language more fitting for the purposes of rhetoric and poetry. Indeed, it is impossible to hear a piece of Arabic read with and without the desonances and not feel the transcendent superiority of the former and understand the pride with which the master of such a language would regard his precious inheritance. In sound, there is as much difference as exists between the mellifluous Tuscan and the most rugged Romanic dialect of the Alps, while the syntax gives accuracy to the phrase without recourse to those particles and expletives which make their appearance in the vulgar Arabic dialects. All that we can say with certainty of the Arab is that we find it complete with all its delicate and learned flexions as the possession of the tribes of the Hijaz and of Nejd, and by the time of the Great Awakening to intellectual life, which preceded by about a century the predication of Muhammad. This indeed is not to say much, but what more can we reasonably assert of a race to which the age of Augustus is prehistoric and that of Constantine still mingles itself with legend? The notion of an ancient Arabic literature of which some fragments are said to have come down to us is, 
or ought to be, quite exploded. The Arabs, for instance, have preserved what they say is the lament of Amr, son of Al-Harith, son of Mudad, the Jurhumi, who was expelled from Mecca and from the care of the Kaaba and forced to take refuge in Yemen at some remote time. Albert Schultens believed this Amr to have been a contemporary with Solomon and published the verses among his Monumenta Vetustiora Arabiae as Carmen Salamonis Aetatem Attingens. But he probably did not know that the Muslim men of letters were among the most unscrupulous and shameless of forgers, and were in the constant habit of placing snatches of poetry in the mouths of heroes whose deeds they chronicled. The piece in question is in regular meter, determined by the quantity of syllables after the manner of Latin or Greek, and there is reason to believe that this more elaborate form of poetry was introduced at no early period. The conclusion to which we are forced to come is that these verses were probably composed by some versifier under the Khalifs, when the old legends of the people were digested into a regular historical chronicle. But of the prevalence of the I'rab among the tribes of pure speech for several generations before Islam, there can be no doubt. Very little examination is requisite to show that the germ of it exists in the other Semitic languages. Thus, though in the Hebrew verb qotal, the last radical is without a vowel, a vowel appears for the easing of the pronunciation when the verb is combined with one of the accusative suffixes. It becomes qatalani, similarly with the suffixes to yqtalani. With respect to the noun, traces of the three cases are also to be discerned. But leaving these nice inquiries, it is enough to say that among the unlettered Arabs of the 5th and 6th centuries of our era, a language was spoken identical with that which is preserved in the Quran, in the Mu'allaqat, or prize poems, said to have been suspended in the Kaaba for their especial excellence, and in all the other authentic compositions which have come down to us. This classic speech, in all its purity, is universally admitted to have been the possession of the sons of Mudar. Mudar was the son of Nizar, the son of Ma'ad, the son of Adnan, and he begat Ilyas, who begat Tabikha and Mudrike, and so the traditional genealogy is continued through Fir, who is also called Quraysh, from whom sprung the most exalted of all the tribes in the opinion of Muslims, since it had the honor of producing the Prophet. Now, this group of tribes, for each man in the descent becomes the founder of a new family, was with other kindred tribes, among which they held a kind of primacy, established in the Hijaz and Tehama, the region of Mecca and Medina, and also in Nejd, or the highland of central Arabia, at the time when the earliest extant Arabic literature was produced. There can be no doubt that these spoke with all the grammatical inflections. The poetry of the period is a sufficient proof. This is composed in regular meters, which require for their scansion a rigid observance of the desonances. If we read without them, it loses entirely the character of verse. Now the poets were for the most part wholly ignorant of the art of writing. They declaimed their compositions before the multitude, and the most admired of these were committed to memory by their contemporaries, and especially by a class of reciters who went from place to place and gained their living by repeating them. Therefore, even if we admit 
that there is something not strictly essential to the language in the desonances, we must guard ourselves from the opinion that they were a mere literary ornament, much less, as some unsound European scholars have suggested, a device of early Muslim grammarians to give precision to the Quran. Quraysh was the tribe, and Mecca was the city which presented the model of this classic speech. Himyar, that is, the tribes of southwestern Arabia, had a more simple inflection, the noun being diptotic, as in some forms of the classic Arabic, such as certain of the plurals, and the proper names of foreign origin. But Quraysh spoke beyond all doubt with the perfect I'rab as we now possess it. The surrounding tribes were also of pure speech. Ibn Khaldun tells us that many of the descendants of Mudar lost the faculty of speaking the classic language by dwelling among people of other races. The descendants of Ma'ad by Rabi'ah and Mudar had in great part recognized the authority of the king of Hira, who was himself a vassal of the Persian monarch, and many of them had settled in the northern parts of the peninsula. Here they borrowed of their neighbors' forms and words. For this reason, he says, the speech of Quraysh was the most eloquent and pure, since they were the most remote from the abodes of foreigners. Next in excellence was the speech of Thaqif and Hudayl and Khuza'a and the Banu Kinana and the Banu Asad and the Banu Tamim. But as for the tribes more remote from Quraysh, as Rabi'a and Lacham and Iyad and Qudaa and Judam and Ghassan and the Arabs of Yemen, their speech was imperfect through their intermixture with Persians or Abyssinians. It is therefore a settled opinion that the greater or less distance of a tribe from Quraysh was the measure of its deflection from the pure language of Mudar. To this cultivated language, Islam gave complete supremacy. Muhammad's revelations were couched in it, and though the Prophet never versified, the rhythm of the Quran is indebted to the inflections for much of its beauty. The Meccan emigrants who gathered round the founder of Islam became the chiefs of a monarchy, which in a century after the Hijra extended from the Indus to the Pyrenees. But it soon appeared that the classic dialect of Quraysh was beyond the faculties of the rude tribes which had been brought under the dominion of the Khalifs. From the very morrow of the death of the Prophet, difficulties arose respecting the true readings of the Quran, and when a number of those who knew it by heart were slain in the campaign against an adverse Prophet known as Musaylima the liar, Omar counseled Abu Bakr to have a standard copy written. The recension which is now in use was made by order of the Khalif Uthman, who then ordered all discrepant manuscripts to be destroyed. But the new copies gave but the simple words without any signs of orthography or syntax. The misreadings of this imperfect text were shocking to the ears of the orthodox and zealous companions of the Prophet. It is a tradition that the Khalif Ali, the most accomplished of the Arabs, and the author of poems still extant, heard a man quote from the Quran with a perversion of the desonance which changed the meaning of the sacred text from, quote, God is clear from the sin of the idolaters, and his prophet is clear from it, end quote. Two, quote, God is clear from the sin of the idolaters and of his prophet, end quote. Ali then suggested that rules should be made for the expression of the inflections in writing, 
and for the determination of the exact reading of the Quran and Arabic speech in general. He was seconded by able men who knew well the tongue of Quraysh, and thus arose the first school of grammarians, who not only fixed the classic language as we now have it, but founded an elaborate science which has exercised the ingenuity and subtlety of generations more than any study in the encyclopedia of Islam. It is this classic language, on the principles of this original grammar, which it is the office of a professor of Arabic to expound. On this subject, I must be allowed to give a decided opinion. I believe that for one who desires a real knowledge of the Arabic language and literature, it is not sufficient to study the grammar as transformed, or rather travestied, by those European writers who have striven to wrest it to the forms and relations of the Latin. Their purpose has been to make it more familiar and comprehensible, and they have taken for granted that the principles to which they were accustomed must be universal and applicable to all languages, but the Arabic syntax presents divergences from the Latin or Greek, which necessitate a system and nomenclature of its own, and the grammarians I speak of can never inform the mind of the learner with clear ideas as long as they insist absolutely on the agreement of verbs with nouns or adjectives with substantives, and divide the verb into moods after the fashion of the classic languages. Even the grammar of the modern European languages has been somewhat perverted and falsified by such theories. How much more that of a tongue so peculiar and so independent of foreign influence as the Arabic. Grammar must be the exposition of a speech as it actually exists, and this depends on the mode in which a race conceives and expresses its ideas. The Arabic grammatical system founded on a minute investigation of the idiosyncrasies of the language, is exquisitely adapted to the thought of the people, and the study of it is the only means of perceiving the true relations of words in composition. Thus the inflections are particularly fitted to determine the meaning of phrases in such a speech as the Semitic which has no long periods, nor even the apparatus for forming them, but consists of short propositions connected together by some vague copulative particle, as v or f, which serves to express meanings that are distributed in European language among a whole series of conjunctions. Thus also the theory of the inchoative and predicate Mubtada and Khaber, a theory which is one of the bases of Arabic grammar, suffices to give a common principle to a number of various forms of speech. If it were only then, as an aid to a thorough knowledge of the language, I would counsel the student, when his first difficulties are past, to go boldly to some standard Arabic grammar, such as the al of Ibn Malik with the commentary of Ibn Aqil using Sylvestre de Sassi's celebrated work as a key to the Eastern author. But there is a still further necessity for this study. Grammar among the Arabs is more than the handmaid of composition. It has been studied for its own sake and indeed seems to have been almost the only original production of the Arab intellect. It is so unique in its conceptions that we cannot conceive it to have borrowed from anything that preceded it, and indeed the system is known historically to have been complete in all its essential parts before the Muslims began to receive Greek culture. The first division of the parts of speech into the noun ism, the verb fi'l and the particle harf is attributed 
to the Khalif Ali, and the fancy of the learned soon seized upon grammatical ideas with extraordinary avidity. Grammatical disquisitions formed one of the chief amusements of the people. In the courts of the Khalifs at Damascus and then at Baghdad, the most subtle questions were discussed by the literary in the presence of the commander of the faithful. And even the slave girls who sang before the guests were able to pass the lines they recited using all the technical terms of the science and declaring on what authority they used such or such an inflection or preferred one form of the plural to another. I may here relate the story of Sibaway, one of the most famous of the grammarians, a Persian who visited the court of Baghdad in the reign of Harun al-Rashid. A contest had raged between the schools of Basra and Kufa concerning the use of the Raf and Nasb, or, as we should call them, the nominative and accusative case of the noun in certain positions. Sibawe took one side, El Kisei, a grammarian of Kufa, the other. One day, in the presence of the Khalif, Sibawe put a question on the subject to his opponent, and after a dispute, the Khalif ordered that a reference should be made to an Arab of the desert. It was the custom to send for men of the tribes of pure speech, often soldiers or grooms, and to lead them in conversation to utter the doubtful word or phrase, not asking them a direct question which might have confused them, they being ignorant men. Whatever might be determined by their unsophisticated, unpremeditated utterance was looked upon as authoritative. In this case, al kisai by the help of the Khalif's son, Al-Amin, who was his pupil, contrived that some men of a tribe of impure speech should be sent for, and their utterance was in favour of al kisais assertion. Sibaway angrily departed from Baghdad, and according to one account, he would not return to Basra discredited, but repaired to Ahwaz, where he made inquiry if there were any prince with a fondness for grammar. He was recommended to Balhat ibn Tahir of Khorasan, and set out for his court, but died on the way, some say, of grief. It is related that a pupil of Sibawe, indignant at the conduct of El Kisei, sought him out and put to him a hundred grammatical questions, convicting him of a mistake in every answer. The point which this enthusiasm for the subtleties of grammar had reached in a later age is indicated in the assemblies of Hariri, still the most popular book among the learned of the East. But in truth, it is impossible to read even the thousand and one nights without falling upon some instances of the prevalence of this pursuit. The terms of grammar are introduced into love poems, and they are even played upon in indelicate jests and witticisms. A study of the niceties of speech was the most esteemed pursuit of the Arabic-speaking Muslim, and brought with it higher consideration even than proficiency in divinity or law. The word which expresses this technical literary culture came to be synonymous with the education of a gentleman. End of part one. The Arabic Language a lecture given on December 3rd, 1868, by Thomas Cheenery, Part 2, recording by Abu Jalal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abu Jalal. Assuming then 
that the student desires to obtain a real knowledge of the classical Arabic and with that purpose has the courage to investigate the principles of its structure in the works of the native grammarians. It remains to direct his attention to the literature which will be opened to him as the reward of his perseverance. Here indeed his researches must be determined by the bent of his own mind or the purposes to which he may intend to apply his knowledge. He may desire to study the Muslim law for its practical usefulness in the East. He may be curious concerning the influence of the Arabian philosophy and science on Christendom during the Middle Ages. He may be an investigator of history and wish to draw the materials for a knowledge of the relations of Western Asia with Europe from sources not generally sought. To give a sketch of the voluminous literature of the Arabian writers in a single lecture would be impossible, even if I had the learning for the task. Philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, medicine were taken by our forefathers from the Arabian schools. The Aristotle, which was taught in the universities four centuries since, was not the Greek text of that philosopher, but a compilation founded on the commentary of Averroes. The names of the stars, of chemical instruments or substances, even the word algebra and the use of the decimal notation bear witness to the activity of the Arabian teachers and their influence on the Christian nations. The names of Avicenna, Aben Pace, Razis, and many others are widely known as those of the most successful seekers after knowledge at a time when darkness overspread the Latin and Teutonic nations. And it is recorded that even a pope, the learned Gerbert, afterwards Sylvester II, studied in the Moorish schools of Spain. But this learning has been long superseded by the larger teachings of modern science. Those works of the intellect which need chiefly the more sober faculties of man, judgment, penetration, industry, perseverance, are destined to neglect. The reward of their authors is to bear an honoured name among those who have advanced the knowledge and happiness of mankind. But the productions themselves live only as undistinguishable elements in the compositions of those who come after, and to enlarge and transform the sphere of science. A similar fate awaits the labours of those who are learned in an unprofitable learning, the scholastics and metaphysicians, who, neglecting the phenomena of nature and the events of life, construct systems on the processes of their own minds, or of some text whose absolute authority they take for granted. The literature of the Kalam, or scholastic theology of the Muslims, fills innumerable volumes, and some acquaintance with it is necessary for a due comprehension of their history. The more practical commentaries on the Quran and the treatises on law, which with them is founded on the sacred text, may be read with profit by the advanced student. But in all these he must expect to find much that is at once wearisome and frivolous, and that gives no due reward to his labours. The works of real genius, however, are ever fresh and young, and their light structure floats on the stream of time, when the ponderous barks, freighted with the accumulations of the learned, are one by one engulfed. After the Arabian mind has been exercised by centuries of authorship, a professor of the language is compelled to declare that the works in which an European student will find most pleasure 
are the poems of the unlettered Arabs of the ignorance, that is, of the period which preceded the advent of Muhammad. These which, though individually short, make up in their entirety a considerable mass, should be read with care by whoever desires to understand the primitive spirit of the people. Here there is nothing artificial, nothing of that tasteless and puerile extravagance which we associate with oriental composition. The primitive Arab, like the Hebrew, had a chaste and classic genius. There is nothing monstrous and elephantine in his conceptions, nor, on the other hand, is he infected with the odious taste for artifices and conceits which distinguishes the authors of a later age. The most simple and primitive form of poetical diction is what is called sejja, or cadence, that is, a rhymed prose, consisting of short unmetrical sentences having the same dissonance. The versicles which have been handed down as the utterances of soothsayers and wizards are generally in this style. In the legend of the breaking of the dyke of Marib in Yemen, the event which led to the great dispersion of the southern tribes, the sorceress Zarifa is made to speak in rhymed prose. When the two deformed soothsayers, Shiq and Setah, interpret the dream of Rabi'at ibn Nasr and predict the birth of the Prophet, they use the same primeval speech and it is often placed by the chroniclers in the mouths of the women of the tribes, while the men are made to declaim in metrical verse. But, as has been said, the regular qasida of the Arabs with its perfect prosody is found already in existence more than a century before the preaching of Muhammad. The first who composed a regular poem is said to have been Adi, called Muhalhil, who thus lamented the murder of his brother Kuleib, the chief of the tribe of Rabi'ah, and the most powerful prince in Arabia. This event took place, probably, in the last ten years of the fifth century after Christ. Before that time, poetry had only been declaimed by each man according to his needs. In other words, it consisted of a few lines improvised on occasion and addressed to the tribe in council, to the enemy on the battlefield, to the shade of a slain friend, to the judge who had to decide some question of honour or precedence, to the mistress who had been carried away by her family or had preferred a rival. The passion for poetry seized the most cultivated tribes and there was scarcely a chief or a hero who did not declaim upon occasion. The most celebrated name among the poets of the ignorance is that of Imrul Qais, the Kindi, who is believed to have visited Constantinople in the early years of Justinian. It was probably he who gave the Qasida the form which it retained for centuries, in the verses of this type, the poet is supposed to arrive with two friends on the site of a deserted encampment and to lament the disappearance of his mistress, who has been carried off by her tribe. He then passes to his feats in love or war, describes the noble form and high spirit of his horse, the fleet pace of his camel, his sharp and glittering sword, his perils, and his sufferings. Nothing can exceed the vigour of each description. The fiery soul of the poet glows through his declamations, and the free life of the desert is depicted for us with a few marvellous touches. Such were the poems recited at the yearly fair of Okerv near Mecca, on the territory and under the presidency of the Quraysh, who although they were not distinguished in poetry themselves, held as the guardians of the Kaaba 
the highest position among the Arab tribes. Several of these poems bear the title of Mu'allaqat, or the suspended, and common tradition derives the name from their having been suspended in the holy house by reason of their surpassing excellence. The seven which are commonly received as Mu'allaqat have been edited in Germany by F. R. Arnold and are easily accessible. The first Mu'allaqa is that of Imrul Qais, of whom mention has been made. The second is that of Torafa, a youthful and profligate poet, who was murdered when only twenty years old. The subject is the loss of a herd of camels belonging to himself and his brother, which was carried off while Torafa was passing his time in pleasure. Another was declaimed by al harith the son of Hillize, before Amr, son of Hind, the king of Hira. Some men of the tribe of Taghlib, having been willfully led astray by the men of Bekr, so that they perished of thirst in the desert, the men of Taghlib claimed the price of blood. The matter was referred to King Amr, and each side sent an orator. The orator of Bekr provoked the king, so that the king would not hear him, and the matter was about to be decided against the tribe, when Harith stepped forward and began to declaim. He was so leprous that his people covered him with a veil, that he might not offend the sight of the king, leaning on a bow, which pierced through his hand without his perceiving it, in his poetic fury, he improvised the defence of Bekr. As he proceeded, the king was so charmed that he bade him lift the veil, and when he had ended, Amr placed him by his side on the royal seat. Some say that the Mu'allaqa of Amr son of Kulthum was declaimed on the opposite part at this contest. It is a fiery and exulting panegyric of his own tribe of Taghlib, and worthy of the warrior who afterwards struck the king dead for a trifling insult, and gave rise to the proverb, As swift to slay as Amr ibn Kulthum. I will mention only one more Mu'allaqa, that of Antara, or Antar, son of Shaddad, the chief hero of Arabian romance. He was not of pure Arab blood, his mother having been an Abyssinian slave, so that he was one of the Aghriba, or crows of the Arabs, that is, a warrior of dark skin, of whom several were famous. Nor was he handsome, for his mouth was deformed, and he was known by the name of Antara of the Split Lip. But he performed prodigies of valour, and his adventures have been made the subject of the most voluminous of Eastern romances, portions of which are still recited by persons who are called Anatira, or recounters of the adventures of Antar. This Mu'allaqa was inspired by his love for his cousin Abla, whose family were unwilling that she should marry the son of a slave, and who, in consequence, imposed on Antara the most perilous adventures. From these slight indications, the nature of the early Arabic poetry will be sufficiently understood. Not only did chiefs and warriors compose, but there was a class of vagabonds, outcasts and robbers, gifted with poetic genius, whose verses have come down to us. Foremost among these desert devils, as they were called, was Shanfera, the author of the Lamiyatul Arab, that is, a poem of which the rhyme is the letter L. He was a vagabond of the tribe of Azd, and lived in the utmost misery and squalor. He celebrates his filth, his tattered garb, his matted and vermin-infested hair, with the same exulting energy with which he tells of his speed of foot and the perils of his wild life. He vowed to kill one hundred of the Banu Salaman. Whenever he met one of them, he exclaimed, To thine eye! And he shot his arrow with such skill that he always pierced the eye of his foeman. Thus he slew ninety-nine, 
But at last, Asid ibn Jabr, one of the hostile tribe, and himself a famous runner, together with his brother's son, Khazim the Nukmi, lay in wait for him. His enemies tortured and killed him. But some time after, one of them, seeing the mouldering body, gave the head a kick, and a piece of the skull breaking off, fixed in his foot, of which wound he died. Thus, after death, did Shanfara kill his hundredth enemy. To Abbaqa Shirran was another of this race, and some verses which are attributed to him tell of his wanderings in the desert and of his meetings with the dreaded Ghul, the demon of the wilderness. After Islam, the fine poetic spirit of the Arabs passes away. The Prophet himself had no love for the poets, many of whom reviled him, and his highest praise of the gifted Imrul Qais was that he would lead the band of the poets to hell. Yet he knew well the power of poetry among the tribes, and rewarded the poets of his party, whose victories over the unbelieving declaimers were often the case of numerous conversions. The chief of these laureates of Islam was Hassan ibn Thabit, who was looked upon as the greatest city-born poet of his age. The Arabs believed the natives of towns to have less of the poetic spirit than the desert-born, and there is certainly less of life and vigour in their conceptions. Yet Hassan vanquished the sons of Tamim in a mufakhara, or strife of honour, having praised the Prophet and his followers with more splendid eloquence than was displayed by Utarib, son of Hajib, and Zibrikan, son of Badr, the poets of Tamim. Another of the Muslim poets was Ka'b ibn Zuhair, whose poem called the Burda, or Mantle, is still extant. He recited his Qasida in the mosque before the Prophet, and when he came to the words, Truly the Prophet is as a sword drawn by God, Muhammad, delighted, cast his mantle upon him. This mantle was afterwards bought by the Khalif, Muawiyah, for 20,000 dirhams, and was worn by his successors on the two great feast days of the year. It is said to be the same which is yearly exhibited to the faithful at Constantinople. After the generation which listened to these poets had passed away, a great change came over the mind of the Arabs. The Quran itself seemed to foreshadow it. The earlier surahs, composed at Mecca while Muhammad's zeal was new and made more fierce by persecution, are sublime and vivid and show a high order of lyric genius. They are not in verse, but in rhymed periods of the nature of the Seja, of which I have spoken. But when the enthusiast of Mecca is changed into the prince of Medina, the spirit of the composition is sensibly lowered. The style is more flat and prolix. The celestial voice is employed on wearisome invective. The revelation concerns itself with petty details. The motives suggested are less lofty, and the argument is trivial and barren. The influence of an infallible book and of a religion of rigid and never-ceasing observance, still more, the direction of the energy of the race to foreign conquest, were unfavourable to the free poetical spirit of the Arabs. Within the space of a lifetime, the character of the composition was completely changed, and before the first century of the Hijra had closed, the poet Farazdaq had introduced antithesis and conceits into poetry, and the first germs of corruption were implanted in the tastes of the people. The language, too, is recognised as less pure, and this theory of the degeneracy of their speech is carried so far by the learned Arabs that they will not admit anyone to be an absolute authority on the use of words or on grammatical mechanism except a jahili or poet of the ignorance, that is, one who died before the preaching of Islam, or else a muhadram, 
that is, one who was contemporary with it. An Islami, that is, a poet of the first three or four centuries of Islam, is of less consideration, and after this age, the poets are called modern and have no linguistic authority. Yet, poets of great genius arose in successive ages. The highest place in Arabic literature is given by some to Abu Taib Ahmed, known as al mutanabbi that is, the pretender to prophecy, who flourished in the 10th century of our era. His natural genius was of the highest order, and if he had lived in an earlier age, his poetry would have rivaled the Mu'allaqat in noble simplicity. But his lot fell upon a time when the worst vices that can affect composition had invaded the Arabic style. The bent of his mind may be judged from the incident to which he owes his surname. In early manhood, he went forth into the Syrian desert about Palmyra and erected the standard of a prophet, declaiming to the wild tribes among whom he made many converts. He was defeated and taken prisoner, but in the year 949 he repaired to the court of Saifuddola at Aleppo and sang the praises of that prince. It is singular to find a poet full of the genius of battle, wild and gloomy by natural temperament, studying his grandly conceived compositions with miserable conceits, and deliberately descending to the level of the worst versifiers of a court. Another name which I must mention is that of Ibn al farad the mystic poet of Cairo, and the most celebrated Arabic writer of the school of the Sufis. This order or sect of Muslims, so called from the robe of wool, Suf, worn by the first ascetics who belonged to it, has exercised the most powerful and enduring influence on the Arabic and Persian literatures. Ibn al farid devoted himself to religion and seldom quitted the mosque of Al-Azhar in Cairo though tempted by an offer of the post of chief Qadi of Egypt. He fell into trances which lasted days together, and while in this state he neither heard nor saw what passed around him. Yet, if we are to credit his biographers, it was when entranced that he composed his loftiest poetry. The verses thus inspired are of that strange order which clothes heavenly conceptions with the grossest material forms, which allegorizes the inflow of the divine spirit under the name of wine, and makes sensual love typify the mystical union of the soul with God. Ibn al farid was born in the year 1181 of our era, and died in 1234. He is held in high estimation in the East, where he is placed in the same class as his contemporary, the Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi, the author of the Masnavi, the greatest and most original work of the Sufi school. It remains that I should treat of a subject not less important than any that has been mentioned, namely the influence of Arabic on the other languages of the Muslim world. It is from this influence, or rather supremacy, that an advocate of the study of Arabic derives some of his strongest arguments. The power of the Mohammedan religion is so direct and absolute over its votaries and so affects every act and relation of life that the idiom of the Quran must always be a second language for the followers of the Prophet. To this religious preeminence, political and social preeminence, were added for several generations after the preaching of Islam. And the tongues of the various nations subjected to the Khalifs were exposed to the irresistible and ceaseless action of a language which represented at once celestial and earthly dominion. Some languages have entirely disappeared or remained only as the inheritance of remote and secluded tribes. And the Arabic has taken their place. In Africa, it has vanquished every rival speech from the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. 
In Asia, the Syrians were a cultivated and quick-witted people. When the Arab conqueror imposed his yoke, they bowed in submission, but not in despair. They soon began to exercise the influence which their higher civilization gave them over their simple masters. They were the scribes and accountants of the early governors, and it is well known that the first knowledge the Muslims obtained of Greek letters was from translations made into Arabic by Syrian writers, often from existing Syriac translations. Add to this that Damascus was the first seat of the Caliphate, that Syria at the time of the Arab conquest was densely populated, full of magnificent and wealthy cities, and it would seem that the Syrians were in the best position for maintaining and even propagating their own variety of the Semitic speech. Yet the Arabic gradually prevailed. The literary industry of the Syrians did not prevent them from falling under the intellectual influence of the Muslims. And though we find them at first the masters, they appear in a later age as the pupils of the Arab men of letters. Even a work so peculiar as the assemblies of Hariri was imitated in Syriac, as it was also in Hebrew for Jewish readers, who were affected by a similar influence. At last the voluminous Syriac literature comes to an end with the chronicle of Bar Hebraeus, the Arabic language everywhere prevails, and at the present day, all Aramaic speech has passed away, except among some obscure Christian communities. It was possible that the Persian nationality and speech might have been thus destroyed, but Iran had a genius of its own, a strong individuality, and the traditions of two periods of glory under the Achaemenian and Sassanian kings. The Persian has ever maintained some mental independence, the effects of which are to be seen in his divergence from the orthodox standard of Islam, and in a literature which in some respects shows more genius and fancy than that of the Arabs. The Persian language, though philologically degenerate, and with a simplicity of structure which verges on feebleness, resisted long the invasion of the Arabic. The learned men of Persia were among the most devoted students of Arabic, and in the long list of writers in this language they appear more frequently than any other foreigners. But the people, and those who composed on popular themes, for a long time kept their language unadulterated. The Persian genius, overwhelmed by the first conquests of the Arabs, revived with the decline of the Caliphate and the virtual independence of the country under native princes of the houses of Safar, Samaun, Bowei, until a real Persian literature arose in the eastern provinces under the celebrated Mahmud of Ghazna. This literature displays a strong national spirit. Thus, when we open the great epic of Ferdowsi, we find the pure speech of the Persians, with but the very smallest admixture of Arabic words. Even of those which appear, it is probable that many had been naturalized in the Persian language at an early time, and not imposed by the conquests of Islam. It may be that the theme and the prepossessions of Ferdowsi made him studious of purity, and that he felt the old speech of his race to be the fittest to chronicle the wars of Iran and Turan, the grandeur of Feridun and Kehosro, and the heroic valour of Rostam. But in the early writers, generally, there is a comparative rarity of Arabic words and phrases. In course of time, however, the influence became too powerful to be resisted. The Persian language remained and flourished, but it was completely transformed. Every writer thought himself at liberty not only to introduce Arabic words on occasion, but to mingle in his composition entire phrases from the venerated language. In fact, you may have a Persian sentence in which every important word is Arabic, nothing remaining of the original language but the grammatical structure, 
the setting, as it were, of the vocables. The most esteemed poets introduce Arabic verses into their pieces, looking on them as the highest ornament of style. The works of Sa'di cannot possibly be understood by one who is ignorant of Arabic. The great Sufi poets Farid al-Din At-Tar and Jalal din Rumi make free use of Arabic, which in fact furnishes nearly all the technical terms of Sufism. The odes of Hafez are full of Arabic. Historical writing has not been less affected, and the ordinary language of life has fallen under the same influence. Hence it comes to pass that the knowledge of the modern literary Persian presupposes a knowledge of Arabic. The Persian authors wrote or recited for those who were perfectly acquainted with the tongue of the Quran, and the European who would understand them must perfect himself in the same study. He who attempts to learn the Persian as an independent language will never have more than a misty conception of it, however patiently he may labour not only words and sentences, but forms of composition, rhetoric, prosody, terms of theology, philosophy, science and art, and even the customary pious phrases of ordinary life, are taken from the Arabic. To the proficient in Arabic, the modern Persian is the simplest and easiest of subjects, and the application of a very few months gives him a sufficient mastery over it. But an original study of the language is vain, except for the merest vernacular use. Not less has been the influence of the Arabic on the language of the Turks. The cultivated dialect which is spoken and written at Constantinople, and which is known as the Osmanli, is a composite of three different languages, representing, singularly enough, three of the great races into which modern ethnologists have divided mankind. The original stock is the Turkish, a Turanian speech of great vigour and power, as well as of remarkable euphony, and constructed on a system which excites the admiration of all philologers. But in cultivated conversation and writing, this is overlaid by masses of Persian and Arabic, the latter being almost exclusively employed when any grave or lofty subject demands a learned vocabulary. The Turks had not the genius to develop their own remarkable language. They first incorporated the cultivated Persian with its large admixture of Arabic into their speech, and then they Arabicized still further for themselves. The Hindustani, which seems to be called to high destinies in Asia, is a language of the same class an Indian grammar being associated with a vocabulary which borrows largely from the Arabic and Persian. In all these cases, it is remarkable that the grammatical structure of the original speech maintains itself, as if this formed the true and essential individuality of the language. The adoption of the Arabic alphabet by the nations which have come under the influence of Islam is a subject also worthy of notice. To the languages themselves, it has been certainly a misfortune. The Arabic alphabet is exquisitely suited to its own language, the properties of which it defines with the utmost accuracy. Thus the sounds which the other Semites confused, or at least expressed by a single character, are in Arabic clearly discriminated, as he and kha, ain and rain, swad and wad. The orthographical system also, though undoubtedly defective, is not unsuited to the genius of the language, with its clearly defined root and its forms of strict regularity. Thus in Hebrew or Arabic, when we see a word, we commonly know what vowels to supply, because the consonants themselves indicate its form. We can perceive how the Arab and the Jewish grammarians failed even to form a conception of a vowel in our sense of the word, and treated a vocal sound as a consonant affected merely with a certain 
intonation or motion haraka but when an exclusively consonantal writing is applied to languages which have no such regularity and in which a word cannot be expressed as if it were a formula endless ambiguity and progressive corruption of the true original sounds of the language are the result what would have been the fate of the greek language if the greeks on adopting the phoenician alphabet had written with consonants only happily they did otherwise and we find that though the greek alphabet is identical with the hebrew yet the aspirates and gutturals of the hebrew are used as vowels in the greek just as a modern jew writing german in the hebrew character uses the alif for a and the ayin for e but the muslim nations were hindered from doing this chiefly no doubt by the circumstance that they took large numbers of arabic words bodily into their languages and the orthography of the imported element imposed itself on the rest hence the extreme uncertainty which the learner feels as to the correct pronunciation of the languages which use the arabic alphabet and the necessity that the true sound of multitudes of words should be heard from a master or indicated in the lexicon by european letters the spread of the arabic alphabet under such unfavorable conditions is a proof of the extraordinary religious and literary influence of the language to this influence there appears no reason to suppose that a term has yet been set among the semi-civilized and the barbarous races of mankind in central asia in the malay region in the vast depths of africa the religion of muhammad and with it the linguistic primacy of the arabic language is everywhere spreading and the quran is accepted where the exertions of numbers of devoted missionaries fail to introduce the gospel the simple monotheistic faith of islam attracts strongly the minds which have begun to revolt against idolatry the institutions and the spirit of the religion are also efficient for conversion since they set a rigid distinction political and social as well as theological between the faithful and the unbeliever and promise to him who enters islam predominance in this world as well as happiness in the next whatever may be our policy in this matter the fact that the muslim propaganda is still as active and successful as when marachi labored on his refutation of the quran is a reason why an english university should not neglect the study of the arabic language arabic is not only spoken as a mother tongue over vast regions but it is the sacred language of ninety million of the human race extended across the old world from senegal to the pacific from siberia to the cape of good hope and what is more extraordinary there are to be found among all muhammadan populations men who can write it with sufficient purity a letter from some spot within the limits of the chinese empire will be as good arabic as a letter written at damascus or at mecca since like latin in the middle ages the arabic is a universal language for a great society which feels its unity under all varieties of geographical position or vernacular speech when to this quality of universality we add its remarkable unchangeableness there appears sufficient to justify the curiosity and perseverance of the student on the future of the language among the races of the shores of the mediterranean i am not inclined to speculate the arabic of our time is growing by the introduction of new ideas the consequence of the great impulse of european thought and activity how far any essential change will be produced is still i think uncertain 
it may be that in spite of the efforts of purists a multitude of words of european origin will invade the old tongue which will then have to show its plastic power if it retains it by triliteralizing or quadriliteralizing them and subjecting them to the normal methods of semitic speech there is every reason to hope that it will accomplish this as yet it preserves its strong individuality not only in words but in forms of expression and has been hardly affected at all by european idiom if we compare it with the modern greek which in its new growth is subject to similar influences we perceive a marked difference the hellene is proud indeed boastful of the revived purity of his language and the elimination of turkish or italian words the place of which has been supplied from the ancient lexicon or by composites more or less ingenious but at the same time he slavishly follows french idiom and arranges his classic vocables into a bold translation of the language of his neighbors he will point out to you that there are no impurities in a passage without feeling that the whole passage is itself an impurity the educated arab on the other hand not only keeps his words but his idioms he does not write anything analogous to echo tin timin i have the honor or lambano tin elefterian i take the liberty when he wishes to say that a man was hated he does not use any such phrase as enipnifse tin vatitatin apostrophin his higher literary efforts are all in the old classic form the greek has lost the old pronunciation of his language accent having destroyed quantity as in music the accented notes in the performances of the unskilful tend to trench upon and shorten the others modern greek poetry consists only of rhymed couplets of the stichos politikos or of other meters still more ignoble and trivial but if a man of arab speech composes a poem it is strictly on the old models the return of the egyptian viceroy's troops from crete is celebrated in rhymed prose after the tradition of the primeval desert and if a prince of wales or a turkish grandee is to be honored the poet's complimentary verses are identical in metre and style with those of the pagan arabs 1300 years ago they have every delicate inflection of the classic language and are undistinguishable except by their subject from the lines of imrul qais or tarafa for this reason the study of the classic arabic is the real business of an european who wishes to converse with muslims or to understand their learning the language of the oldest times is the language of today without any real change and it is probable that the invariability will continue the english learner has nothing to do with local dialects though even the worst of these is less corrupt than some suppose since the deviations from rule never affect the written language of the educated there is one standard arabic tongue which everywhere prevails and he who has mastered it will be everywhere understood and honored even by those who are unable to imitate his more perfect speech it is to this ancient and enduring language that i invite your attention end of a lecture given on december 3rd 1868 by thomas chinery part 2 recording by abu jalal recorded in oxford england the forward pass in football by elmer berry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Chapter 1. The Coming of the Forward Pass. Introduction. The history of football has been a story of limiting the power of the offence. The defence has never been restricted, never curtailed, never hampered, always free to line up as it chose, to go when it pleased, barring offside, where it pleased, and do practically as it pleased. Always the offence has been too strong, too powerful, and has been the necessity of legal restrictions directed toward equalising the attack and defence. This was true in general up to the revolution, when ten yards and the forward pass came and the new game was created. With the forward pass, a great new unknown offensive weapon was provided. The history of the game since the granting of this new method of attack has again been chiefly a story of limiting the power and effectiveness of this new offence. To be sure, minor changes in the rules have had other motives and objectives, but taking it by and large, the statement is true to fact. A brief review of the conditions of the old game will recall to players and spectators of that period the situation and perhaps help all of us to better appreciate and understand the changes that brought the new game. Mass plays predominated. Possession of the ball was vastly important. Five yards were to be made in three downs. If a man six feet tall could fall forward his full length three times, he would make six yards and first down. Consequently, fall forward, get your distance, were slogans of the old game. End runs, though, they might occasionally succeed brilliantly, were apt to lose precious distance that could not be regained. If a team won the toss and took the ball, there was practically nothing but a fumble between them and a touchdown. And games e between evenly matched teams were often really decided by the luck of the toss at the beginning of the game. For with even weight, and particularly with a slight advantage of weight in the line, a safe conservative game, straight ahead, slow but sure, tackle to tackle, hammer the weak spot, was sure to bring the ultimate touchdown. All sorts of ingenious formations were devised for amassing power on the weak spot. The famous guards back of Pennsylvania, the flying wedge of Deland of Harvard, the turtleback wedge of others. The rolling mass on tackle and others of this type will bring a smile of reminiscence to old timers. Men were pushed, dragged and hauled along by their teammates. Often special straps were attached to the uniform to facilitate this work and even to make possible throwing a man bodily, feet first, over the prostrate lines. Doubtless many men were severely injured by the splendid cooperative efforts of their own teammates in such activity. Such a game meant pounding, pure, unadulterated, gruelling pounding until the selected spot, groggy and exhausted, gave way and the opponents swept through to victory or a substitute leaped in to fill the breach. Men came out of such games in those days bruised and exhausted. No definite injury, but dead. All in. They were worse the next day and still worse the next, dragging back ready for another gruelling pummeling by the following Saturday. Internal injuries often developed and an unwarranted large number of deaths occurred. The game was too rough, dangerously rough, not necessarily rough. Closely linked with this aspect of the old game was the moral problem. Everything was hidden in the mass play. Spectators could see little of the real game, nothing of the dirty work. Much of it could not be seen even by the officials. Publicity is a great deferent to unfairness. No man wants the spectators in the stands to see him pull any raw stuff. Close lines, petty irritations and difficulty of detection tempted many a man to foul play. We would like to think that the cleanness and high standard of sportsmanship of the new game is an indication of rising character and realisation of ethical values of sport. Doubtless it is, but at the same time no small part of it is due to the openness of the new game. The fact that not only officials but spectators can see most of what happens. The brutality of the old game, the deaths and injuries from it, its moral effect and finally even its lack of interest to spectators led to a general outcry against football. There was a wide demand that it be abolished as an intercollegiate sport. In 1906 a conference was called in New York for this purpose. Representatives from approximately 70 colleges attended. Fortunately for American youth there were in the conference men of vision who saw the real need of the hour. These men urged that the difficulty was not with football, but with the way in which it was allowed to be played, that the college faculties were themselves responsible for the condition in that they had given no adequate supervision to athletics, that the game should not be abolished, but revised. They contended that a new game should and could be produced that would be more open, less dangerous and more interesting than the old game. 
their councils ultimately prevailed, and the conference that met to abolish football formed what has become the National Collegiate Athletic Association, an organization that has done a wonderful work in raising the standards of sport in our American colleges. The conference appointed to a football rules committee, which amalgamating, if possible, with the old football rules committee, was rules that would change the game of football, that would make it a new game. What should be done to produce a more open, less dangerous, more interesting game of football? Remember the old mass game had resulted from five yards and three downs. The first fundamental suggestion was the requirement of ten yards to gain. This could never be made by mass attack. Consequently, the forward pass was given to the offence, practically the one great occasion of legislation favouring the offence. In 1912, a fourth down was added. With 10 yards and four downs, and the forward pass as the fundamental as the modern game of football has been developed. Other changes, often important and far-reaching in influence, followed, but they followed naturally, logically, almost unavoidably, once the fundamentals, 10 yards and the forward pass, had been accepted. Chapter 2. Legal Restrictions Relating to the Forward Pass The first suggestion of a recognition by the Football Rules Committee of any need of a more open game came in 1903. Between the 25-yard line, seven players of the offence were required on the line of scrimmage, and the first man receiving the ball from the snapper back might run with it, provided he crossed the scrimmage line five yards out from centre. The 25-yard line and the goal... However, only five men were required on the line of scrimmage. In that case, however, restrictions were adopted requiring the men to be back five yards or outside the end men. In 1904 came the checkerboard field. With 1906 came the Great Revolution and the adoption of the new game. Two lines of scrimmage, six men regularly on the line of scrimmage, centre trio back five yards if not on the line of scrimmage, ten yards and three downs, and the forward pass. It was with the last that we are concerned. At first, one forward pass could be made by any player anywhere behind his line of scrimmage to any player on the end of the line or one yard back of it, provided the pass crossed the line five yards out from centre. It was completed if touched by any eligible player before it touched the ground. Any illegal pass went to the opponents at the spot from which the pass was made. A forward pass over the goal line became a touchback. Naturally, a period of intensive experimentation followed. In 1907, the loss of the ball on first and second down was changed to a loss of 15 yards. In 1908, the recovery of the touched ball was restricted to the eligible man who would first touch it on penalty of going to the opponents at the spot. Also, the penalty for ineligible men touching the ball was increased to loss of the ball at spot where the pass was made. 1910 and 12 brought the legal changes that largely completed the new game. In 1910, the four periods were adopted. The longitudinal lines were omitted and a pass and kick were both required to be made from five yards behind the line of scrimmage. A 20-yard zone beyond which the pass could not go was instituted. This was dropped again in 1912. The end zone was added so that a team could score on a pass. The field shortened to 300 yards and the fourth down added. By many this was regarded as a direct blow to the forward pass as it was supposed that it would mean an attempt at and a possibility of making the distance by the old line bucking methods. This was regarded as in line with the restrictive action of 1911 by which a pass touching the ground either before or after being legally touched, was ruled as incompleted. Whatever the intention of the originators may have been, the fourth down has worked quite as advantageously to the new game as the old, in that it has given quarterbacks an additional down with which to experiment and to take chances. The changes relating to the forward pass since 1912 have been mostly of minor significance. The restriction requiring the kicker to be back five yards was removed in 1913. The forward passer was protected from being roughed up in 1914 and a 10-yard penalty for intentional grounding of a forward pass was imposed. The forward pass out of bounds was ruled incompleted in 1915. Relatively little change occurred during the war period and there has been a feeling since 
that experimentation has gone far enough, that the game is very good as it is, and that coaches, players and the public generally should have a chance to thoroughly acquaint themselves with the present possibilities. The open game has come to stay, and attempts to further restrict it have met with strong opposition. Chapter 3. The Spiral Pass from Centre Possibly many would not recognise the necessity for a discussion of the spiral pass from the snapperback in a presentation of the forward pass. Without this spiral pass, however, a successful forward passing game is greatly handicapped if not rendered absolutely ineffective. The reasons for this will be presented in a later chapter. Suffice it here to say that the writer regards a good, fast, accurate, true spiral pass from the snapper back that can be shot back speedily and accurately to a distance of at least 15 yards as absolutely indispensable to a successful forward passing game. Ability to get such a pass is not possessed by every centre, nor by every team, even among the better colleges. This failure is due first to a lack of appreciation of its importance, and second to an inability to teach centres how to acquire this art. The following method of teaching this pass has been found effective. First, have the candidate make an ordinary underhand spiral pass forward. This is so simple and common that almost every player does it automatically. Have him notice what he does. Notice how the ball is held as it swings forward past the hip. The hand is bent inward, almost at right angles to the forearm. Now as the ball is shot forward from the hand, a peculiar pulling, lifting motion is made. This motion imparts the rotation to the ball and produces the spiral. This is the fundamental part of the action. Essentially the same action must now be secured with the backward pass. Second, have the candidate make an ordinary underhand spiral pass backward. To many players this will at first seem awkward and they may be unable to control either the direction or the rotation of the pass. It is not necessary to continue with this until it is mastered but some practice on it is helpful. Proceed soon to the third step. Third, take position as a centre. Right leg back for a right-hander, swing the ball freely between the legs with the right hand, and make a backward spiral pass between the legs. Work on this until a regular spiral is secured. Fourth, still swing the ball freely from the ground, but place the left hand against the ball, pressing it more firmly against the forearm and guiding the direction of the ball. The right hand may now be a little farther forward on the ball. Fifth, when the above has been mastered, take position as in the fourth step. Then bending a little more in the hips and knees, place the ball without changing position of the hands so that it touches the ground well out in front. When ready, pull the ball powerfully with the right hand, guiding with the left, and shoot it back at the chest of the catcher, at first about seven yards back. Follow through with the right hand. As the ball leaves, the hand give the pulling, lifting snap described above in number one, which produces the real spiral. Great care must be taken to see that the right hand is kept far enough under and around the ball. As soon as the player begins to lay it on the ground, he almost invariably forgets to pass the hand far enough around it. Consequently, he loses his rotation and the pass becomes wobbly and inaccurate. Taught in this way, many men acquired the idea of the spiral pass from centre with great ease. Extended and constant practice, however, is necessary to ensure a consistent and accurate performance that can be depended upon under fire, the accomplishment fundamental to the forward pass. Some men master a very successful backward spiral pass from centre with one hand. The principle of this pass is essentially the same as that of the closed grip overhand pass described later in the chapter on technique of passing. It requires a large hand and perhaps a certain amount of natural knack. It is dangerous and less effective with a wet ball, but with a dry ball ability to cushion this way with one hand often adds greatly to the offensive strengths of the centre. Chapter 4. Technique of the Forward Pass The execution of a good spiral forward pass is a thing of real beauty and art. It holds the eye of the spectators and players alike. It is to football what the home run is to baseball. The soaring flight of a 60-yard spiral is like the rushing swoop of the daring aviator in its charm and interest. To produce it, the player must have a good arm, master the knack of it, and give long and earnest practice. Practically all passes of more than five yards are executed as spirals. 
These are of three types, the underhand, the overhand with closed grip, and the overhand with open grip. The underhand spiral. This is valuable for short distances where a quick pass is desired. Its execution is so easy and common that no further comment is needed beyond what has already been said in connection with the first part of teaching the spiral pass from centre. The overhand closed grip spiral. This pass is theoretically the correct and logical manner of executing a distance over 10 yards pass. The ball is laid over into the palm of the right hand, for a right hander, with the fingers along and somewhat behind the lacing of the ball, the thumb on the opposite side. The position of the hand depends largely on its size. The smaller the hand, the nearer the end of the ball it must go, and the more difficult it is to retain the ball in the grasp. This type of pass is therefore difficult for men with small hands and with a wet and muddy ball. In making the throw, the arm should be drawn backward over the shoulder, not down around as in a baseball throw. The nose, i.e. the forward point of the ball, should be well elevated and the ball is then shot forward past the ear at its objective. The motion is somewhat like that of a pitcher when pitching from the shoulder without the wind-up, with a runner on first. As the ball leaves the hand, the rotation is given by a sharp pull downward and inward. The most common fault and cause of failure with this pass is that the nose of the ball is not kept up during the forward motion of the arm. To do this, the elbow must be kept fairly close to the body, and the little finger side of the hand kept up. This gives a rather constricted position for throwing, and most men at first feel unable to get the desired distance. This comes, however, as one acquires the knack of the snap and the follow-through with the body. When developed and mastered, this pass gives wonderful accuracy, great speed, and can be shot directly to the receiver without much elevation. It is therefore less likely to be intercepted, and is an ideal pass, particularly for shorter distances up to 30 yards and for dry days. The overhand open spiral. This pass is made in general in the same way as the closed grip spiral, but the thumb lies alongside or near the fingers, and the hand is open, the ball lying in the palm of the hand. It is held in position as the throw is made by the centrifugal force of the swing. In making this pass, a bigger swing may be used, more comparable to a wind-up delivery, and consequently, greater distance and the greater height may be secured. The ball can be literally heaved out, and passes of 50 to 60 yards are easily possible. The greatest difficulty in the execution of this, as in the closed grip pass, is to keep the nose of the ball up. This can be accomplished, however, without bringing the hand in so closely as in the other, thus allowing opportunity for more individual peculiarities. Players, therefore, usually learn this pass easier than the others, and because of its greater usefulness with a wet and slippery ball is the pass now most commonly used. Its chief disadvantage is the greater height which it usually requires. This tends to increase the danger of interception. Receiving the forward pass. Although a great deal of practice is usually given to receiving forward passes, often very little actual coaching is given on the correct form. Every receiver should be notified by some method just before a pass is made to him. At this signal, the receiver should turn around the point to which the pass is supposed to be made. This should be known on all forward pass plays. The receiver and ball should then be met at this position. The receiver on the dead run and somewhat sided to the ball. It will occasionally happen but should rarely be necessary for the receiver to take a pass from directly behind or even very much over one shoulder. He should, however, be able to do it when necessary. The actual catching of the pass is not essentially different from catching a punt or any ordinary pass. One hand should be used to guide the ball into the body, one hand should be kept well under the ball, the elbows should be kept close, and the ball always be brought in against the body and held securely against any possible attack. Chapter 5. Fundamentals of a successful forward passing game. The forward pass has now been a part of offensive football for 15 years. In spite of that fact, few teams have developed anything like a consistently successful ground-gaining forward pass attack. Apparently, many regard the forward pass simply as a valuable threat, something for occasional use, something to take a chance with, something the possibility of which makes the real game still workable. To a large degree, this has been the attitude of the larger colleges. In general, they are frowned on the forward pass, opposed it, sneered at it, called it basketball, and done what they could to retard its adoption. It has taken away from them the advantage of numbers, weight and power, made the game one of brains, speed and strategy, even if you please, like baseball, luck 
rendered the outcome of their practice games with smaller colleges uncertain. Why should they have hastened its development? Rather, it has been the smaller colleges that have found in the forward past their opportunity, which have developed its possibilities until now the larger ones, as well, are turning to it as the final means of winning their big game. It is doubtless fair to say that the early development of the forward pass was largely due to two teams, Springfield College of the YMCA and the Carlisle Indians. Their game in 1912 at Springfield is said by competent experts to have probably the greatest exhibition of open football ever staged. It is doubtful if two such finished exponents of the open game have ever met before or since. To coach J. H. McCurdy of the Springfield team goes the honour, in the writer's judgment, of the early recognition and development of the strategy of the forward pass, for in this respect at least, Springfield excelled even the wonderful Indian teams produced by Glenn Warner. No one team can longer claim a leadership in this or any other department of the game, but it is fair to say that the Springfield team has continuously demonstrated an unusual aptitude for the forward pass, and a high degree of leadership at least among the Eastern teams. It is not strange in view of the fact that the great leaders of football have not taken more kindly to the forward pass, that its underlying principles have not been more thoroughly worked out and organised. It is the chief purpose of this work to state, if possible, some of these principles and fundamentals to the end that the open game of football, always in the past and still to some extent opposed by certain groups, may be better understood, more successfully coached, and more firmly and thoroughly established. Regular ground gaining play. The first fundamental of a successful forward passing game is that the forward pass should be used as a regular ground gaining play. And not simply, as many teams seem still to do, as a sort of last desperate chance. With many teams, the attack may be summarised practically in this manner. First and second, down, runs. Third down, forward pass. Fourth down, kick. Then they wonder that the forward pass doesn't succeed and stigmatise it as a dangerous treacherous and unsuccessful play. Rather, a team must have the confidence to use it often on first and second downs, and even on special occasions on a fourth down. Not only that, but it must be used frequently, persistently, and continuously. Nothing more disturbs the morale of a defence than a series of forward passes, some of which succeed, even though a considerable portion of them are incompleted. There is always the danger that one may succeed and get away. What proportion of the running plays is successful in the modern game? No statistics exist. If the forward pass were tried anything like as persistently as the running game, unquestionably its percentage of success would greatly increase. On this basis, the pass should be used for short as well as long gains. A running play that gains two and a half to three yards is regarded as successful. Why should not a pass be used in the same way? Passes that give little or no gain in themselves, but put the receiver in position for open field running, at, at least a few yards gain, disorganise the defence, eventually make the long pass successful, spread the defence so bucking becomes possible, and contribute generally to making the forward pass a regular ground-gaining play, a part of the regular attack. Pass are well back. The early successes of the forward pass were secured almost solely upon the principle of putting the pass at the distance of 15 yards back, then letting the opposing line come charging through absolutely without resistance. Practically the whole offensive team was sent down to receive, apparently, the pass, thus confusing the defence as to who was eligible and furnishing interference as soon as the pass was completed. By actual experiment, it was found that a distance of 13 to 15 yards was necessary. Although lines are more wary and experienced today than formerly, this single piece of strategy is still very valuable. Many teams are failing with their passes simply because their passer is not more than 7 to 10 yards back. The greater distance gives a short but vital length of time for receivers to get free and for the passer to pick out the open man. It also gives a longer time for running sideward and forward, helping to confuse the defence as to whether a run or pass is really intended. Add to this the fact that with the greater distance back, little or no protection need be given the passer. It becomes clear that though many plays can and will be built with the passer up close and running back only the necessary legal distance, a big distance back is an important fundamental. This at once brings out the importance of the spiral pass back from centre, and the ability to make one desired a long forward pass of from 50 to 60 yards. 
Unless the snapper back can make a consistent, accurate, speedy pass to a distance of 15 or more yards and can accurately lead his passer, no advantage is gained by this distance back. Many teams have failed to put their pass at the necessary distance back because, though they did not recognise the real difficulty, their centre was not adequately getting the ball back to him. Consequently, the passer was instinctively creeping up closer and closer, being hurried in his passes and often failing. The spiral pass back from centre is an absolutely fundamental requisite for a successful forward passing game. The ability also to make long passes is fundamental. With a secondary defence playing 10 yards back and possibly covering 20 yards more, with the passer 15 yards behind his own offensive line, the pass going outward an angle must often travel 55 yards to clear the secondary defence. Although such long passes need not often be used, the knowledge that the offence possesses the ability to make them is necessary to keep the secondary defence back so that short, sharp passes may succeed with the disconcerting gains of the regular ground-gaining attack. Kick, run or pass possible. The ideal forward pass formation is one from which a kick, pass or run is possible. As the play starts, it should be difficult to diagnose whether a run or pass is intended. In fact, as a team becomes finished in its performance, it may often switch in its intention, running out of play on the call of the passer that was intended for a pass, because the defence lay back and waited, and conversely, though not so often, a pass may be made to an open man on the call of the passer, with a signal called for a run. This represents high art in teamwork, but it can be developed much depends upon the alertness and headwork of the passer in this connection. Such changing of a plan should not be allowed in the early season, but it may be encouraged later as the team becomes unified and comes to know itself. Such a combination operating with basketball intuition becomes exceedingly difficult to stop. If in addition to this a kick is occasionally worked on something besides the fourth down, the game becomes a real test of wits. Naturally, not every forward pass will be pulled from an ideal formation. Any splendid forward pass players can be built up from ordinary close-running bucking formations. All eligible men open. Choice versus mechanical method. An occasional forward pass play is developed where only a single eligible man is open to receive the pass. Such a play depends for success upon its speed of execution its unexpectedness, and its similarity to other regularly used running plays. A few such plays should of course be included in the team's attack, but they are the exception, and when successful are so because of that fact. They the more strongly emphasise the fact that as a general principle, a regular forward pass play should aim to get as many eligible men as possible open to receive the pass. These men should be so spread that they cannot all be covered by the defence. The passer then selects an open man, or the best open man, to whom to pass. This method puts great responsibility upon the passer. It fits in with the idea of putting him well back and giving him as much time as possible to make his choice. It requires a passer of special mental type and one of considerable basketball ability who can dodge and get his pass off accurately even when apparently covered. The ease of choice can be much facilitated by having an order for each play in which the pass is to look for possibilities. The first choice should always be the signal called. That play should always be made if it is at all possible. In early season and during practice it should be executed whether possible or not. But as the passer develops ability he should be allowed when the pass signalled is covered to select second, third and even fourth choices and the order of looking for the choices should be so arranged that a quick sweep of the field in front of him will give the passer his open men. Not all coaches agree to the principle outlined above. Many have had difficulty in finding passers who could make the choice required. They felt, therefore, that plays had to be designed to special men, calling these men to special zones, one time one place, next time another place, and then the play made as quickly as possible to this special man. If the defence was confused and the man got loose, the play succeeded, barring mechanical failure. If he did not, it failed. This represents a purely mechanical method. It harks back to the old game, where everything was as mechanical as possible and there was little need of brain power and little occasion to make quick decisions. The quarter made the decisions, the player did what he was told to do, 
the new open game is not played that way. It opens up a world of choice and possibility to the player. Therein lies its greatly increased mental value. The big reason that many coaches have failed with the choice method of passing is that their players have not been so designed as to give their passer the necessary time for making a choice. They have allowed the defense to hurry the passer. Some of the methods of preventing this have already been indicated. Occasionally it may happen that a team possesses a passer of great ability who cannot work the choice method. For such a player, mechanical plays must be built. But the probabilities are that many men would develop this ability if they were given practice and the opportunity. Call the receiver before passing. It seems a very simple matter to say that a receiver should be called before the pass is made to him. It seems so simple that time is rarely spent in practicing it. It is assumed that it will be done, but in reality it is not done. The usual thing is for the passer to hurl the ball into the air and yell, ball. Let any coach actually insist once on his passer calling his man before he passes to him and see what happens. And yet this is exactly the thing that will change the forward pass game from a happy-go-lucky chance into a mathematical probability. When a passer calls his man before he passes, he knows what he is trying to do. The team knows. The receiver is given more time to get into position. He is then given a better chance to catch the pass and the rest of the team are given a chance to form interference. It is a small thing to count as heavily as it does, but it is one of the small things that make success. Know where the receiver is to go. Have it clearly worked out on every pass play where each eligible man is to go. This is equally true, in fact, for every man on the team. For every man on the team has something to do on a forward pass. It is just as important on a forward pass play that each eligible man know where, when and how he is to go as it is on running plays for the interference to know whom they are to take. This is where the mechanical part of the choice method of passing comes in. To a surprising degree, this can be almost the same on all plays. It will, of course, vary somewhat with the style of defense met, but again, surprisingly little. The eligible man should seldom go directly to the spot where he will call the pass if it comes to him. The proper instant which should be pretty definitely timed for everybody on each play and always at the call of the passer, the receiver should turn and race to the spot where he knows the ball will be thrown. This spot should have been previously worked out so that the passer leads the receiver, the latter being in better position to catch the ball and on the dead run. This should also be so worked out on the preliminary run of the eligible man such that the receiver will get the ball with his body between the ball and his covering opponent. Receiver and opponent should never be crashing together when struggling for a ball. It is not only dangerous, but poor strategy. In working out the above possibilities, some eligible men may often be used simply as decoys, going perhaps almost straight toward the defensive halves and forcing them to cover them, making other eligible men more surely available for the pass. In case the defensive halves, however, refuse to cover these decoys, they should immediately be given the pass. Between combinations of this sort, and the problem of determining whether a pass or run is in process, the position of defensive half in modern football is one compared with which the dizzy corner in baseball is a bed of roses. The fact is that a team with anything like a mechanical perfection in the passing game, and any ability to select its men as above indicated, simply cannot be stopped in midfield. The greatest single fault, and the one thing that stops most teams outside of mechanical failure, is the failure of eligible men to spread widely enough. Too often, two or three eligible men go to the same zone or area, and a pass any one of the three can be covered by a single defensive player. Instinctively, every man on the offence tries to be where he expects the ball to go. It must be drilled into the players that their business may be decidedly elsewhere. Interference Finally, plan definitely for interference after the pass is completed. This is particularly true for the shorter pass. Insist that every man is in every pass play. There's great temptation for a lineman to take a day off when a long pass is called in which they're not likely to figure. They should either be protecting the passer, making it possible for him to better choose his open man, or down with the eligible men in the shorter zones ready for immediate interference in case that pass should be elected. This should be definitely mapped out with each formation and the receiver should know where to find interference behind which he can dodge the instant he has received the pass. Interception. The danger of interception, though much overrated by many, should be carefully guarded. The interception of a long pass often means nothing worse than punting to the other team 
would have meant. Possession of the ball does not count for as much as in the old game. It should never mean worse if the danger of interception is properly guarded. Too often, however, it means a touchdown for the defence. In the first place, when the receiver has been called, every other man on the offence should instantly become alive as a possible interferer or possible protector in case of interception. It is a preparedness, mental and physical, that is desired that in itself would probably prevent half of the touchdowns now made by interception. A pass doesn't finish a play, it simply starts it, and may start it either way. In the second place, all linemen and eligible men in the shorter zones, who perhaps can be of no assistance on the longer pass, should the instant they find the long pass in process, act as if they expected it to be intercepted. Finally, the passer himself and his immediate protectors should, the instant the pass is off, cover for possible interception. They are the last, and possibly by far the most important, safety in case of interception. Chapter 6. Suggestive Forward Pass Formations and Plays The previous chapter attempted a general statement of the fundamental principles upon which a successful forward passing game may be built. It is the purpose here to illustrate these by definite formations and plays that have been successfully used. The kick formation has lent itself in many ways very admirably to forward passing. A slightly modified punt formation in which the left end is one yard back, one half of the line, full 15 yards back, halves about three yards back, has proven effective for line bucking, end running right or left, punting and forward passing. The greatest difficulty lies in getting the left half to go out straight to the side and be content with a short gain. When this happens a few times, someone from the defence is bound to try to cover him. When that is attempted, the way is open for runs or passes to left end or tackle. This sideward threat, almost a pure lateral pass, is an important part of the strategy of the successful forward pass attack. Note in the play the direction and turning of other eligible players, the position of linemen for interference in case of a short pass over centre or outward to the wide man, and the general protection for possible interception. A quick shift of left end to the line and right half one yard back, or even played as it is, gives an equally good formation for run or pass to the right, the corresponding players going to the corresponding positions, and everybody swinging and turning toward the right. Against this type of play, contrast the above, which, though it has often proven surprisingly successful, seems to the writer to violate most of the principles above outlined. The ends coming in, are at no advantage over the defence. The halves going outward have no interference and there's almost no defence for possible interception. One of the early successful forward pass formations was a widespread one devised and used by Dr J H McCurdy of the Springfield team in the Springfield Carlisle Indian game of 1912. In this the line was spread out practically across the whole field. It was used for kicking as well and the whole line was sent down to stop the wonderful fork. The play was good enough to produce 24 points against the wonderful Indian team of that year, although the game was won by the Indians 30-24. The play is given here partly because of its historical value, but also because the principle is still good. Spread formations, somewhat modified from the above, are still proving very successful, the following serving to again illustrate the principles of the preceding chapter. In this formation, tackles are out 7 to 10 yards. Halves about 3 yards back, and full is back 13 to 15 yards. From this formation, line bucks, end runs, double pass end runs, kicks and forward passes may be used. Quick variations may also be made to make tackles eligible if desired. The formations outlined will doubtless sufficiently illustrate the principles discussed. There is no limit to the possibilities. The kick and spread formations here, given alone, possess sufficient possibilities for a team's entire season's repertoire of open plays. A common mistake is to attempt too large and varied an assortment of these plays. Chapter 7. Defence for the Forward Pass There is no defence for the forward pass. In reality, the pass cannot be prevented, particularly in the centre of the field. Yet from the unwillingness of some of the great football leaders to adopt this style of game, one would infer that it is a worthless game, difficult to succeed with and easy of defence. This is the point of view of a number of teams. Yet it is interesting to note that these are the very teams that have had no adequate forward pass defence. Thus far, most teams have trusted to luck against the forward passing game. 
the inefficiency and mechanical errors of its offence, aided by the restrictive legal measures adopted, have conspired to make this possible. Signs are not lacking, however, to indicate a greatly increased use of the passing game, an improved understanding and appreciation of its fundamental principles, and a much greater degree of success for it. The defence for the forward pass will need to be studied with great care in the immediate future. The writer does not pretend to have solved this problem. His interest has been rather on the other side. The following suggestions are offered simply as a beginning. First, hurry the pass. Some man or men, not the entire line, should go through and force the pass at the earliest possible moment, downing the passer, blocking the pass, or forcing it to be made before the eligible men are ready or the passer has been able to locate them. This greatly increases the chance of mechanical failure. Generally, this should be done by the ends. Some teams send the tackles in also. Some send tackles in and have the ends wait. This frequently helps against the pass, but makes end running very easy. Second, block eligible men. This, of course, can only be done before the pass is made. But there is often an appreciable time before the pass is made when eligible men could be blocked on the line of scrimmage. This is the best work of the centre trio rather than charging through. Third, play a zone defence, having each de defensive back cover an area and play the ball coming into that area rather than attempt to follow individually eligible men. Fourth, use the open defence, that is, play the centre out of the line and with the full back about three yards behind tackle. This defence is supposed to make centre bucking easy, but it is not if the defensive line is properly coached. This first line of secondary defence is in position to intercept short passes or to help stop eligible men on the scrimmage line. They are also in the best possible position to assist on outside tackle and end runs while still in a position to block centre bucks. In the judgment of the writer, this is the best all-round defence yet devised for the modern open game of football. The open defence should be played as follows. Guards play to the centre, low hard and stalling, not knifing through. Tackles fight their way into the play through opposing end. Ends play as close as possible, often not over two yards outside their own tackle, and tear into every other player, smashing the interference and hurrying passes. Centre and full play about three yards behind tackle, usually a trifle inside, and wait until they diagnose the play, then meet it. These men must be the best tacklers on the team and fast, for if the tackles and ends accomplish their work, these men have the opportunity. Backs play from seven to ten yards back and nearly straight behind end. Quarter or safety man should play as close as he dares to, considering the possibility of quick punts. This may be generally closer than most quarters play. The defence with spread formations and for special plays is still too much a matter of individual opinion to be discussed here. End of the Forward Pass in Football by Alma Berry Read by Edmund Bloxham in Taipei, Taiwan Concerning the Blessing of God in the Goods of this World From the work entitled The Threefold Life of Man by Jacob Bome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Man has free permission to disport himself on the earth in whatsoever employment he will. Do what he will. Everything stands in the miraculous power of God. A swineherd is as dear to him as a doctor so he be pious and confide purely in god's will the simple is as useful to him as the wise for with the wise man he rules and with the simple he builds both are equally instruments of his wondrous deeds each has his calling wherein he passeth his time and all are equal before him as the flowers of the earth do not envy one another, although one is more beautiful and more powerful than another, but all in a friendly manner stand side by side, and each rejoices in the other's virtue. And as a physician mingles together various kinds of herbs of which each gives forth its power and its virtue, 
and all minister unto the sick, so likewise do we all please God, as many of us as enter into his will. We all stand together in his field, and as thorns and thistles spring forth from the ground, and choke and devour many a good herb and flower, so likewise is the godless who trusteth not in God, but buildeth upon himself, and thinketh, I have my God in my box. I will hoard and leave great treasures to my children, that they also may sit in the place of mine honor. That is the true way and therewith rendereth many a heart that it also waxeth careless and thinketh that is the right way to happiness that a man possesses riches and power and honour and hath happiness yet if we consider it it happens to one as to another and the poor soul is none the less lost for the rich man's dainties taste no better to him than the hungry man's morsel of bread everywhere there is care grief fear sickness and at last death it is all a fighting with shadows in this world the mighty sitteth in the dominion of the spirit of this world and he that feareth god sitteth in the dominion of divine power and wisdom the dominion of this world endeth with the body but the dominion in the spirit of god endureth for ever End of Concerning the Blessing of God in the Goods of This World From the work entitled The Threefold Life of Man By Jakob Bumet, 1575-1624The Declaration of Independence of the United States of America This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Declaration of Independence of the United States of America In Congress, July 4, 1776 The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume, among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having indirect object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. 
he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such disillusions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone, for the tenure of their offices, and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. 
in every stage of these oppressions we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people nor have we been wanting in attention to our british brethren we have warned them from time to time of the attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us we have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here we have appealed to their native justice and their magnanimity and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence they too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity we must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind enemies in war in peace friends we therefore the representatives of the united states of america in general congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and the state of great britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war conclude peace contract alliances establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes and our sacred honor the end of the declaration of independence of the united states of america first half of effects of incendiary bomb attacks on tokyo japan by the united states strategic bombing survey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org effects of incendiary bomb attacks on tokyo japan first half by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. Part 1. Object of Study The primary purpose of this study was to determine why the incendiary bomb attack of 9-10 to 10, March 1945 by the 20th AF on the densely populated incendiary Zone 1 of Tokyo was so highly successful. The purpose was further to appraise the fire damage to industrial establishments caused by direct hits and by exposure fires. In addition, the other major attacks on Tokyo are listed to give a more complete picture of the effort directed against the city and the damage accomplished. Part 2. Summary 1. Tokyo, included in the world's third largest metropolitan area, had a population of more than 7 million in 1944. It was the seat of the national government and the leading city of Japan in manufacturing, commerce, communication, transportation, and amusements. The metropolitan area of Tokyo covered more than 800 square miles, the city proper more than 200 square miles, and the highly built-up portion of the city about 100 square miles. 2. Tokyo Incendiary Zone 1 was the most highly built-up portion of the city, and its 11.08 square miles had an average built-upness of more than 40%. Built-upness is a measure of the portion of an area covered by buildings. 
its population density ranged from 90,000 to more than 135,000 persons a square mile, and averaged 103,000. 3. More than 95% of the buildings in Zone 1 were wooden and of typical Japanese construction. Most of these buildings had tile roofs, but some had corrugated sheet metal roofs. They were normally built in solid block fronts, separated by narrow alleys 10 to 15 feet wide. Wide streets separated these into sections of 50 to 100 blocks. The total length of fire breaks in this zone was 78 miles. 4. Home industry was highly concentrated in Zone 1, which was also surrounded on three sides by factory areas. Most of the people living in the zone worked either in the home industries or in the surrounding factories. 5. When it became evident that the city would be subjected to air attacks, the Japanese prepared fire breaks 120 to 300 feet wide through the densely built-up areas by raising buildings. Thousands of structures were demolished for this purpose before the end of the war. Fire equipment was increased to a total of 1,117 pieces, of which 716 were motor-driven pumpers, with capacities of 350 to 500 gallons per minute. In addition, numerous pieces of hand-operated equipment were distributed throughout the city, and an effort was made to instruct the people in their use. The normal fire department strength of 2,000 was increased to 8,100. Practically all firemen were required to go through a school of instruction. By Japanese standards, they were considered well-trained, but by American standards, they were still in the recruit stage. 6. The source of water was ample for the city but the scant distribution system was inadequate from a fire protection standpoint. More than half of all pipes were 3 or 4 inches in diameter. Pressures were generally low, varying from 0 to 25 pounds per square inch. 60% of all hydrants were one-way flush type on 4-inch or smaller mains. A few static tanks of 20,000 to 40,000 gallon capacity had been built, but they were not in sufficient number to be effective. 7. Six attacks are considered in this report. The most important of these was the night attack of 9 to 10 March 1945, both because this attack marked the departure from high-altitude daylight bombing in formation to individual low-level night bombing and because the efficiency of this attack was greater than any made before or since. In this attack, 9.48 square miles of the target were burned for each 1,000 tons of bombs dropped, or 1 square mile per 105 tons. A total of 15.8 square miles of the city was totally or heavily damaged in this attack. 56 square miles were totally or heavily damaged in all attacks. One other attack, that of 25 to 26 May 1945, damaged a greater area, 16.8 square miles, but the bomb tonnage dropped was twice as great. 8. The number of persons made homeless by all attacks on Tokyo totaled 2,861,857. 1 million 8,000 by the attack of 9 to 10 March. All attacks killed 95,972 persons. 85,793 in the attack of 9 to 10 March. Part 3. General Information. 1. The portion of Tokyo Area Team 6, which conducted this investigation, consisted of the following personnel. Major G. P. Gill, Team Chief. Major T. F. Gallagher, Ordnance. Major H. V. Keepers, Fire Damage Analyst. First Lieutenant J. S. Rains, 
fire damage analyst. Photographer's mate, second class, J. D. DeVore, photographer. Technician, fourth grade, M. Shimomura, interpreter. Corporal H. L. Born, draftsman. 2. The study was conducted during the periods 27 October to 1 November and 20 November to 28 November 1945. The weather during the latter period was cold and rainy, making it difficult to obtain good photographs. 3. Information for this report was obtained from the chief of the Tokyo Fire Department, various plant managers, police, firemen, residents, and other divisions of the survey. Information from Japanese sources was usually verified by examination or by questioning several individuals on the same subject, although there seemed to be no reason why false information should be given deliberately by the Japanese. Cooperation by all concerned was excellent. The photo cover for the attack of 23 to 24 May was too poor to be used in making a good damage estimate. The figure for the damage in that attack used in this report was obtained by measuring the damage plotted on a map by the Japanese immediately following the attack. Excellent photo cover was available for the combination of this attack and the attack of 25 to 26 May and the damage from the latter attack was taken as the difference between the combination from photo cover and the former from Japanese sources. Part 4. The Target 1. Tokyo was part of a vast metropolitan area located along the north shore of Tokyo Bay and situated in the southeast corner of the Kanto Plain. This metropolitan area, which included Tokyo, Yokohama, Kawasaki, and numerous small suburban villages was the third largest in the world before the air attacks began. The city of Tokyo proper was the largest city in Japan, its population of 7,238,569, 1944 census, having been as great as the five next largest cities of Japan combined. Tokyo was the seat of the national government, the home of the emperor and the imperial court, and the center of power and authority. It was at once the greatest industrial, communications, transportation, commercial, and amusement center of Japan. It was also considered to be preeminent in respect to universities, museums, hospitals, department stores, office buildings, and theaters. 2. The Metropolitan District of Tokyo formed an irregular oval extending some 28 miles from north to south and 57 miles from east to west, totaling 828 square miles. The 35 wards of the city proper covered only one-fourth of the Metropolitan District, 213 square miles, but contained more than 90% of its population. Of the city proper, an area of 103.45 square miles was highly built up, and for this reason it was considered by the United States Air Forces as the Tokyo target area. This area consisted of Incendiary Zone 1, 11.08 square miles Incendiary Zone 2, 57.04 square miles Target area 90.17-3600, 8.52 square miles. Target area 90.17-3601, 14.85 square miles. Target area 90.17-3602, 6.70 square miles. Target area 90.17-3603, 5.26 square miles. Total, 103.45 square miles. Figure 1 shows the location of incendiary zone 1. 3. The largest and best buildings in Tokyo 
were located east of the Imperial Palace, Photo 1, in the financial and shopping districts, Maruno Uchi and the Ginza. There were many multi-story, earthquake, and fire-resistive buildings, but these were interspersed with flimsy wood structures. The better residential areas extended from the palace grounds well into the northwestern and southwestern sections of the city. Although most of the streets in these sections were narrow, the built-upness was not so great as in other sections of the city, and the houses were often surrounded with walled gardens. The principal open spaces were parks totaling some seven square miles. 4. Since the primary object of this report is concerned with Mission 40, the 9-10 to 10 March attack, a somewhat detailed description of incendiary Zone 1 follows. The facts presented would have applied in general to the rest of Tokyo. A. The target area chosen for Mission 40 was incendiary Zone 1, a highly congested rectangular-shaped area approximately 3 miles east-west by 4 miles north-south. Figure 1. The conspicuous Imperial Palace grounds lay at the southwest corner, and the western boundary extended northward to Ueno Park, another prominent open space about two miles north of the palace. The boundary then curved to the east and north along the Joban Railroad to the Sumida River, thence southeast to a north-south line, the eastern boundary, which was halfway between the Sumida River and the Diversion Canal. The southern boundary extended from this line due west across the Y mouth of the Sumida River to the palace grounds. The western boundary of Zone 1 bordered on Tokyo's business center, extending north and south along the east side of the Imperial Palace grounds. Included in this area was the Ginza shopping area with its numerous shops and fine department stores. The Marunouchi section near the palace contained government buildings, banking houses, newspaper plants, and insurance company buildings. The north boundary adjoined Tokyo's great arsenal area and railroad marshalling yards. The eastern boundary extending through the center of the island made by the Sumida River and the Diversion Canal bordered on a large industrial area of steel mills, instrument plants, foundries, spinning mills, and numerous miscellaneous industrial plants on the canals in this area. The southern boundary bordered on an area of heavy industry, including shipyards along Tokyo Bay. The nearby industrial area drew heavily on the population of Zone 1 for labor. B. Zone 1 included one of the most densely populated areas in the world, Asakusa-ku, with a population of more than 135,000 persons per square mile. The remainder of the zone had a population density of 80,000 to 135,000 persons per square mile, except for a small portion in the southeast corner where the population was somewhat less. Figure 2. Average population density was 103,000. The total number of persons living within the area was estimated at 1,100,000, or about 15% of Tokyo's population. Most of the persons made their living from the industries in and surrounding this area. C. There was probably no other residential area in the world of a comparable size which equaled the built-upness of Zone 1, which averaged 40 to 50 percent. This means that the roof area of the zone was 40 to 50 percent of the total area, including streets, small parks and rivers, and all other areas within its boundaries. Photo 2. When it is considered that the average American residential area is only about 10% built up, it can be seen that Zone 1 was highly congested. D. 
After the earthquake and fire of 1923, Tokyo was largely rebuilt, but many temporary wooden barracks were erected to meet the emergency. In Zone 1, a large number of these barracks had degenerated into permanent slum areas, instead of being replaced as had been originally planned. E. There were six important targets within Zone 1, the most important of which was the Hattori Company, peacetime manufacturers of Seikosha watches and wartime manufacturers of fuses for artillery shells. The remaining targets were railroad yards, stations, and market areas. The heavy industrial area was just east of the eastern boundary of Zone 1 and included some 35 important targets. Shipyards, steel mills, and cable plants were along the southern boundary of Zone 1. Principal strategic products were fuses, steel and special alloys, copper wire and cable, bakelite, electric motors and allied products, textiles, guns, railroad rolling stock, and numerous small parts for aircraft and automobiles. The importance of this area to the total output of strategic war products was indicated by the special efforts made to protect the plants from possible incendiary attacks. They were surrounded by 100-foot fire breaks, and special efforts were made to train fire brigades. In some instances, the Tokyo Fire Department maintained a fire station on the premises. F. This target area of Tokyo was ideal for home industry, which was prevalent in all large Japanese cities. The feeder factories were near the workers' homes, which solved the problem of transportation of raw materials to the home and finished products back to the factory. Small machined parts and foodstuffs were the principal products. Photos 3, 4, 5. These small producers were located both in homes and in small shops formerly devoted to other uses. The number of such establishments is not available, but it is known that they were very numerous and contributed heavily to the output of the larger plants. Burned machinery of these home industries was noted throughout the area. G. Dwellings in this zone were typically Japanese. Photos 6 and 7. For the most part, there were two-story wood frame, photos 8 and 9, with one-half to three-fourths inch wood floors covered with straw tatami mats and with tile on mud-fill wood roofs. The ceilings were of unprotected one-fourth inch wood laths. In many cases, the first floor was used for a small store or some home industry. Small charcoal braziers, photo 10, were the only means of heating the houses. Cooking was accomplished on a similar device, usually of stone or clay, built as an integral part of the building. Most Japanese homes had no basement. Framing in the usual dwelling was approximately 4 by 4 inches for studs, with intermediate members 2 by 4 inches. Outside walls were covered by thin clapboards, or bamboo lath and low-grade mud plaster. Framing members were joined by mortise and tenon joints with very few nails or other metal parts used in the construction. Photo 7 H the combustibility of Japanese dwellings was well illustrated by tests made in this country. Four buildings were constructed, two in the typical Japanese fashion, with outer walls of clapboard and with exposed windows, the combination store residence type so common in Zone 1, and the other two to comply with the latest Tokyo fire regulations. The latter were two stories high with three-fourths inch plaster on metal reinforcing, lath, and with wooden shutters on windows. The four structures were set on fire to determine the time necessary for their destruction. 
those constructed in typical Japanese fashion, burned to the ground in 12 minutes. Those constructed in accordance with Tokyo fire regulations were consumed in 32 minutes. It was estimated from unburned areas of Tokyo near Zone 1 that about 95% of the dwellings were built in typical Japanese fashion. I. There were few modern apartment buildings in Tokyo. Those inspected were usually four to five story fire and earthquake resistive structures built after the 1923 earthquake. All were located in congested areas and were susceptible to exposure fires. None of those inspected, however, was provided with exposure protection devices such as wire glass windows and fire shutters. J. The majority of manufacturing plants were one-story masonry or steel frame structures with wood frame or unprotected metal roof trusses. Tokyo was subject to numerous earthquakes, and the construction of multi-story earthquake-resistive buildings was prohibitive in cost. Roof covering was either corrugated iron or asbestos cement. Masonry walls were widely used in the spinning and weaving mills, instrument electrical plants, printing plants converted to other uses, or similar industrial establishments. Steel frame structures were commonly used in foundries, steel plants, machine shops, and analogous industries. K. Throughout Zone 1, there were numerous small plants, each employing 50 persons or less. The predominant type of structure housing these industries was of wood or steel frame with a roof covering of corrugated iron or asbestos cement. Photo 11. These plants were all seriously exposed by surrounding dwellings and mercantile buildings. L. The street pattern of Tokyo followed a fairly definite plan. Individual blocks were bounded by narrow alleys hardly more than 12 feet wide. Photo 12. Groups of blocks varying in number from 100 to 300 were bounded by wide thoroughfares or canals 100 feet in width on the average. Photo 13. Sections along the east bank of the Sumida River were more or less square in shape, while the territory west of the river was irregular in pattern and size. Due to the highly combustible structures and narrow alleys, these sections were the smallest units that could be considered as individual fire areas. It would be possible under peacetime conditions to halt the spread of fire across one of the wide streets with a well-trained and well-equipped fire department, because brands falling on tile roofs do not spread fire. The narrow alleys made it difficult to move any but the smallest pieces of fire equipment within the individual sections. Thus the conflagration hazard from a large area in century bomb attack was serious. In view of the above, it is apparent that the starting of numerous fires on both sides of fire breaks and wide streets would be more than the local householders could combat and would be too numerous for the fire department personnel to handle. This together with the highly combustible, flimsy, quick-burning construction would defeat the efforts of the best of fire departments. M. The purpose of fire breaks is to confine fires within certain limits and provide avenues of escape for the people. These fire breaks may be blocks of fire resistive structures forming a solid wall at right angles to the source of the fire, or open spaces of land, canals, rivers, or widened streets made by removing buildings. Tokyo, like other Japanese cities, had many transportation canals. Where they were 100 feet or more in width, these canals made excellent fire breaks. Several wide canals were located west of the Sumida River and east of the Imperial Palace. The Sumida River was the most effective fire break in Zone 1. 
it divided the zone almost in half from northeast to southwest. In April 1944, the Japanese government realized that the home islands might be subject to heavy air attacks and took steps to lessen the danger of fire spread by creating man-made firebreaks. From this time until the end of the war, thousands of buildings were removed or demolished for this purpose. Photo 14 From east to west, the breaks were 120 to 300 feet wide, since the prevailing winds were north-south except in summer months. A notable exception was a 300-foot break running north to south near the eastern boundary of Zone 1. With the natural barriers of canals and rivers, these fire breaks, with the assistance of an adequate fire department, would have kept a peacetime fire confined to the area of origin. The incendiary bomb attacks, however, nullified their effectiveness by starting fires on both sides of them. Statistics on fire breaks in Zone 1 are given below. Fire breaks Total length Miles 150 feet wide or more 26.3 65 to 150 feet wide, 51.7. Total, 78.0. Subjected to fire, miles, 150 feet wide or more, 20.6. 65 to 150 feet wide, 37.3. Total, 57.9. Percentage subjected to fire. 150 feet wide or more, 78.3, 65 to 150 feet wide, 72.1, total, 74.2, fire stopped, miles, 150 feet wide or more, 3.6, 65 to 150 feet wide, 2.3, total, 5.9, Percentage stopped, 150 feet wide or more, 17.4, 65 to 150 feet wide, 6.1, total, 10.1. Note, fires were considered stopped where incendiary damage existed directly on one side of a firebreak only. This is therefore a minimum assessment of efficiency because fires on both sides were often caused by bombs falling on both sides and not by fire spread. N. Fire departments in Japan were administered from the ministerial level through the police bureau of the Minister of Home Affairs. In Tokyo, the fire chief was appointed directly by the Minister of Home Affairs with the sanction of the Emperor. In this manner, the fire department came under the direct control of the police department with the result that many inexperienced men from the police department were given positions in the fire department. The actual operating heads of the various units of the fire department were usually well-educated men of long experience. 1. Personnel was generally well selected with emphasis on personal fitness, but wartime drain on fire department personnel made it necessary to relax these restrictions. When it became apparent that Allied forces were approaching closer to the home islands, an intensive campaign to increase the size of the department was made. The normal strength of the Tokyo Fire Department, about 2,000, was increased to 8,100, including 2,700 active junior firemen. The ultimate goal of 12,500 was never reached, and at the time of the survey, the actual strength was 6,610 men. 2. The work periods were definitely set out in regulations, but during the closing days of the war, the manpower shortage and the numerous air raid warnings allowed few firemen to spend more than an hour or two a day away from the stations. During the war, the recruit training period was reduced to 30 days, and included the same routine as the regular school, but with less time devoted to practice. All drills were under the direction of instructors especially selected for their ability. The training period compared favorably to the time devoted to that purpose in the United States, 
but the subjects covered were elementary from a fire protection standpoint. The severe shortage of firefighting equipment made it necessary to use dummy or immobilized equipment for training purposes. The normal company was seven men, and it was the usual practice to declare a company out of service if less than this number was present. This was a decided disadvantage during air attacks when it was a common occurrence for companies to lose one or more men during the course of an attack. 3. Tokyo was divided into 35 ku, wards, each of which had a main fire station and 1 to 11 branch stations, photos 15 and 16. There was a total of 42 main stations and 190 branch stations in metropolitan Tokyo. The main stations housed two pumpers each and the branch stations one. These were pieces of motor-driven equipment actually manned. There was a total of 1,117 pieces of apparatus, of which 716 were standard motor-driven pumpers. Photo 17. The remaining equipment included 11 small, 500-gallon-per-minute fireboats, one undamaged ladder truck of the four originally provided, Photo 18, and hand-drawn units with 120-gallon-per-minute motor-operated fire pumps. Photo 19. Most of the pumpers were of Japanese make with a two-stage centrifugal pump of 350 to 500 gallon per minute capacity, mounted on a commercial chassis. Photo 17. There were some pumpers of American make, but most of these were unserviceable due to lack of parts. Equipment on the pumpers included, in addition to a meager amount of minor equipment, Two hose reels with 1,330 feet of 2 and one half inch single jacket linen hose. Photo 20. All trucks of Japanese make were underpowered for the purpose for which they were used. They were not considered the equal of the equipment used in the average small American town. In normal operations, the pumper answering the alarm went to the source of water supply nearest the fire which might be a hydrant or a static tank. The hose reel was removed from the truck and the line of hose laid to the fire. The hose reel was returned to the truck and another line laid. In the meantime, the truck was connected to the source of water supply. Open nozzles were used in Japan. Small stream appliances were used, reliance being placed on hand lines with 5 eighths to 1 inch tips. A minimum of four trucks responded to alarms, with the latter truck responding only to special calls. Numerous small hand-operated pumps, manned by junior firemen or householders of the block associations who had been trained in the rudiments of firefighting, were scattered throughout the city. Photo 21. Each dwelling was also provided with a small concrete static water tank, always kept full. Photo 22, which was to be used by the individual in combating incipient fires started by incendiary bombs. O. Tokyo drew its water supply from lakes and streams in the nearby mountains and from wells. The average yearly rainfall in the Tokyo area was 64 inches, and the streams were all permanent, so the water sources were ample. 95% of the water was pumped by electrically powered equipment. The reservoir capacity was approximately 80 million gallons, and the total daily pumping capacity was 284 million gallons. The reservoir capacity servicing Zone 1 was about 8 million gallons. 1. The distribution system consisted of water mains up to 70 inches in diameter, with cross feeders of 20 to 48 inches. The grid, however, was weak, since it was made up principally of 3 and 4 inch pipes with about 60% of all pipes 4 inches or less in diameter. Diameter of pipe having hydrants, not risers, inches. Percentage. Number of fire hydrants, public and private. 3 inches. 
2,158 hydrants, 4 inches, 56.8%, 19,100 hydrants, 6 inches, 19.8%, 6,670 hydrants, 8 inches, 8.1%, 2,716 hydrants, 10 inches, 4.8%, 1,630 hydrants, 12 inches, 3.2%, 1,078 hydrants, 14 inches, 0.9%, 304 hydrants, total, 100%, 33,656 hydrants. The quantity available through such a grid system is considered inadequate for a small town. For the congested areas of Tokyo, it was hardly adequate for domestic purposes. Pressure in many districts rarely exceeded 8 pounds per square inch, and the maximum pressure noted was about 25 pounds per square inch. It was reported that pressures were so low that householders sometimes permitted house connections to remain open to secure enough water for domestic purposes. There were 33,656 fire hydrants on the distribution system, of which 60% was on mains 4 inches or smaller in size. In heavy industrial and business districts, two-way post-type hydrants were used, photos 23 and 24, but the great majority was one-way flush hydrants, photo 25. Post hydrants were not equipped with pumper connections, draft being through two and one half inch hoses or from static tanks or canals. 2. Emergency static water tanks located throughout the city for use in case of failure of the water systems varied in size from 20,000 to 40,000 gallons. Photo 26. Shallow wells and canals were available but no definite plan had been made for their use, as indicated by the lack of platforms which would be necessary to permit fire trucks to obtain a satisfactory water supply from them. The majority of house connections were of lead, and, during the 9-10 to 10 March attack, 70% of those in Zone 1 melted, resulting in a great drain on the water system. In the confusion caused by the attack, no attempt was made to isolate these areas by sectional control valves. P. A fairly well-planned air raid warning system was in effect, which was arranged and operated by the Japanese Eastern Army Headquarters in Tokyo. Radar installations on outlying island posts and at strategic mainland coastal points, Navy picket boats equipped with radar and radio, supplemented by civilian defense and military observation posts, supplied the Army headquarters with information regarding impending attacks. At the discretion of Army headquarters, telephone warnings were sent to the Metropolitan Police Board and important munitions plants. The decision as to what signals should be sounded and at what time rested with the commander of the Army Operations Room from which all municipal sirens in Tokyo could be operated. It was customary to withhold giving the air raid alert until 30 minutes before the expected attack, and the alarm, indicating the imminence of attack, was to be given 15 minutes prior to the expected arrival of enemy planes. It is considered that the Tokyo air raid warning system functioned efficiently and although considerable damage was suffered by the siren system during raids, alternate methods of control which had been provided permitted the system to furnish satisfactory service. Q. Shelters for the general public were meager or lacking entirely. Photos 12, 27, and 28. Many of those in Zone 1 were built in the sidewalks and consisted of little more than shallow trenches with bamboo or light wood roofs covered with a few inches of earth. These shelters were so close to buildings that they were worthless and were not used to any great extent. R. 
the fire susceptibility of zone one was probably greater than that of any other similar area in the world fire susceptibility is a loose indication of the probability of an area burning to a specified extent or degree all the factors discussed under the target had an influence on the measure of the fire susceptibility to give a better understanding of how some of these factors were concerned a few of them will be considered below one assuming that an incendiary has been placed on a target the entire target is more likely to burn i e its fire susceptibility is greater if any set of conditions exists which will tend to utilize the heat given off by the portion of the target which is burning to ignite portions not directly affected by the incendiary the high built-upness of zone one increased its fire vulnerability since the buildings were close together or adjoining and the heat given off by those already burning ignited some of those not directly hit by bombs two a high wind was blowing during the attack and this also temporarily increased the fire susceptibility to a very great extent because it blew the heat and flame from the buildings already burning against those not hit by bombs instead of allowing the heat to arise almost vertically as would have normally been the case three the vulnerability of the zone was also increased by lack of adequate water pressure for firefighting. Insufficient firebreaks, the high combustibility of the buildings and their contents, and the lack of initiative on the part of the fire department. End of first half of Effects of Incendiary Bomb Attacks on Tokyo, Japan by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey Second half of Effects of Incendiary Bomb Attacks on Tokyo, Japan by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Effects of Incendiary Bomb Attacks on Tokyo, Japan Second half by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. Part 5. Attack Data 1. Six major attacks on the city are considered in this report. These attacks are listed in Table 1. They do not include all attacks on the city, but only the major attacks and attacks which are interesting from both the tactical point of view and from the standpoint of damage done. 2. The attack of 25 February 1945 is the only daylight attack covered in this report. The bombing, however, was done through 10 tenths cloud cover with the aid of radar. Perhaps the most interesting feature of this attack is that it was staged prior to the abandonment of the high-level tactics in use at that time. The principal area damaged was in the east-central portion of Zone 1 photo 29 and amounted to one square mile the damage was 2.2 square miles per 1000 tons of bombs three the attack on the night of 9 to 10 march was an incendiary attack made by the 21 bomber command of the 20th af this was the most effective mission ever accomplished in terms of area totally damaged per bomb tonnage dropped photos 30 and 31 and only one other attack regardless of tonnage dropped totally damaged as great an area the attack of 25 to 26 may on tokyo in which twice the tonnage was dropped to achieve a totally damaged area only six percent greater prior to this attack the general plan had been to strike the strategic objective in daylight from aircraft flying in formation at altitudes of 25,000 to 30,000 feet. 
Mission 40 involved an almost complete reversal of these tactics. It was planned that all aircraft should make individual runs on the target at night, with the base altitudes specified at 5,000 to 7,800 feet, dropping only M-47 and M-69 incendiaries. The M-47, a 70-pound napalm-filled bomb, was carried by the Pathfinder squadron of each of the three wings flying the mission to serve the dual purpose of starting immediate appliance fires, i.e., fires of such magnitude as to require the attention of motorized firefighting appliances, and of effectively marking each aiming point. Figure 1. Maximum loads of 184 M47 bombs per aircraft were carried, with the bombs clustered 6 to a 500-pound station with T-19 cluster adapters. All other aircraft carried M-69s, six-pound incendiaries, in delay opening clusters capable of being aimed and set to function at 2,000 to 2,500 feet. Both E-28 incendiary clusters, one nose fuse, and E-46 incendiary clusters, two tail fuses, were used. Intervalometer settings were 50 feet for clusters and 100 feet for the M-47 bombs. The general plan of attack called for Pathfinder aircraft to strike the aiming points followed by aircraft carrying M-69 bombs. Crews were briefed not to drop bombs on areas where good fires had started, but to make visual correction and bomb areas within the general target zone where fires were not observed. A. The 73rd Wing bombed the target area from 6,620 to 8,950 feet through 2 tenths to 10 tenths overcast. Axis of attack were 290 degrees to 309 degrees. Flak was medium and heavy, intense and accurate. 23 aircraft were damaged and one was lost. B. The 313th Wing bombed the target from 5,850 to 8,000 feet through one-tenth and two-tenths cover. Axis of attack was 305 degrees. The first planes encountered generally accurate fire of moderate intensity, but succeeding elements received lighter and less accurate fire which diminished in strength until the last units received no fire. Nine planes suffered minor damage. C. The 314th Wing bombed the target from 4,900 to 9,200 feet through two-tenths overcast. Axis of attack were 210 degrees to 240 degrees. Flak encountered was medium and heavy, accurate to inaccurate. Ten aircraft were damaged and eight were lost. D. Numerous empty M69 cases were found throughout the area. An attempt was made to determine the percentage of duds. Only one M69 was found that had not functioned and no evidence was found of clusters having failed to open. No M47s were found. The fact that no duds of any consequence were found does not necessarily indicate perfect functioning since malfunctioned bombs will detonate in a fire. E. Weather just preceding the attack was fair, with a moderate wind from the southwest. There had been no rain or snow for several days preceding the attack. The following table of wind velocities for the night of 9 to 10 March was obtained from the Japanese Weather Bureau, located about two miles from the area affected by fire. Although this information was not secured in the fire zone, it serves to indicate the trend of wind conditions. Wind Velocities, 9 to 10 March, 1945 Time, Direction, Velocity 9. March, 
1945, 2200, southwest, 13 miles per hour, 2400, west, 9 miles per hour, 10 March 1945, 0200, north northwest, 21 miles per hour, 0300, northwest, 28 miles per hour, 0500, north northwest, 20 miles per hour, 0700, north northwest, 10 miles per hour, 0900, northwest, 14 miles per hour. As can be seen from the tabulations, the wind increased in velocity just prior to the attack and continued to increase until a maximum of 28 miles per hour was reached at 0300 hours, at which time all planes had left the target area. Plant managers and residents interviewed in the burned area estimated wind velocities just prior to the attack at about 17 to 25 miles per hour, with a maximum during the conflagration of 55 to 70 miles per hour. It was described, without exception, as being too strong for a man to stand up to. The chief of the fire department estimated the velocity at 50 miles per hour during the height of the fire. It is possible that much higher velocities were attained at the perimeter since the gas rising above the area drew in vast quantities of air. This is a common occurrence during conflagrations. 4. The four remaining attacks listed in Table 1 were carried out with approximately the same tactics as used on Mission 40, with results varying from excellent to poor as shown in the table. Part 6. Analysis of Damage 1. The M-47 bombs dropped by Pathfinder planes started fires which were spread rapidly by the high wind. Bombs from following planes started additional fires which later merged to form one vast mass of flame as viewed from the air. Planes which bombed during the latter part of the attack found visibility very poor and dropped bombs short of the target area. These bombs started fires in the congested industrial area south and east of Zone 1. About 0 0.8 square mile of the total 11.08 square miles comprising the Zone 1 area had been burned in the attack of 25 February 1945. The 9-10 to 10 March attack burned all of Zone 1 area east of and a major portion of Zone 1 area lying west of the Sumida River. Small areas in the extreme northwest tip and the narrow strip running northwest in the southwestern corner escaped damage. Photos 30 and 31, Figure 3 Few bombs hit these areas because the last planes over the target area had difficulty locating aiming points due to extensive fire and smoke. The total damage resulting from this single attack was 15.8 square miles of the heart of the city. Calculations indicate that about two-thirds of Zone 1 was burned, along with about nine square miles of the great industrial area bordering Zone 1. Figures furnished by the Metropolitan Police Bureau show 267,171 buildings burned in this one attack. The Japan Yearbook of 1944 stated that Tokyo had 1,057,921 buildings in 1938, of which 692,731 were dwellings. Based on these figures, the attack of 9 to 10 March totally damaged about 25% of all buildings in Tokyo. 2. The 28 mile per hour wind during the course of the attack which increased in velocity as the fires merged, contributed considerably to the intensity and further spread of the conflagration. The direction of the wind, 
north-northwest and northwest caused the fire to spread to the highly congested tenement and industrial district east and south of zone one resulting in considerable damage to industrial plants fire to the south and southeast burned itself out against open areas the diversion canal or fire breaks the fire west of the sumida river burned itself out either against areas burned in the 25 february 1945 attack or against the river isolated fires to the southwest and northwest caused by spillovers were relatively small and were controlled by fire department operation and open areas three the highly combustible nature of the city resulted in an intense fire of short duration observers stated that the heat was so intense that entire block fronts burst into flames before the main body of the fire reached them the heat intensity was indicated by the absence of smudges on concrete buildings combustible contents of buildings burned completely leaving no evidence of what the contents may have been, and without marking the walls with smoke. The fire chief stated that the fire had burned itself out by morning except for fires in industrial buildings. An aerial photograph taken at about noon the following day, photo 31, showed few fires still burning. No data were available on the temperatures reached, but considerable melted glass and, in one case, melted concrete were noted. Photos 32, 33, and 34. The people of Tokyo had been instructed by police and block associations in the handling of bombs and the extinguishing of incipient fires. The military authorities, however, had advised that all attacks would be made at high altitude and that the attackers would be sufficiently dispersed to offset the possibility of any great area fires. This attack was made at a low altitude by a much larger number of planes than had been expected, taking both the military and the general public by complete surprise. At the beginning of the attack, the people attempted to extinguish the fires started by the first planes, but, as the attack continued, they realized that such action was hopeless and confined their efforts to saving personal belongings and to escaping. Plant employees attempted to combat fires started in industrial buildings, and, by virtue of better training and equipment, they were able to confine the fires in some cases. When bomb concentrations were heavy and combustible contents were present, however, their best efforts were futile. The inhabitants in general fled to parks, canals, and rivers, or left the area entirely if possible. Fire lanes were used as corridors and, as such, were the means of saving many lives. 4. The Tokyo Fire Department organization was not prepared to combat fires of any magnitude for too much dependence was placed on the individual stations to respond to a fire without notification from the central headquarters. This was satisfactory for ordinary fires, since by this method it was possible to extinguish quickly incipient fires in highly combustible areas. The general plan for air raid protection included the use of apparatus outside the area under attack to attempt to confine the fire and prevent it from spreading. This was more or less standard fire department practice in any conflagration, but its proper execution depended on many factors, such as ample equipment and men, adequate water supply, and favorable weather conditions. The conditions during the attack could hardly have been more favorable for a conflagration or more unfavorable from a fire protection standpoint. Tokyo Fire Department equipment and personnel were inadequate, as was the water supply. These shortcomings, coupled with a high wind and highly congested combustible buildings, resulted in the many small fires growing into a conflagration in a matter of minutes. The chief of the fire department 
stated that the situation was completely out of control 30 minutes after the first bomb dropped and efforts to combat the fire were futile. Attempts were made to hold isolated fires in check. A total of 186 fire trucks was destroyed in all attacks on Tokyo, 95 of which were lost in this attack. This figure does not include small hand trucks of the type used by civilian defense organizations. Most of the damaged fire trucks were dispatched from outside the fire zone to combat the fire and were subsequently trapped and burned. Five of the 15 large fire stations were completely gutted. One station was noted where firemen were killed and equipment burned in the station. This equipment was still in its original position even though the attack occurred eight months prior to the investigation. 5. The highly combustible residential structures burned quickly. An inspection revealed that not a single dwelling remained in the burned area. All combustible material was completely consumed. No charred remains of combustible structural members of residences were found. The area was simply a mass of shattered tile, concrete static water tanks, and twisted steel. Photos 35 and 36. 6. Industrial plants of fire-resistive construction were few in the fire-damaged area. Three plants were inspected in which some of the structures were of this type. In only one was there any evidence of bombs entering the building and starting fires. The manager of this plant claimed that the bombs falling at an angle entered through the windows, which is unusual for a bomb of the M69 type. No building was sufficiently near, however, to cause damage from exposure fires, and it is therefore assumed that this statement was correct. The entire structure a reinforced concrete warehouse, 25 feet in height, was structurally damaged. Photos 37, 38, 39. The other two plants suffered damage from exposure fires. One, a cable plant, was completely gutted, while the other, a fuse plant, suffered slight damage to the building and total damage to the contents. Non-combustible structures predominated in the industrial plants studied, which were, for the most part, machine shops, steelworks, foundries, and textile mills. Bombs readily penetrated the corrugated asbestos cement or corrugated iron roofs. When sufficient combustible contents were present, the structure was almost always totally damaged and all that remained was a mass of sagging steel members and shattered roof covering. This condition of total damage also existed in many instances where buildings were adjacent to nearby dwellings, as were the numerous small shops scattered throughout the area. Photos 40, 41, and 42. 8. No overall figures for production loss were available since not all plants in the area were visited. However, an estimate of the loss of production to the damaged area resulting from the 9 to 10 March attack was made by the local managers of 10 of the larger plants. Building and equipment damage in these 10 plants ranged from 5 to 100 percent and loss in production was estimated at 50 percent. It is believed that 50% is somewhat low since home industries which accounted for much of the production capacity of the area and which were totally damaged were not included. The population of Tokyo dropped from 5,063,495 as of 1 January 1945 to 2,310,734 on 1 August 1945. It appears from these figures that the attack of 9 to 10 March 1945 resulted in a large exodus of persons from the Tokyo area, thereby causing an acute manpower shortage for industrial operation. This is borne out by statements of plant managers 
that production in plants was seriously curtailed or stopped completely. The manager of the Fukagawa Works Mitsubishi Steel Company stated that his plant did not operate after 9 March, although the property was not damaged in the attack. 9. Any figures on loss of life in a conflagration of this magnitude are necessarily estimations. Japanese figures obtained from the Metropolitan Police Bureau are believed to be the most accurate available. All attacks on Tokyo caused 93,056 deaths and 72,840 injuries. The attack of 10 March resulted in 83,793 deaths, or 90% of the deaths caused by all air attacks on Tokyo, and 40,918 injuries. The number of homeless from all attacks was 2,891,000, of whom 1,008,000 were made homeless by this one attack. A total of 201 firemen were killed in all air attacks on Tokyo. Of that total, 85 were killed and 40 missing in the 9-10 to 10 March attack. Total casualties to auxiliary firemen in the attack were in excess of 500. No figure was available for total casualties to this group in all attacks. The great loss of life is attributed to the rapid spread of fire, its great intensity, and the large area covered. Persons attempting to flee from the attacked area were burned in the streets by the intense heat. Photos 43, 44, 45, and 46. Although some were able to escape through the fire lanes. Many fled to the canals and were literally scalded to death or died from the effects of hot gases. Photo 46 10. The following plants damaged in the attack of 9 to 10 March were investigated. A. Target 3. Hitachi Engineering Works Limited, Kameido Plant. This plant manufactured naval accessories such as air coolers, compressors, and ventilating systems. There was no damage to any of the main buildings, but 240 M69 bombs fell in the vacant yard south of the plant buildings and totally damaged several small auxiliary buildings of wood frame construction. None of these bombs was a dud. The plant was not damaged by exposure fire, either radiation or flying brands. The area surrounding the property offered almost complete protection from exposure fires by means of a 150-foot man-made firebreak, a canal, and a railroad embankment. The property surrounding this area was a mixture of poorer-class factories and workers' homes all of which were totally damaged. The bombs which dropped in this area came from the last of the bombers at about 0115 hours. The first warning the plant had was the beginning of the attack on the city, but this gave them considerable time to prepare their defenses. The employees had been well trained in firefighting, and it was evident that they had functioned better than most although they were aided by having more time to make preparations and by the firebreaks and the bomb pattern. B. Target 6. Mitsubishi Steelworks, Fukagawa Plant The products of this plant were steel bars and cylinders used by other concerns in the vicinity for manufacturing various items for the shipbuilding industry. This plant was not damaged, except for an isolated frame warehouse which was completely burned as a result of fire caused by one bomb. About 400 bombs were scattered over an adjoining open area and over a small neighboring spinning mill which was about 60% damaged. The steel plant ceased production after the attack because of a shortage of help brought on by the displacement of laborers. C. 
Target 5, Fujikura Electric Cable Works. This company employed about 4,000 persons prior to the attack, but had not operated since. It manufactured electric cable and wire of all types and sizes. A small number of M69s fell among some small shops and warehouses across a narrow canal from the buildings of the main plant. The plant manager said that most of these bombs were extinguished. Only one of the buildings in this area was totally damaged. The canal was so narrow, however, that a strong wind blew flames from this building across the canal, and the main plant buildings were ignited by exposure. These main buildings were of reinforced concrete with either wood truss roofs covered with corrugated asbestos cement or steel truss roofs covered with corrugated sheet iron. All the roofs were stripped, but the steel trusses were still intact with little deformation and could have been recovered. In almost every instance, walls and roofs of corrugated asbestos cement shattered and collapsed from the heat. It was estimated that 80% of this plant was totally damaged. All the machines were heavily damaged, except for a few in the winding building. D. Target 4. Shibaura Electrical Works. Shows on G2 reports as Japan Sugar Company. This plant produced tungsten for lamp and vacuum tube filaments and molybdenum and tantalum concentrates. It also made synthetic rubber for gaskets, packing, and hose. The main portion of the plant was not damaged, but a warehouse and a laboratory collapsed as a result of fire. Both of these buildings had reinforced concrete walls and reinforced concrete roofs on unprotected steel trusses. The sagging of the trusses released the roofs and collapsed the walls. Photos 37, 38, and 39. The source of heat in these buildings was not completely explained. The manager said that the two structures were used largely for the storage of ore, but it is known that they also contained pitch and calcium carbide. The manager stated that the bombs entered through the windows. The roof was a six-inch concrete slab and had no skylight, so M69s should not have been able to perforate it and there were no other structures near enough to cause an exposure fire. Plant damage was estimated at 20%. E. Target 2. Hattori Company. Seikosha Watch Manufacturing Company. This company manufactured time fuses for artillery shells including 20, 25, 40, 57, and 77 millimeter shells. About 4,000 people were employed. Ten M69 bombs struck the plant and were all extinguished by plant personnel. The main plant building, however, was ignited by an exposure fire across a 75-foot open space, a street and cleared area. The heat here was great enough to melt wire glass windows and to enter the plant proper. All the plant buildings were fire-resistive throughout the construction being reinforced concrete with wire glass windows. After the fire entered, it burned through the buildings and heavily damaged most of the machinery. The buildings were only superficially damaged. The management estimated the damage at 35%. Operation continued on a reduced scale until 14 August 1945. F. Target 1. Owana Manufacturing Company, Nippon Electric Works. This plant produced small motor generator sets of 1, 3, 6, 8, and 25 kilowatts for the Navy. It employed 2,200 persons. Between 200 and 300 M69 bombs fell on the plant area and ignited the wooden buildings. This put the plant firefighting equipment, which was housed in one of them, out of commission, and also started fires in the adjacent fire-resistive structures through exposure. About 40% damage was suffered by buildings and contents. 
the fire-resistive buildings were only superficially damaged, but the machinery was heavily damaged. Production was reduced to an output of about 20% of normal. Part 7. Conclusions 1. The high efficiency of the attack of 9 to 10 March was due to a. The great combustibility of the buildings in the target area. b. The high built upness of the target area, i.e., more than 40%. c. The ideal weather conditions, i.e., a high wind, clear, dry. d. The large size of the target area and of the city surrounding it making it almost impossible to drop bombs where they would do no damage. e. The wise choice and efficient performance of the tactics involved. Four aiming points, briefing to drop bombs individually in areas of target where fires were not already burning. Low level for greater accuracy, and an all incendiary bomb load. f the ineffectiveness of the firefighting forces and equipment. 2. Fire-resistive buildings in burning areas were often ignited by exposure fires, sometimes over an open area as great as 75 feet. 3. Fire-resistive buildings, when subjected to contents fires, generally suffered only internal damage. 4. Many home industries were destroyed in attacks on residential areas. 5. Loss in production at undamaged factories was heavy because of the displacement of workers. Table 1. Summary of Attacks Mission Number 38 Date 25 February Planes Over Target 172. Approximate true heading. Southeast. Approximate surface wind from northwest. Number of aiming points. 1. Altitude. 23,500 feet. 31,000 feet. Intervalometer. 25 feet. Total tons M69 bombs used. 412. Total tons HE bombs used, 42. Total tons dropped, 454. Clusters to open at 5,000 feet. Time over targets, 114 minutes. Damage, 1.0 square mile. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 2.20 square miles. Remarks, day attack. Complete overcast. All radar bombing. No fighter opposition. Flak meager. 91% M69s. Mission number 40. Date 9 to 10 March. Planes over target. 279. Approximate true heading. Northwest. Approximate surface wind from southwest. Number of aiming points, 4. Altitude, 4,900 feet, 9,200 feet. Intervalometer, 100 feet pathfinder, 50 feet main force. Total tons M69 bombs used, 1,539. Total tons M47 bombs used, 128. Total tons dropped, 1,667. Clusters to open at 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet. Time over targets, 173 minutes. Damage, 15.8 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 9.48 square miles. Remarks, Night Attack Three tenths overcast, half visual, half radar bombing, smoke and thermals, fighter opposition weak, flak intense, 
92% M69s. Mission number 67. Date 13 to 14 April. Planes over target 327. Approximate true heading northwest. Approximate surface wind from northwest. Number of aiming points 3. Altitude 6,800 feet, 11,000 feet. Intervalometer, 100 feet pathfinder, 50 feet main force. Total tons M69 bombs used, 1,820. Total tons M47 bombs used, 222. Total tons HE bombs used, 82. Total tons dropped, 2,124. Clusters to open at 2,500 feet. Time over targets, 219 minutes. Damage, 11.4 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 5.37 square miles. Remarks, night attack, 5 tenths overcast. Two-thirds radar bombing, excessive smoke and turbulence, fighter opposition moderate, flak intense, 86% M69s, 164 M69s and 77 M47s dropped safe. Mission number 69. Date 15 to 16 April. Planes over target 109. Approximate true heading, northeast. Approximate surface wind from northwest. Number of aiming points, 1. Altitude, 8,000 feet, 10,100 feet. Intervalometer, 100 feet pathfinder, 50 feet main force. Total tons M69 bombs used, 434. Total tons M47 bombs used, 320. Total tons HE bombs used, 15. Total tons dropped, 769. Clusters to open at 2,500 feet. Time over targets, 142 minutes. Damage, 6.0 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 7.80 square miles. Remarks Night attack, clear, all radar bombing. Thermals bad on breakaway, but visibility good. Some planes arrived too early. Flak and fighter opposition intense. Searchlights blinding, 56% M69s. Mission number 181. Date, 23 to 24 May. Planes over target, 520. Approximate true heading, east. Approximate surface wind from northwest. Number of aiming points, 6. Altitude, 7,800 feet, 15,100 feet. Intervalometer, 100 feet. Pathfinder, 50 feet main force. Total tons M69 bombs used, 2,820. Total tons M47 bombs used, 777. Total tons M50 bombs used, 49. Total tons dropped, 3,646. Clusters to open at 5,000 feet. Time over targets, 119 minutes. Damage, 5.3 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 1.45 square miles. Remarks, night attack, 9 tenths overcast, almost all radar bombing. Initial point not identified in many cases. Smoke especially bad. Blinding searchlights, flak and fighter opposition intense, 
77% M69s. Mission number 183. Date 25 to 26 May. Planes over target 464. Approximate true heading northeast. Approximate surface wind from northwest. Number of aiming points 6. Altitude 7,900 feet, 22,000 feet. Intervalometer, 100 feet pathfinder, 50 feet main force. Total tons M69 bombs used, 1,320. Total tons M47 bombs used, 634. Total tons M50 bombs used, 945. Total tons M76 bombs used, 348. Total tons HE bombs used, 4. Total tons dropped, 3,251. Clusters to open at 5,000 feet. Time over targets, 155 minutes. Damage, 16.8 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs. 5.17 square miles. Remarks. Night attack. Three tenths overcast. Three fourths radar bombing. Smoke fairly bad. Flak and fighter opposition very intense. 41% M69s. Planes over target. 1,871. Total tons M69 bombs used. 8,345. Total tons M47 bombs used. 2,081. Total tons M50 bombs used. 994. Total tons M76 bombs used. 348. Total tons HE bombs used. 143. Total tons dropped. 11,911. Time over targets, 922 minutes. Damage, 56.3 square miles. Damage per 1,000 tons bombs, 4.73 square miles. Remarks, 57% total load M69s. End of second half of Effects of Incendiary Bomb Attacks on Tokyo, Japan by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. First Approach to Mount Rainier, 1833, by William Fraser Tolmy, introduced by Edmund S. Meany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dr. William Fraser Tolmy was a medical officer in the service of the Hudson's Bay Company. He was born at Inverness, Scotland, on February 3, 1812, and died at Victoria, British Columbia, on December 8, 1888. He was educated at Glasgow, and, when twenty years of age, he joined the Hudson's Bay Company. In 1833, he was located at Nisqually House, Puget Sound. It was then that he made his trip to the mountain. He later served at other posts in the Pacific Northwest, and was raised to the rank of Chief Factor in 1856. He was then placed on the board of management of the great company. In 1860, he retired from the service. In 1850, he was married to Jane, eldest daughter of Chief Factor John Work. Their descendants still live at Victoria, British Columbia. They, especially the son, John W. Tolmy, have compared this reproduction from Dr. Tolmy's diary with the original manuscript to ensure accuracy. So far as is now known, this is the first record of a white man's close approach to Mount Rainier. It is pleasant to note 
that the new map of Mount Rainier National Park, published by the United States Geological Survey, shows the peak he climbed and the creek flowing near it, bearing the name of Tolmy. Introduction by Edmund S. Meany, 1916. First Approach to the Mountain. August 27, 1833. Obtained Mr. Heron's consent to make a botanizing excursion to Mount Rainier, for which he has allowed ten days. Have engaged two horses from a chief living in that quarter, who came here tonight, and Lachale is to be my guide. Told the Indians I am going to Mount Rainier to gather herbs of which to make medicine, part of which is to be sent to Britain, and part retained in case intermittent fever should visit us, when I will prescribe for the Indians. August 28th. A tremendous thunderstorm occurred last night, succeeded by torrents of rain. The thunder was very loud, and the lightning flashing completely enlightened my apartment. Have been chatting with Mr. Heron about colonizing Whidbey's Island, a project of which he is at present quite full, more anon. No horses have appeared. Understand that the mountain is four days' journey distant, the first of which can only be performed on horseback. If they do not appear tomorrow, I shall start with Lachale on foot. August 29th. Prairie, eight miles north of home, sunset. Busy making arrangements for journey, and while thus occupied, the guide arrived with three horses. Started about three mounted on a strong iron gray, my companions disposing of themselves on the other two horses, except one who walked. We were six in number. I have engaged Lachale for a blanket, and his nephew Lashima for ammunition, to accompany me and Nukalkut, a Puyallup, whom I took for a native of Mount Rainier, with two horses to be guide on the mountain after leaving the horse track and Quilniash, his relative, a very active, strong fellow, has volunteered to accompany me. The Indians are all in great hopes of killing elk and chevril, and Lachale has already been selling and promising the grease he is to get. It is in great measure the expectation of finding game that urges them to undertake the journey. Cantered slowly along the prairie, and are now at the residence of Nukalkut's father, under the shade of a lofty pine, in a grassy amphitheater, beautifully interspersed and surrounded with oaks, and through the gaps in the circle we see the broad plain extending southward to Nisqually. In a hollow immediately behind is a small lake, whose surface is almost one sheet of water lilies about to flower. Have supped on Salial, and at dusk shall turn in. August 30th, Sandy Beach of Puyallup River. Slept ill last night, and as I dozed in the morning, was aroused by a stroke across the thigh from a large decayed branch, which fell from the pine overshadowing us. A drizzling rain fell during most of the night. Got up about dawn, and finding thigh stiff and painful, thought a stop put to the journey, but after moving about it felt easier. Started about sunrise, I mounted on a spirited brown mare, the rest on passable animals, except Nukalkut, who bestrode a foal. Made a northeasterly course through prairie, breakfasted at a small marsh on bread, salile, dried cockles, and a small piece of chevriel saved from the last night's repast of my companions, for I cannot call them attendants. The points of wood now become broader, and the intervening plain degenerated into prairians. Stopped about 1 p.m. at the abode of three Tecatat families, who met us rank and file at the door to shake hands. Their sheds were made of bark, resting on a horizontal pole, supported at each end by tripods, and showed an abundance of elk's flesh dried within. Two kettles were filled with this, and after smoking, my Indians made a savage repast on the meat and bullion, 
Lachele saying it was the Indian custom to eat a great deal at once, and afterwards abstain for a time. He, however, has twice eaten since. Traded some dried meat for four balls and three rings, and mounting rode off in the midst of a heavy shower ascended and descended at different times several steep banks and passed through dense and tangled thickets occasionally coming on a prairion the soil throughout was of the same nature as that of nisqually after descending a very steep bank came to the puyallup lashima carried the baggage across on his head rode to the opposite side through a rich alluvial plain three or four miles in length and three-fourths to one in breadth it is covered with fern about eight feet high in some parts passed through woods and crossed river several times about seven p m dismounted and the horses and accoutrements were left in a wood at the river's brink started now on foot for a house knucklecut new and after traversing woods and twice crossing the torrents on the unsteady footing of a log arrived at the house which was a deserted one and encamped on the dry part of a river's bed along which our course lies to-morrow the puyallup flows rapidly and is about ten or twelve yards broad its banks are high and covered with lofty cedars and pines the water is of a dirty white color being impregnated by white clay Lachele has to-night been trying to persuade me from going to the snow on the mountain. August 31st. Slept well, and in the morning two salmon were caught, on which we are to breakfast before starting. After breakfast, Quililiash stuck the gills and sound of the fish on a spit, which stood before the fire, so that the next comer might know that salmon could be obtained there. Having travelled nearly the whole day through a wood of cedar and pine, surface very uneven, and after ascending the bed of river a couple of miles, are now encamped about ten yards from its margin in the wood, find myself very inferior to my companions in the power of enduring fatigue. Their pace is a smart trot which soon obliges me to rest. The waters of the Puyallup are still of the same color, can see a short distance up two lofty hills covered with wood, evening cloudy and rainy, showery all day. Sunday, September 1st, Bank of Puyallup River. It has rained all night and is now 6 a.m. pouring down. Are a good deal sheltered by the trees. My companions are all snoozing shall presently arouse them and hold a council of war the prospect is very discouraging our provisions will be expended to-day and lachele said he thought the river would be too high to be fordable in either direction had dried meat boiled in a cedar bark kettle for breakfast i got rigged out in green blanket without trousers in indian style and trudged on through the wood afterward exchanged blanket with lachele for ovary's capu which has been on almost every indian at nisqually however i found it more convenient than the blanket our course lay up the river which we crossed frequently the bed is clayey in most parts saw the saw-bill duck once or twice riding down on a log and fired twice unsuccessfully have been flanked on both sides with high pine-clad hills for some time. A short distance above encampment, snow can be seen. It, having rained almost incessantly, have encamped under shelving bank, which has been undermined by the river. Immense stones, only held in situ by dried roots, form the roof, and the floor is very rugged. Have supped on berries, which, when heated with stones in kettle, taste like lozenges. Propose to-morrow to ascend one of the snowy peaks above. September 2nd. Summit of a snowy peak immediately under Rainier. Passed a very uncomfortable night, 
in our troglodytic mansion ascended the river for three miles to where it was shut in by amphitheater of mountains and could be seen bounding over a lofty precipice above ascended that which showed most snow our track lay at first through a dense wood of pine but we afterwards emerged into an exuberantly verdant gully closed on each side by lofty precipices followed fully to near the summit and found excellent berries in abundance it contained very few alpine plants afterwards came to a grassy mound where the sight of several decayed trees induced us to encamp after tea i set out with lachele and knucklecut for the summit which was ankle deep in snow for one fourth mile downwards the summit terminated in abrupt precipice directed northwards and bearing northeast from mount rainier the adjoining peak the mists were at times very dense but a puff of southwest wind occasionally dispelled them on the south side of puyallup is a range of snow-dappled mountains and they as well as that on the north side terminate in mount rainier a short distance to east collected a vasculum of plants at the snow and having examined and packed them shall turn in thermometer at base fifty four degrees at summit of ascent forty seven degrees september third woody islet on puyallup it rained heavily during night but about dawn the wind shifted to the northeast dispersed the clouds and frost set in lay shivering all night and roused my swarthy companions twice to rekindle the fire at sunrise accompanied by quillaliash went to the summit and found the temperature of the air thirty three degrees the snow was spangled and sparkled brightly in the bright sunshine it was crisp and only yielded a couple of inches to the pressure of foot in walking mount rainier appeared surpassingly splendid and magnificent it bore from the peak on which i stood south southeast and was separated from it only by a narrow glen whose sides however were formed by inaccessible precipices got all my bearings more correctly to-day the atmosphere being clear and every object distinctly perceived the river flows at first in a northerly direction from the mountain the snow on the summit of the mountain adjoining rainier on western side of puyallup is continuous with that of latter and thus the southwestern aspect of rainier seemed the most accessible by ascending the first mountain through a gully in its northern side you reach the eternal snow of rainier and for a long distance afterwards the ascent is very gradual but then it becomes abrupt from the sugar-loaf form assumed by the mountain its eastern side is steep on its northern aspect a few glaciers were seen on the conical portion below that the mountain is composed of bare rock apparently volcanic which about fifty yards in breadth reaches from the snow to the valley beneath and is bounded on each side by bold bluff crags scantily covered with stunted pines its surface is generally smooth but here and there raised into small points or knobs or arrowed with short and narrow longitudinal lines in which snow lay from the snow on western border the puyallup arose and in its course down this rock slope was fenced into the eastward by a regular elevation of the rock in the form of a wall or dike which at the distance i viewed it at seemed about four feet high and four hundred yards in length two large pyramids of rock arose from the gentle acclivity at southwest extremity of mountain and around each the drifting snow had accumulated in large quantity forming a basin apparently of great depth here i also perceived peeking from their snowy covering two lines of dike similar to that already mentioned september fourth am tonight encamped on a small eminence near the commencement of prairie 
had a tedious walk through the wood bordering puyallup but accomplished it in much shorter time than formerly evening fine september fifth nisqually reached tekatat camp in the forenoon and regaled on boiled elk and shallion pushed on ahead with lachele and quililiash and arrived here in the evening where all is well end of first approach to mount rainier eighteen thirty three by william fraser told me read by sue anderson george washington first inaugural address by george washington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org george washington first inaugural address in the city of new york thursday april 30th 1789 Fellow citizens of the Senate and the House of Representatives, Among the vicissitudes incident to life, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that of which the notification was transmitted by your order and received on the fourteenth day of the present month. On the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love, from a retreat which I had chosen with the fondest predilection and in my flattering hopes, with an immutable decision as the asylum of my declining years a retreat which was rendered every day more necessary as well as more dear to me by the addition of habit to inclination and of frequent interruptions in my health to the gradual waste committed on it by time on the other hand the magnitude and difficulty of the trust to which the voice of my country called me being sufficient to awaken in the wisest and most experienced in her citizens a distrustful scrutiny into his qualifications could not but overwhelm with despondence one who, inheriting inferior endowments from nature and unpracticed in the duties of civil administration, ought to be peculiarly conscious of his own deficiencies. In this conflict of emotions, all I dare aver is that it has been my faithful study to collect my duty from a just appreciation of every circumstance by which it might be effected. All I dare hope is that if, in executing this task, I have been too much swayed by a grateful remembrance of former instances, or by an affectionate sensibility to this transcendent proof of the confidence of my fellow citizens, and have thence too little consulted my incapacity, as well as my disinclination for the weighty and untried cares before me, my error will be palliated by the motives which misled me, and its consequences be judged by my country with some share of the partiality in which they originated. Such being the impressions under which I have, in obedience to the public summons, repaired to the present station, it will be peculiarly improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes and may enable every instrument employed in its administration to execute with success the functions allotted to his charge in tendering this homage to the great author of every public and private good i assure myself that it expresses your sentiments no less than my own nor those of my fellow citizens at large less than either no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the united states every step by which they have advanced the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency and in the important revolution just accomplished in the system of their united government the tranquil deliberations and voluntary consent of so many distinct communities from which the event resulted cannot be compared with the means by which most governments have been established without some return of pious gratitude along with an humble anticipation of the future blessings which the past seem to presage these reflections arising out of the present crisis have forced themselves too strongly on my mind to be suppressed you will join with me i trust in thinking that there are none under the influence of which the proceedings of a new and free government can more auspiciously commence 
By the article establishing the executive department, it is made the duty of the president to recommend to your consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. The circumstances under which I now meet you will acquit me from entering into that subject further than to refer to the great constitutional charter under which you are assembled, and which in defining your powers designates the objects to which your attention is to be given. It will be more consistent with those circumstances and far more congenial with the feelings which actuate me to substitute in place of a recommendation of particular measures the tribute that is due to the talent, the rectitude, and the patriotism which adorn the characters selected to devise and adopt them. In these honorable qualifications, I behold the surest pledges that on one side, no local prejudices or attachments, no separate views nor party animosities will misdirect the comprehensive and equal eye which ought to watch over this great assemblage of communities and interests. So on another, that the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality and the preeminence of free government be exemplified by all the attributes which can win the affections of its citizens and command the respect of the world. I dwell on this prospect with every satisfaction which an ardent love for my country can inspire, since there is no truth more thoroughly established than that there exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage, between the genuine maxims of an honest and magnanimous policy and the solid rewards of public prosperity and felicity. Since we ought to be no less persuaded that the proprietous smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained, and since the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered, perhaps as deeply as finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. Besides the ordinary objects submitted to your care, it will remain with your judgment to decide how far an exercise of the occasional power delegated by the fifth article of the Constitution is rendered expedient at the present juncture by the nature of objections which have been urged against the system or by the degree of inequitude which has given birth to them. Instead of undertaking particular recommendations on this subject, in which I would be guided by no lights derived from official opportunities, I shall again give way to my entire confidence in your discernment and pursuit of the public good. For I assure myself that whilst you carefully avoid every alteration which might endanger the benefits of a united and effective government, or which ought to wait the future lessons of experience, a reverence for the characteristic rights of freemen and a regard for the public harmony will sufficiently influence your deliberations on the question how far the former can be impregnably fortified or the latter be safely and advantageously promoted. To the foregoing observations I have one to add, which will be most properly addressed to the House of Representatives. It concerns myself and will therefore be as brief as possible. When I was first honored with a call into the service of my country, then on the eve of an arduous struggle for its liberties, the light in which I contemplated my duty required that I should renounce every pecuniary compensation. From this resolution I have in no instance departed, and being still under the impressions which produced it, I must decline as inapplicable to myself any share in the personal emoluments which may be indispensably included in a permanent provision for the executive department and must pray accordingly that the pecuniary estimates for the station in which I am placed may during my continuance in it be limited to such actual expenditures as the public good may be thought to require. Having thus imparted to you my sentiments as they have been awakened by the occasion which brings us together, I shall take my present leave, but not without resorting once more to the benign parent of the human race in humble supplication that, since he has been pleased to favor the American people with opportunities for deliberating in perfect tranquility and dispositions for deciding with unparalleled unanimity on a form of government for the security of their union and the advancement of their happiness, so his divine blessings may be equally conspicuous in the enlarged views, the temperate consultations, and the wise measures on which the success of this government must depend. End of George Washington First Inaugural Address by George Washington Read by Tip Brown
an instrument for observing the moon's distance from the fixed stars at sea by isaac newton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org an instrument for observing the moon's distance from the fixed stars at sea by isaac newton a true copy of a paper found in the handwriting of sir isaac newton among the papers of the late dr halley containing a description of an instrument for observing the moon's distance from the fixed stars at sea in the annexed scheme p q r s denotes a plate of brass accurately divided in the limb d q into half degrees half minutes and one twelfth minutes by a diagonal scale and the half degrees and half minutes and twelfth minutes counted for degrees minutes and sixth minutes a b is a telescope three or four feet long fixed on the edge of that brass plate g is a speculum fixed on the said brass plate perpendicularly as near as may be to the object glass of the telescope so as to be inclined forty five degrees to the axis of the telescope and intercept half the light which would otherwise come through the telescope to the eye c d is a movable index turning about the centre c and with its fiducial edge showing the degrees minutes and sixth minutes on the limb of the brass plate p q the centre c must be over against the middle of the speculum g h is another speculum parallel to the former when the fiducial edge of the index falls on zero degrees zero minutes zero seconds so that the same star may then appear through the telescope in one and the same place both by the direct rays and by the reflexed ones but if the index be turned the star shall appear in two places whose distance is showed on the brass limb by the index by this instrument the distance of the moon from any fixed star is thus observed view the star through the perspective by the direct light and the moon by the reflexed or on the contrary and turn the index till the star touch the limb of the moon and the index shall show upon the brass limb of the instrument the distance of the star from the limb of the moon and though the instrument shake by the motion of your ship at sea yet the moon and star will move together as if they did really touch one another in the heavens so that an observation may be made as exactly at sea as at land and by the same instrument may be observed exactly the altitudes of the moon and stars by bringing them to the horizon and thereby the latitude and times of observations may be determined more exactly than by the ways now in use in the time of the observation if the instrument move angularly about the axis of the telescope the star will move in a tangent of the moon's limb or of the horizon but the observation may notwithstanding be made exactly by noting when the line described by the star is a tangent to the moon's limb or to the horizon to make the instrument useful the telescope ought to take in a large angle and to make the observation true let the star touch the moon's limb not on the outside of the limb but on the inside End of An Instrument for Observing the Moon's Distance from the Fixed Stars at Sea by Isaac Newton Read by Abai in March 2014「The Liberty of Children」by Robert G. Ingersoll This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. If women have been slaves, what shall I say of children? Of the little children in alleys and subcellars, the little children who turn pale when they hear the father's footsteps, little children who run away when they only hear the names called by the lips of a mother, little children, the children of poverty, 
the children of crime, the children of brutality, wherever they are, flotsam and jetsam upon the wild mad sea of life. My heart goes out to them, one and all. I tell you, children have the same rights that we have, and we ought to treat them as though they were human beings. They should be reared with love, with kindness, with tenderness, and not with brutality. That is my idea of children. When your little child tells a lie, do not rush at him as though the world were about to go into bankruptcy. Be honest with him. A tyrant father will have liars for his children. Do you know that? A lie is born of tyranny upon the one hand and weakness upon the other. And when you rush at a poor little boy with a club in your hand, of course he lies. I thank thee, Mother Nature, that thou hast put ingenuity enough in the brain of a child when attacked by a brutal parent to throw up a little breastwork in the shape of a lie. When one of your children tells a lie, be honest with him. Tell him that you have told hundreds of them yourself. Tell him it is not the best way, that you have tried it. Tell him as the man did in Maine when his boy left home. John, honesty is the best policy. I have tried both. Be honest with him. Suppose a man as much larger than you, as you are larger than a child five years old, should come at you with a liberty pole in his hand, and in a voice of thunder shout, Who broke that blade? There is not a solitary one of you who would not swear you never saw it, or that it was cracked when you got it. Why not be honest with these children? Just imagine a man who deals in stocks, whipping his boy for putting false rumors afloat. Think of a lawyer beating his own flesh and blood for evading the truth when he makes half of his own living that way. Think of a minister punishing his child for not telling all he thinks. Just think of it. When your child commits a wrong, take it in your arms. Let it feel your heart beat against its heart. Let a child know that you really and truly and sincerely love it. Yet some Christians, good Christians, when a child commits a fault, drive it from the door and say, Never do you darken this house again. Think of that. And then these same people will get down on their knees and ask God to take care of the child they have driven from home. I will never ask God to take care of my children unless I am doing my level best in that same direction. But I will tell you what I say to my children. Go where you will. Commit what crime you may. Fall to what depth of degradation you may. You can never commit any crime that will shut my door, my arms, or my heart to you. As long as I live, you shall have one sincere friend. Do you know that I have seen some people who acted as though they thought that when the Saviour said, Suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He had a raw height under his mandé, and made that remark simply to get the children within striking distance? I do not believe in the government of the lash. If any one of you ever expects to whip your children again, I want you to have a photograph taken of yourself when you are in the act, with your face red with vulgar anger, and the face of the little child with eyes swimming in tears, and the little chin dimpled with fear, like a piece of water struck by a sudden cold wind. Have the picture taken. If that little child should die, I cannot think of a sweeter way to spend an autumn afternoon than to go out to the cemetery, when the maples are clad in tender gold, and little scarlet runners are coming, like poems of regret, from the sad heart of the earth, and sit down upon the grave, and look at that photograph, and think 
of the flesh now dust that you beat i tell you it is wrong it is no way to raise children make your home happy be honest with them divide fairly with them in everything give them a little liberty and love and you cannot drive them out of your house they will want to stay there make home pleasant let them play any game they wish do not be so foolish as to say you may roll balls on the ground but you must not roll them on a green cloth you may knock them with a mullet but you must not push them with a cue you may play with little pieces of paper which have authors written on them but you must not have cards think of it you may go to a minstrel show where people blacken themselves and imitate humanity below them but you must not go to the theatre and see the characters created by immortal genius put upon the stage why well i can't think of any reason in the world except minstrel is a word of two syllables and theatre has three let children have some daylight at home if you want to keep them there and do not commence at the cradle and shout don't don't stop that is nearly all that is said to a child from the cradle until he is twenty-one years old and when he comes of age other people begin saying don't and the church says don't and the party he belongs to says don't i despise that way of going through this world let us have liberty just a little call me infidel call me atheist call me what you will i intend so to treat my children that they can come to my grave and truthfully say he who sleeps here never gave us a moment of pain from his lips now dust never came to us an unkind word people justify all kinds of tyranny toward children upon the ground that they are totally depraved at the bottom of ages of cruelty lies this infamous doctrine of total depravity religion contemplates a child as a living crime heir to an infinite curse doomed to eternal fire in the olden time they thought some days were too good for a child to enjoy himself when i was a boy sunday was considered altogether too holy to be happy sunday used to commence then when the sun went down on saturday night we commenced at that time for the purpose of getting a good ready and when the sun fell below the horizon on saturday evening there was a darkness fell upon the house ten thousand times deeper than that of night nobody said a pleasant word nobody laughed nobody smiled the child that looked the sickest was regarded as the most pious that night you could not even crack hickory nuts if you were caught chewing gum it was only another evidence of the total depravity of the human heart it was an exceedingly solemn night dyspepsia was in the very air you breathed everybody looked sad and mournful i have noticed all my life that many people think they have religion when they are troubled with dyspepsia if there could be found an absolute specific for that disease it would be the hardest blow the church has ever received on sunday morning the solemnity had simply increased then we went to church the minister was in a pulpit about twenty feet high with a little sounding board above him and he commenced at firstly and went on and on and on to about twenty-thirdly then he made a few remarks by way of application and then took a general view of the subject and in about two hours reached the last chapter in revelation in those days no matter how cold the weather was there was no fire in the church it was thought to be a kind of sin to be comfortable while you were thanking god the first church that ever had a stove in it in new england divided on that account so the first church in which they sang by note was torn in fragments after the sermon we had an intermission then came the catechism with the chief end of man we went through with that we sat in a row with our feet coming in about six inches off the floor the minister asked us if we knew 
that we all deserved to go to hell, and we all answered, yes. Then we were asked if we would be willing to go to hell if it was God's will, and every little liar shouted, yes. Then the same sermon was preached once more, commencing at the other end and going back. After that, we started for home, sad and solemn, overpowered with the wisdom displayed in the scheme of the atonement. When we got home, if we had been good boys, and the weather was warm, sometimes they would take us out to the graveyard to cheer us up a little. It did cheer me. When I looked at the sunken tombs and the leaning stones, and read the half-effaced inscriptions through the moss of silence and forgetfulness, it was a great comfort. The reflection came to my mind that the observance of the Sabbath could not last always. Sometimes they would sing that beautiful hymn in which occurs these cheerful lines, where congregations never break up and Sabbaths never end. These lines, I think, prejudiced me a little against even heaven. Then we had good books that we read on Sundays by way of keeping us happy and contented. There were Milner's History of the Wallenses, Baxter's Call to the Unconverted, Jan's Archaeology of the Jews, and Jenkins on the Atonement. I used to read Jenkins on the Atonement. I have often thought that an atonement would have to be exceedingly broad in its provisions to cover the case of a man who would write a book like that for a boy. But at last the Sunday wore away, and the moment the sun went down we were free. Between three and four o'clock we would go out to see how the sun was coming on. Sometimes it seemed to me that it was stopping from pure meanness. But finally it went down. It had to. And when the last stream of light sank below the horizon, off would go our caps, and we would give three cheers for liberty once more. Sabbaths used to be prisons. Every Sunday was a Bastille. Every Christian was a kind of turnkey, and every child was a prisoner, a convict. In that dungeon, a smile was a crime. It was thought wrong for a child to love upon this holy day. Think of that. A little child would go out into the garden, and there would be a tree laden with blossoms, and the little fellow would lean against it, and there would be a bird on one of the boughs, singing and swinging, and thinking about four little speckled eggs warmed by the breast of its mate, singing and swinging, and the music in happy waves rippling out of its tiny throat, and the flowers blossoming, the air filled with perfume, and the great white clouds floating in the sky, and the little boy would lean up against that tree and think about hell and the warm that never dies. I have heard them preach, when I sat in the pew, and my feet did not touch the floor, about the final home of the unconverted. In order to impress upon the children the length of time they would probably stay if they settled in that country, the preacher would frequently give us the following illustration. Suppose that once in a billion years a bird should come from some far distant planet and carry off in its little bill a grain of sand. A time would finally come when the last atom composing this earth would be carried away. And when this last atom was taken, it would not even be sun up in hell. Think of such an infamous doctrine being taught to children. The love of a child will make the holiest day more sacred still. Strike with hand of fire, O weird musician, thy harp strung with Apollo's golden hair. Fill the vast cathedral aisles with symphonies sweet and dim, deft toucher of the organ keys. Blow, bugler, blow, until thy silver notes do touch and kiss the moonlit waves and charm the lovers wandering mid the vine-clad hills. But no, your sweetest strains are discords all, compared with childhood's happy love, the love that fills the eyes with light and every heart with joy. 
O rippling river of laughter, thou art the blessed boundary line between the beasts and men. And every wayward wave of thine doth drown some fretful fiend of care. O laughter, rose-lipped daughter of joy, there are dimples enough in thy cheeks to catch and hold and glorify all the tears of grief. And yet the minds of children have been polluted by this infamous doctrine of eternal punishment. I denounce it today as a doctrine, the infamy of which no language is sufficient to express. Where did that doctrine of eternal punishment for men and women and children come from? It came from the low and beastly skull of that wretch in the dugout. Where did he get it? It was a souvenir from the animals. The doctrine of eternal punishment was born in the glittering eyes of snakes, snakes that hung in fearful coils watching for their prey. It was born of the howl and bark and growl of wild beasts. It was born of the grin of hyenas and of the depraved chatter of unclean baboons. I despise it with every drop of my blood. Tell me there is a god in the serene heavens that will damn his children for the expression of an honest belief. More men have died in their sins, touched by your orthodox creeds, than there are leaves on all the forests in the wide world ten thousand times over. Tell me these men are in hell, that these men are in torment, that these children are in eternal pain, and that they are to be punished forever and forever. I denounce this doctrine as the most infamous of lies. When the great ship containing the hopes and aspirations of the world, when the great ship freighted with mankind goes down in the night of death, chaos and disaster, I am willing to go down with the ship. I will not be guilty of the ineffable meanness of paddling away in some orthodox canoe. I will go down with the ship, with those who love me and with those whom I have loved. If there is a God who will damn his children forever, I would rather go to hell than to go to heaven and keep the society of such an infamous tyrant. I make my choice now. I despise that doctrine. It has covered the cheeks of this world with tears. It has polluted the hearts of children and poisoned the imaginations of men. It has been a constant pain, a perpetual terror to every good man and woman and child. It has filled the good with horror and with fear, but it has had no effect upon the infamous and base. It has wrung the hearts of the tender, it has furrowed the cheeks of the good. This doctrine never should be preached again. What right have you, sir, Mr. Clergyman, you, minister of the gospel, to stand at the portals of the tomb, at the vestibule of eternity, and fill the future with horror? and with fear. I do not believe this doctrine, neither do you. If you did, you could not sleep one moment. Any man who believes it and has within his breast a decent, throbbing heart will go insane. A man who believes the doctrine and does not go insane has the heart of a snake and the conscience of a hyena. Jonathan Edwards, the dear old soul who if his doctrine is true, is now in heaven rubbing his holy hands with clay, as he hears the cries of the damned, preached this doctrine, and he said, Can the believing husband in heaven be happy with his unbelieving wife in hell? Can the believing father in heaven be happy with his unbelieving children in hell? Can the loving wife in heaven be happy with her unbelieving husband in hell? And he replies, I tell you, yeah, such will be their sense of justice, that it will increase rather than diminish their bliss. There is no wild beast in the jungles of Africa whose reputation would not be tarnished by the expression of such a doctrine. These doctrines have been taught in the name of religion, in the name of universal forgiveness, in the name of infinite love and charity. Do not, I pray you, soil the minds of your children with this dogma. 
Let them read for themselves. Let them think for themselves. Do not treat your children like orthodox posts to be set in a row. Treat them like trees that need light and sun and air. Be fair and honest with them. Give them a chance. Recollect that their rights are equal to yours. Do not have it in your mind that you must govern them, that they must obey. Throw away forever the idea of master and slave. In old times they used to make the children go to bed when they were not sleepy and get up when they were sleepy. I say, let them go to bed when they are sleepy and get up when they are not sleepy. But you say this doctrine will do for the rich but not for the poor. Well, if the poor have to waken their children early in the morning, it is as easy to wake them with a kiss as with a blow. Give your children freedom. Let them preserve their individuality. Let your children eat what they desire and commence at the end of a dinner they like. That is their business and not yours. They know what they wish to eat. If they are given their liberty from the first, they know what they want better than any doctor in the world can prescribe. Do you know that all the improvement that has ever been made in the practice of medicine has been made by the recklessness of patients and not by the doctors? For thousands and thousands of years, the doctors would not let a man suffering from fever have a drop of water. Water they looked upon as poison. But every now and then, some man got reckless and said, I had rather die than not to slake my thirst. Then he would drink two or three quarts of water and get well. And when the doctor was told of what the patient had done, he expressed great surprise that he was still alive and complimented his constitution upon being able to bear such a frightful stain. The reckless man, however, kept on drinking the water and persisted in getting well. And finally the doctor said, In a fever, water is the very best thing you can take. So I have more confidence in the voice of nature about such things than I have in the conclusions of the medical schools. Let your children have freedom, and they will fall into your ways. They will do substantially as you do, but if you try to make them, there is some magnificent, splendid thing in the human heart that refuses to be driven. And do you know that it is the luckiest thing that ever happened for this world, that people are that way? What would have become of the people five hundred years ago if they had followed strictly the advice of the doctors? They would have all been dead. What would the people have been if at any age of the world they had followed implicitly the direction of the church? They would have all been idiots. It is a splendid thing that there is always some grand man who will not mind and who will think for himself. I believe in allowing the children to think for themselves. I believe in the democracy of the family. If in this world there is anything splendid, it is a home where all are equals. You will remember that only a few years ago parents would tell their children to let the victuals stop their mouths. They used to eat as though it were a religious ceremony, a very solemn thing. Life should not be treated as a solemn matter. I like to see the children at table and hear each one telling of the wonderful things he has seen and heard. I like to hear the clatter of knives and forks and spoons mingling with their happy voices. I had rather hear it than any opera that was ever put upon the boards. Let the children have liberty. Be honest and fair with them. Be just. Be tender. And they will make you rich in love and joy. Men are oaks. Women are wines. And children are flowers. The human race has been guilty of almost countless crimes. But I have some excuse for mankind. This world, after all, is not very well adapted to raising good people. In the first place, nearly all of it is water. It is much better adapted to fish culture than to the production of folks. Of that portion which is land, not one-eighth 
has suitable soil and climate to produce great men and women you cannot raise men and women of genius without the proper soil and climate any more than you can raise corn and wheat upon the ice fields of the arctic sea you must have the necessary conditions and surroundings man is a product you must have the soil and food the obstacles presented by nature must not be so great that man cannot by reasonable industry and courage overcome them there is upon this world only a narrow belt of land circling zigzag the globe upon which you can produce men and women of talent in the southern hemisphere the real climate that man needs falls mostly upon the sea and the result is that the southern half of our world has never produced a man or woman of great genius in the far north there is no genius it is too cold in the far south there is no genius it is too warm there must be winter there must be summer in a country where man needs no coverlet but a cloud revolution is his normal condition winter is the mother of industry and prudence above all it is the mother of the family relation winter holds in its icy arms the husband and wife and the sweet children if upon this earth we ever have a glimpse of heaven it is when we pass a home in winter at night and through the windows the curtains drawn aside we see the family about the pleasant hearth the old lady knitting the cat playing with the yarn the children wishing they had as many dolls or dollars or knives or some things as there are sparks going out to join the roaring blast the father reading and smoking and the clouds rising like incense from the altar of domestic joy i never passed such a house without feeling that i had received a benediction civilization liberty justice charity intellectual advancement are all flowers that blossom in the drifted snow i do not know that i can better illustrate the great truth that only part of the world is adapted to the production of great men and women than by calling your attention to the difference between vegetation in valleys and upon mountains in the valley you find the oak and elm tossing their branches defiantly to the storm and as you advance up the mountain side the hemlock the pine the birch the spruce the fir and finally you come to little dwarf trees that look like other trees seen through a telescope reversed every limb twisted as though in pain getting a scanty subsistence from the miserly crevices of the rocks you go on and on until at last the highest crag is freckled with a kind of moss and vegetation ends you might as well try to raise oaks and elms where the mosses grow as to raise great men and great women where their surroundings are unfavorable you must have the proper climate and soil a few years ago we were talking about the annexation of santo domingo to this country i was in washington at the time i was opposed to it i was told that it was a most delicious climate that the soil produced everything but i said we do not want it it is not the right kind of country in which to raise american citizens such a climate would debauch us you might go there with five thousand congregational preachers five thousand ruling elders five thousand professors in colleges five thousand of the solid men of boston and their wives settle them all in santo domingo and you will see the second generation riding upon a mule bareback no shoes a grapevine bridle hair sticking out at the top of their sombreros with a rooster under each arm going to a cockfight on sunday such is the influence of climate science however is gradually widening the area within which man of genius can be produced we are conquering the north with houses clothing food and fuel we are in many ways overcoming the heat of the south if we attend to this world instead of another we may in time cover the land with men and women of genius 
I have still another excuse. I believe that man came up from the lower animals. I do not say this as a fact. I simply say I believe it to be a fact. Upon that question I stand about eight to seven, which, for all practical purposes, is very near a certainty. When I first heard of that doctrine, I did not like it. My heart was filled with sympathy for those people who have nothing to be proud of except ancestors. I thought how terrible this will be upon the nobility of the old world. Think of their being forced to trace their ancestry back to the Duke Orang Utan, or to the Princess Chimpanzee. After thinking it all over, I came to the conclusion that I liked that doctrine. I became convinced in spite of myself. I read about rudimentary bones and muscles. I was told that everybody had rudimentary muscles extending from the ear into the cheek. I asked, what are they? I was told, they are the remains of muscles, that they became rudimentary from lack of use. They went into bankruptcy. They are the muscles with which your ancestors used to flap their ears. I do not now so much wonder that we once had them, as that we have outgrown them. After all, I'd rather belong to a race that started from the skullless vertebrates in the dim Laurentian seas, vertebrates wiggling without knowing why they wiggled, swimming without knowing where they were going, but that in some way began to develop and began to get a little higher and a little higher in the scale of existence. That came up by decrees through millions of ages through all the animal world, through all the crawls and swims and floats and climbs and walks, and finally produce the gentleman in the dugout. And then from this man, getting a little grander, and each one below calling everyone above him a heretic, calling everyone who had made a little advance an infidel or an atheist. For in the history of this world, the man who was ahead has always been called a heretic. I would rather come from a race that started from that skullless vertebrate and came up and up and up and finally produced Shakespeare, the man who found the human intellect dwelling in a hut, touched it with the wand of his genius, and it became a palace, domed and pinnacled. Shakespeare, who harvested all the fields of dramatic thought, and from whose day to this, there have been only cleaners of straw and chaff. I would rather belong to that race that commenced a skullless vertebrate and produced Shakespeare, a race that has before it an infinite future, with the angel of progress leaning from the far horizon, beckoning man forward, upward and onward forever. I had rather belong to such a race, commencing there, producing this, and with that hope, then to have sprung from a perfect pair upon which the Lord has lost money every moment from that day to this. End of The Liberty of Children by Robert G. Ingersoll Read by Julia Niedermeyer A Budget of Paradoxes by Augustus de Morgan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mathematical Theology Theologia Christiania Principia Mathematica. Octor Johann Craig. London, 1699. Quattro. This is a celebrated speculation, and has been reprinted abroad and seriously answered. Craig is known in the early history of fluxions, and was a good mathematician. He professed to calculate, on the hypothesis that the suspicions against historical evidence increase with the square of time, how long it will take the evidence of Christianity to die out. He finds, by formula, that had it been oral only, it would have gone out 8800. 
but by aid of the written evidence it will last till A.D. 3150. At this period he places the second coming, which is deferred until the extinction of evidence on the authority of the question, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? It is a pity that Craig's theory was not adopted. It would have spared a hundred treatises on the end of the world, founded on no better knowledge than his, and many of them falsified by the event. The most recent, October 1863, is a tract in proof of Louis Napoleon being Antichrist, the Beast, the Eighth Head, etc., and the present dispensation is to close soon after 1864. In order rightly to judge Craig, who added speculations on the variations of pleasure and pain treated as functions of time, it is necessary to remember that in Newton's day the idea of force as a quantity to be measured and as followed by law of variation was very new. So likewise was that of probability or belief as an object of measurement. The success of the Principia of Newton put it into many heads to speculate about applying notions of quantity to other things not then brought under measurement. Craig imitated Newton's title, and evidently thought he was making a step in advance, but it is not everyone who can plough with Samson's heifer. It is likely enough that Craig took a hint directly or indirectly from Mohammedan writers, who make a reply to the argument that the Quran has not the evidence derived from miracles. They say that, as evidence of Christian miracles is daily becoming weaker, a time must at last arrive when it will fail of affording assurance that they were miracles at all. Whence would arise the necessity of another prophet and other miracles. Lee the Cambridge Orientalist, from whom the above words are taken, almost certainly never heard of Craig or his theory. End of Mathematical Theology From A Budget of Paradoxes By Augustus de Morgan A Modest Proposal By Jonathan Swift this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Modest Proposal For Preventing the Children of Poor People in Ireland from Being a Burden on Their Parents or Country And for Making Them Beneficial to the Public By Dr. Jonathan Swift 1729 it is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town or travel in the country, when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children all in rags, and importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work, or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms, or on the backs, or at the heels of their mothers, and frequently of their fathers, is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom. A very great additional grievance, and therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth, would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent, and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age, who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them as those who demand our charity in the streets. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject, 
and maturely weighed the several schemes of our projectors. I have found them grossly mistaken in their computation. It is true, a child just dropped from its dame may be supported by her milk for a solar year, with little other nourishment, at most not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps, by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner as, instead of being a charge upon their parents, or parish, or wanting food and raiment for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. This is likewise another great advantage in my scheme, that it will prevent those voluntary abortions and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children, alas, too frequent among us, sacrificing the poor innocent babes. I doubt more to avoid the expense than the shame which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast. The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about two hundred thousand couple whose wives are breeders, from which number I subtract thirty thousand couple, who are able to maintain their own children, although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom. But this being granted, there will remain an hundred and seventy thousand breeders. I again subtract fifty thousand for those women who miscarry or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain an hundred and twenty thousand children of poor parents annually born. The question therefore is, how this number shall be reared and provided for, which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed. For we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture. We neither build houses, I mean in the country, nor cultivate land. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing till they arrive at six years old except where they are of towardly parts, although I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can, however, be properly looked upon only as probationers. As I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the county of Caven, who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six, even in a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art, I am assured by our merchants that a boy or a girl before twelve years old is no saleable commodity, and even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds or three pounds and a half crown at most on the exchange, which cannot turn to account either to the parents or kingdom, the charge of nutriments and rags having been at least four times that value. I shall now, therefore, humbly propose my own thoughts which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child well-nursed is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragout. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration that of the hundred and twenty thousand children already computed, twenty thousand may be reserved for breed, whereof only one fourth part to be males, which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine. And my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages. Therefore, one male will be sufficient to serve four females, that the remaining hundred thousand may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune through the kingdom, always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hindquarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt, will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. 
I have reckoned upon a medium that a child born will weigh 12 pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to 28 pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Infants' flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March, and a little before and after. For we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent. The markets will be more glutted than usual, because the number of popish infants is at least three to one in this kingdom. And therefore, it will have one other collateral advantage by lessening the number of papists among us. I have already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list I reckon all cottagers, laborers, and four-fifths of the farmers to be about two shillings per annum, rags included. And I believe no gentleman would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent nutritive meat, when he hath only some particular friend or his own family to dine with him. Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord and grow popular among his tenants. The mother will have eight shillings neat profit and be fit for work till she produces another child. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flee the carcass, the skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for ladies, and summer boots for fine gentlemen. As to our city of Dublin, shambles may be appointed for this purpose, in the most convenient parts of it, and butchers, we may be assured, will not be wanting. Although I rather recommend buying the children alive and dressing them hot from the knife, as we do roasting pigs. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country, and whose virtues I highly esteem, was lately pleased in discoursing on this manner to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said that many gentlemen of this kingdom, having of late destroyed their deer, he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplied by the bodies of young lads and maidens not exceeding fourteen years of age, nor under twelve. So great a number of both sexes in every country being now ready to starve for want of work and service, and these to be disposed of by their parents if alive, or otherwise by their nearest relations. But with due deference to so excellent a friend, and so deserving a patriot, I cannot be altogether in his sentiments, for as to the males, my American acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean, like that of our schoolboys, by continual exercise, and their taste disagreeable, and to fatten them would not answer the charge. Then as to the females, it would, I think, with humble submission, be a loss to the public, because they soon would become breeders themselves, and besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censure such a practice although indeed very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which I confess hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project, how well soever intended. But in order to justify my friend, he confessed that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Salmanazor, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London above twenty years ago, and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the executioner sold the carcass to persons of quality, as a prime dainty, and that in his time the body of a plump girl of fifteen, who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state, and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet at four hundred crowns. Neither indeed can I deny that if the same use were made of several plump young girls in this town, who without one single groat to their fortunes 
cannot stir abroad without a chair, and appear at a playhouse and assemblies in foreign fineries, which they never will pay for, the kingdom would not be the worse. Some persons of a desponding spirit are in great concern about that vast number of poor people who are aged, diseased, or maimed. And I have been desired to employ my thoughts what course may be taken to ease the nation of so grievous an encumbrance. But I am not in the least pain upon that matter, because it is very well known that they are every day dying and rotting by cold and famine and filth and vermin, as fast as can be reasonably expected. And as to the young laborers, they are now in almost as hopeful a condition. They cannot get work and consequently pine away from want of nourishment to a degree that if at any time they are accidentally hired to common labor, they have not the strength to perform it. And thus the country and themselves are happily delivered from the evils to come. I have too long digressed and therefore shall return to my subject. I think the advantages by the proposal which I have made are obvious and many, as well as of the highest importance. For first, I have already observed it would greatly lessen the number of papists with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies, and who stay at home on purpose with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender hoping to take their advantage by the absence of so many good Protestants, who have chosen rather to leave their country than stay at home and pay tithes against their conscience to an Episcopal curate. Secondly, the poor tenants will have something valuable of their own, which by law may be made liable to a distress and help to pay their landlord's rent, their corn and cattle being already seized, and money a thing unknown. Thirdly, whereas the maintenance of an hundred thousand children from two years old and upwards cannot be computed at less than ten shillings apiece per annum, the nation's stock will be thereby increased fifty thousand pounds per annum, besides the profit of a new dish introduced to the tables of all gentlemen of fortune in the kingdom, who have any refinement in taste, and the money will circulate among ourselves the goods being entirely of our own growth and manufacture. Fourthly, the constant breeders, besides the gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. Fifthly, this food would likewise bring great custom to taverns, where the vintners will certainly be so prudent as to procure the best recipes for dressing it to perfection and consequently have their houses frequented by all the fine gentlemen who justly value themselves upon their knowledge in good eating, and a skillful cook who understands how to oblige his guests will contrive to make it as expensive as they please. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers toward their children when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes, provided in some sort by the public to their annual profit instead of expense. We should soon see an honest emulation among the married women, which of them would bring the fattest child to the market. Men would become as fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy as they are now of their mares in foal their cows and calf, or sow when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them, as is too frequent a practice, for fear of a miscarriage. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of barreled beef, the propagation of swine's flesh, and improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs, too frequent at our tables, which are no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown, fat yearly child, which roasted whole will make a considerable figure at a Lord Mayor's feast or any other public entertainment. By this and many others, I omit being studious of brevity.
Supposing that 1,000 families in this city would be constant customers for infant's flesh, besides others who might have it at merry meetings, particularly at weddings and christenings, I compute that Dublin would take off annually about 20,000 carcasses, and the rest of the kingdom, where probably they will be sold somewhat cheaper, the remaining 80,000. I can think of no one objection that will possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and t'was indeed one principal design in offering it to the world. I desire the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland, and for no other that ever was, is, or, I think, ever can be upon earth. Therefore let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture except what is of our own growth and manufacture, of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country, wherein we differ even from Laplanders and the inhabitants of Topinambo, of quitting our animosities and factions, nor acting any longer like the Jews, who were murdering one another at the very moment their city was taken, of being a little cautious not to sell our country and consciences for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy towards their tenants. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers, who, if a resolution could now be taken to buy only our native goods, would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us in the price, the measure, and the goodness, nor could ever be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing though often and earnestly invited to it. Therefore, I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients, till he hath at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them into practice. But as to myself, having been wearied out for many years with offering vain, idle, visionary thoughts, and at length utterly despairing of success, I fortunately fell upon this proposal, which, as it is wholly new, so it hath something solid and real, of no expense and little trouble, full in our own power, and whereby we can incur no danger in disobliging England. For this kind of commodity will not bear exportation, and flesh being of too tender a consistence to admit a long continuance in salt, although perhaps I could name a country which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without it. After all, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion as to reject any offer proposed by wise men, which shall be found equally innocent, cheap, easy, and effectual. But before something of that kind shall be advanced in contradiction to my scheme and offering a better, I desire the author or authors will be pleased maturely to consider two points. First, as things now stand, how they will be able to find food and raiment for a hundred thousand useless mouths and backs. And secondly, there being a round million of creatures in humane figure throughout this kingdom, whose whole subsistence put into a common stock would leave them in debt two million of pounds sterling, adding those who are beggars by profession to the bulk of farmers, cottagers, and laborers, with their wives and children, who are beggars in effect, I desire those politicians who dislike my overture, and may perhaps be so bold to attempt an answer, that they will first ask the parents of these mortals whether they would not at this day think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at a year old in the manner I prescribe, and thereby have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes as they have since gone through, by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common 
sustenance, with neither house nor clothes to cover them from the inclemencies of weather, and the most inevitable prospect of entailing the like or greater miseries upon their breed forever. I profess, in the sincerity of my heart, that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country, by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife past childbearing. The End of a Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift The War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate Armies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Series 1, Volume 10-1. April 6-7, 7, 1862. Battle of Pittsburgh Landing or Shiloh, Tennessee. Number 3. Reports of Major General U.S. Grant, U.S. Army, Commanding Army of the Tennessee. Pittsburgh, April 7, 1862. Yesterday the rebels attacked us here with an overwhelming force, driving our troops in from their advanced position to near the landing. General Wallace was immediately ordered up from Crump's Landing, and in the evening one division of General Buell's army and General Buell in person arrived. During the night, one other division arrived, and still another today. This morning, at the break of day, I ordered an attack, which resulted in a fight which continued until late this afternoon with severe loss on both sides, but a complete repulse of the enemy. I shall follow tomorrow far enough to see that no immediate renewal of an attack is contemplated. U.S. Grant, Major General to Major General H. W. Halleck, St. Louis, Missouri. Pittsburgh, Tennessee, via Savannah, April 8, 1862. Enemy badly routed and fleeing toward Corinth. Our cavalry, supported by infantry, are now pursuing him with instructions to pursue to the swampy grounds near Pea Ridge. I want transports sent here for our wounded. U.S. Grant. Headquarters, District of West Tennessee, Pittsburgh, April 9, 1862. Captain, it becomes my duty again to report another battle fought between two great armies, one contending for the maintenance of the best government ever devised, the other for its destruction. It is pleasant to record the success of the army contending for the former principle. On Sunday morning our pickets were attacked and driven in by the enemy. Immediately the five divisions stationed at this place were drawn up in line of battle ready to meet them. The battle soon waxed warm on the left and center, varying at times to all parts of the line. The most continuous firing of musketry and artillery ever heard on this continent was kept up until nightfall the enemy having forced the entire line to fall back nearly halfway from their camps to the landing. At a late hour in the afternoon a desperate effort was made by the enemy to turn our left and get possession of the landing, transports, etc. As there is a deep and impassable ravine for artillery or cavalry, and very difficult for infantry, at this point no troops were stationed here except the necessary artillerists and a small infantry force for their support just at this moment the advance of major general buell's column a part of the division under general nelson arrived the two generals named both being present an advance was immediately made upon the point of attack and the enemy soon driven back in this repulse much is due to the presence of the gunboats Tyler and Lexington and their able commanders Captains Gwynne and Shirk. During the night the divisions under Generals Crittenden and McCook arrived. 
General Lewis Wallace, at Crump's Landing, six miles below, was ordered at an early hour in the morning to hold his division in readiness to be moved in any direction to which it might be ordered. At about eleven o'clock the order was delivered to move it up to Pittsburg, but owing to its being led by a circuitous route, did not arrive in time to take part in Sunday's action. During the night all was quiet and feeling that a great moral advantage would be gained by becoming the attacking party, an advance was ordered as soon as day dawned. The result was a gradual repulse of the enemy at all parts of the line from morning until probably five o'clock in the afternoon, when it became evident the enemy was retreating. Before the close of the action, the advance of General T.J. Wood's division arrived in time to take part in the action. My force was much too fatigued from two days' hard fighting and exposure in the open air to a drenching rain during the intervening night to pursue immediately. Night closed in cloudy and with heavy rain, making the roads impracticable for artillery by the next morning. General Sherman, however, followed the enemy, finding that the main part of the army had retreated in good order. Hospitals of the enemy's wounded were found all along the road as far as pursuit was made. Dead bodies of the enemy and many graves were also found. I enclose herewith report of General Sherman, which will explain more fully the result of his pursuit. Of the part taken by each separate command, I cannot take special notice in this report, but will do so more fully when reports of division commanders are handed in. General Buell, coming on the field with a distinct army long under his command, and which did such efficient service, commanded by himself in person on the field, will be much better able to notice those of his command, who particularly distinguished themselves, than I possibly can. I feel it a duty, however, to a gallant and able officer, Brigadier General W. T. Sherman, to make a special mention. He not only was with his command during the entire two days' action, but displayed great judgment and skill in the management of his men. Although severely wounded in the hand the first day, his place was never vacant. He was again wounded, and had three horses killed under him. In making this mention of a gallant officer, no disparagement is intended to the other division commanders. Major Generals John A. McClernand and Lewis Wallace and Brigadier Generals S. A. Hurlbut, B. M. Prentice, and W. H. L. Wallace, all of whom maintain their places with credit to themselves and the cause. General Prentice was taken prisoner in the first day's action, and General W. H. L. Wallace severely, probably mortally, wounded. His assistant adjutant general, Captain William McMichael, is missing, probably taken prisoner. My personal staff are all deserving of particular mention, they having been engaged during the entire two days in conveying orders to every part of the field. It consists of Colonel J. D. Webster, Chief of Staff, Lieutenant Colonel J. B. McPherson, Chief Engineer, assisted by Lieutenants W. L. B. Jenny and William Cossack, Captain J. A. Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General, Captains W. S. Hillier, W. R. Rowley, and C. B. Lagow aides de camp colonel g g pride volunteer aide and captain j p hawkins chief commissary who accompanied me upon the field the medical department under the direction of surgeon hewitt medical director showed great energy in providing for the wounded and in getting them from the field regardless of danger colonel webster was placed in special charge of all the artillery and was constantly upon the field he displayed, as always heretofore, both skill and bravery. At least in one instance, he was the means of placing an entire regiment in a position of doing most valuable service, and where it would not have been but for his exertions. Lieutenant Colonel McPherson, attached to my staff as chief engineer, deserves more than a passing notice for his activity and courage. All the grounds beyond our camps for miles have been reconnoitred by him, and plats carefully prepared under his supervision give accurate information of the nature of approaches to our lines. During the two days' battle he was constantly in the saddle, leading troops as they arrived to points where their services were required. During the engagement he had one horse shot under him. 
country will have to mourn the loss of many brave men who fell at the battle of Pittsburg, or Shiloh more properly. The exact loss in killed and wounded will be known in a day or two. At present I can only give it approximately at 1,500 killed and 3,500 wounded. The loss of artillery was great, many pieces being disabled by the enemy's shots and some losing all their horses and many men. There were probably not less than 200 horses killed. The loss of the enemy in killed and left upon the field was greater than ours. In wounded, the estimate cannot be made, as many of them must have been sent back to Corinth and other points. The enemy suffered terribly from demoralization and desertion. A flag of truce was sent in today from General Beauregard. I enclose herewith a copy of the correspondence. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Major General Commanding. To Captain N.H. McLean, A.A.G., Department of the Mississippi, St. Louis, Missouri. Enclosures Headquarters, Army of the Mississippi, Monterey, April 8, 1862. Sir, at the close of the conflict of yesterday, my forces being exhausted by the extraordinary length of time during which they were engaged with yours on that and the preceding day, and it being apparent that you had received and were still receiving reinforcements, I felt it my duty to withdraw my troops from the immediate scene of conflict. Under these circumstances, in accordance with usages of war, I shall transmit this, under a flag of truce, to ask permission to send a mounted party to the battlefield of Shiloh for the purpose of uh, giving decent interment to my dead. Certain gentlemen wishing to avail themselves of this opportunity to remove the remains of their sons and friends, I must request for them the privilege of accompanying the burial party, and in this connection I deem it proper to say I am asking only what I have extended to your own countrymen under similar circumstances. Respectfully, General, your obedient servant, G. T. Beauregard, General Commanding. To Major General U. S. Grant, U. S. A., Commanding U. S. Forces near Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Headquarters, Army in the Field. Pittsburgh, April ninth, eighteen sixty two. Your dispatch of yesterday is just received. Owing to the warmth of the weather, I deemed it advisable to have all the dead of both parties buried immediately. Heavy details were made for this purpose, and now it is accomplished. There cannot, therefore, be any necessity of admitting within our lines the parties you desire to send on the grounds asked. I shall always be glad to extend any courtesy consistent with duty, and especially so when dictated by humanity. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, U. S. Grant, Major General Commanding. To General G. T. Beauregard, Commanding Confederate Army of the Mississippi, Monterey, Tennessee. General Orders Number 34, Headquarters, District of West Tennessee, Pittsburgh, April 8, 1862. The General Commanding congratulates the troops who so gallantly maintained, repulsed, and routed a numerically superior force of the enemy, composed of the flower of the Southern Army, commanded by their ablest generals, and fought by them with all the desperation of despair. In numbers engaged, no such contest ever took place on this continent. In importance of results, what few have taken place in the history of the world. Whilst congratulating the brave and gallant soldiers, it becomes the duty of the general commanding to make special notice of the brave wounded and those killed upon the field. Whilst they leave friends and relatives to mourn their loss, they have won a nation's gratitude and undying laurels not to be forgotten by future generations who will enjoy the blessings of the best government the sun ever shone upon preserved by their valor. By order of Major General U.S. Grant, John A. Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General. End of report on the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing or Shiloh by Major General Ulysses S. Grant.
save the redwoods by john muir this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org footnote this article was found among muir's papers after his death and published for the first time in january nineteen twenty in the sierra club bulletin volume eleven number one introductory note by john campbell miriam chairman executive committee of the save the redwoods league in his intimate acquaintance with nature john muir recognized and loved everything that was natural and honest but his interest focused upon the things which represented the most splendid expressions of creative power not only did he instinctively select for close personal companionship the elements of nature that had most to give for him but as no other western naturalist has done he set forth their fullest meaning in the language of the people of all muir's special interests in nature it is probable that none made to him a stronger appeal than the giant sequoias of the sierra and coast range forests it was his firm conviction that they represented the supremest examples of majesty among all living things and his journey around the earth to compare the big trees with the trees of the world left him with settled conviction regarding the correctness of this view for many years he gave himself to the protection of these quote, kings of the forest the noblest of a noble race end quote. save the redwoods by john muir we are often told that the world is going from bad to worse sacrificing everything to mammon but this righteous uprising in defense of god's trees in the midst of exciting politics and wars is telling a different story and every sequoia i fancy has heard the good news and is waving its branches for joy the wrongs done to trees wrongs of every sort are done in the darkness of ignorance and unbelief for when light comes the heart of the people is always right forty-seven years ago one of these cavalierous king sequoias was laboriously cut down that the stump might be had for a dancing floor another one of the finest in the grove more than three hundred feet high was skinned alive to a height of one hundred and sixteen feet from the ground and the bark sent to london to show how fine and big that cavalierous tree was as sensible a scheme as skinning our great men would be to prove their greatness this grand tree is of course dead a ghastly disfigured ruin but it still stands erect and holds forth its majestic arms as if alive and saying forgive them they know not what they do now some mill men want to cut all the cavalarous trees into lumber and money but we have found a better use for them no doubt these trees would make good lumber after passing through a sawmill as george washington after passing through the hands of a french cook would have made good food but both for washington and the tree that bears his name higher uses have been found could one of these sequoia kings come to town in all its godlike majesty so as to be strikingly seen and allowed to plead its own cause there would never again be any lack of defenders and the same may be said of all the other sequoia groves and forests of the sierra with their companions and the noble sequoia sempervirens or redwood of the coast mountains in a general view we find that the sequoia gigantea or big tree is distributed in a widely interrupted belt along the west flank of the sierra from a small grove on the middle fork of the american river to the head of deer creek a distance of about two hundred and sixty miles at an elevation of about five thousand to a little over eight thousand feet above the sea from the american river grove to the forest on king's river the species occurs only in comparatively small isolated patches or groves so sparsely distributed along the belt that three of the gaps in it are from forty to sixty miles wide 
from king's river southward the sequoia is not restricted to mere groves but extends across the broad rugged basins of the kiwa and tule rivers in majestic forests a distance of nearly seventy miles the continuity of this portion of the belt being but slightly broken save by the deep canyons in these noble groves and forests to the southward of the cavalierus grove the axe and saw have long been busy and thousands of the finest sequoias have been felled blasted into manageable dimensions and sawed into lumber by methods destructive almost beyond belief while fires have spread still wider and more lamentable ruin in the course of my explorations twenty-five years ago i found five sawmills located on or near the lower margin of the sequoia belt all of which were cutting more or less big tree lumber which looks like the redwood of the coast and was sold as redwood one of the smallest of these mills in the season of eighteen seventy four sawed two million feet of sequoia lumber since that time other mills have been built among the sequoias notably the large ones on king's river and the head of the fresno the destruction of these grand trees is still going on on the other hand the cavalierus grove for forty years has been faithfully protected by mr sperry and with the exception of the two trees mentioned above is still in primeval beauty the tulumna and merced groves near yosemite the dinky creek grove those of the general grant national park and the sequoia national park with several outstanding groves that are nameless on the kings kiwa and tule river basins and included in the sierra forest reservation have of late years been partially protected by the federal government while the well-known mariposa grove has long been guarded by the state for the thousands of acres of sequoia forest outside of the reservation and national parks and in the hands of lumbermen no help is in sight probably more than three times as many sequoias as are contained in the whole cavalier's grove have been cut into lumber every year for the last twenty-six years without let or hindrance and with scarce a word of protest on the part of the public while at the first whisper of the bonding of the cavalier's grove to lumbermen most everybody rose in alarm this righteous and lively indignation on the part of californians after the long period of death-like apathy in which they have witnessed the destruction of other groves unmoved seems strange until the rapid growth that right public opinion has made during the last few years is considered and the peculiar interest that attaches to the cavalierous giants they were the first discovered and are best known thousands of travelers from every country have come to pay them tribute of admiration and praise their reputation is world-wide and the names of great men have long been associated with them washington humboldt tory and gray sir joseph hooker and others these kings of the forest the noblest of a noble race rightly belong to the world but as they are in california we cannot escape responsibility as their guardians fortunately the american people are equal to this trust or any other that may arise as soon as they see it and understand it any fool can destroy trees they cannot defend themselves or run away and few destroyers of trees ever plant any nor can planting avail much toward restoring our grand aboriginal giants it took more than three thousand years to make some of the oldest of the sequoias trees that are still standing in perfect strength and beauty waving and singing in the mighty forests of the sierra through all the eventful centuries since christ's time and long before that god has cared for these trees saved them from drought disease avalanches and a thousand storms but he cannot save them from sawmills and fools this is left to the american people the news from washington is encouraging on march third nineteen o five question mark the house passed a bill providing for the government acquisition of the cavalierous giants the danger these sequoias have been in will do good far beyond the boundaries of the cavalier's grove in saving other groves and forests and quickening interest in forest affairs in general 
while the iron of public sentiment is hot let us strike hard in particular a reservation or national park of the only other species of sequoia the sempervirens or redwood hardly less wonderful than the gigantea should be quickly secured it will have to be acquired by gift or purchase for the government has sold every section of the entire redwood belt from the oregon boundary to below santa cruz End of Save the Redwoods by John Muir Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana George Washington, Second Inaugural Address by George Washington This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. George Washington, Second Inaugural Address in the City of Philadelphia, Monday, March 4, 1793. Fellow citizens, I am again called upon by the voice of my country to execute the functions of its chief magistrate. When the occasion proper for it shall arrive, I shall endeavor to express the high sense I entertain of this distinguished honor, and of the confidence which has been reposed in me by the people of United America. Previous to the execution of any official act of the President, the Constitution requires an oath of office. This oath I am now about to take and in your presence that if it shall be found during my administration of the government that i have in any instance violated willingly or knowingly the injunctions thereof i may besides incurring constitutional punishment be subject to the upbraidings of all who are now witnesses of the present solemn ceremony end of george washington second inaugural address by george washington read by tip Brown.